Chapter 13 The pincer-shaped silhouettes of a dozen light-tail starfighters rose above the hill behind Villa Solis, then shot skyward on pillars of blue efflux. Jaina craned her neck, watching in silence as the fighter squadron arced toward a cluster of bright points already drifting across Terrafon's night sky. She estimated the number of points at nearly thirty, and even as she watched, they were arranging themselves into the open diamond formation of a battle fleet deploying for a jump to hyperspace. Something's just not right about that, she said, still looking at the fleet. Having been denied hangar access by the flight chief, she and Zek had landed outside the front gate only a short time before. We're supposed to be the ones delivering mobilization orders for Tenelka. To ready a fleet this fast, Dutch Agalni would have had to know about the coup attempt before we left Hapes. Well, her sister is Tenelka's chamberlain. Zek was referring to the haughty Lady Galni, who had seemed so convinced in the aftermath of the coup attempt that Jaina's parents had participated in the attack. Maybe Lady Galni told the Dutcha what happened. How? Jaina asked. Terrafon is in the transitory mists. There's no hollow net here, remember? Zek merely grunted and turned to study the spike-topped domes rising above the villa wall. Jaina did not need the force to tell her that he was less interested in the villa's simple architecture than in avoiding a conversation with her. During the long and complicated journey from Hapes, he had allowed no more force contact than was necessary to coordinate their hyperspace jumps, and his only words so far had been about seeing the Dutcha. Jaina grabbed his arm and turned him to look at her. Look, we've got a mission to do. So whatever's kinking your air hose, get over it. Zek pulled his arm away, but spoke in a mild voice. I think I am over it. Good, Jaina said. Then she frowned, realizing that for the first time in years, she had no idea what Zek meant. Over what, exactly? Jaina, stop, Zek said. You don't do coy very well. Coy? Now Jaina was really confused. She could almost always tell what Zek was thinking. At least until now. Zek, I don't know what you're talking about. I really don't. Zek studied her a moment, then arched his dark brows. Come on. We're not that unjoined. He shook his head. You've wanted this for years. Stop hiding from it. He secured his stealth X and started toward the villa, leaving Jaina alone. She was so accustomed to his blind approval that she could not quite believe he was talking to her as though she were a spoiled little girl. She returned in her mind to the last time things had seemed normal between them, shortly after they had arrived at the Fountain Palace, and discovered that her parents were suspected of involvement in the coup attempt. Zek had tried to comfort her, suggesting that assassination just was not her parents' style, and she had snapped at him. He had stalked off to the other side of the room, and though he had continued to defend her parents to Tenelka and Princess Holder, toward her he had remained silent and withdrawn. By the force! Jaina secured her own stealth X and caught up to him. Is that what this is about? What I said in the sitting room? I was worried about my parents. You can't hold that against me. I don't, Zek replied. I just finally realized what— He caught himself and softened his tone. Look, Jaina, I just realized that you've been right all along. We're better as friends than we would ever be as lovers. I know you've been saying it for years— but I guess part of me really didn't believe it until now. Jaina was so astonished that she stopped walking and simply stood there staring at Zek's broad back. She had broken off their romance when they were teenagers, and she had been trying to get him to stop pursuing her ever since. So why did it suddenly feel like she had lost something? 
Now that she understood what had happened, Jaina realized she could still feel Zek's presence in the back of her mind. He was strong and certain and independent. And so over her. He had finally granted her wish. And that was a good thing. It really was. Jaina hurried to catch up, then fell in at Zek's side. It's about time, she grumbled. Now maybe I can stop waiting until you're asleep to take my Santa steams. Zek laughed. It didn't work anyway, he said. I kept having these dreams. You did? Jaina glanced over to find a mischievous glint in Zek's eye. But now that she had located their connection again, she knew he was telling the truth. And you didn't say anything? Zek shrugged and flashed an embarrassed grin. I thought they were just, well, dreams. Janus started to accept his explanation, then had the sudden realization that he was mocking her. Liar! She punched him in the shoulder. Let's just deliver Tenelka's message. Sure, Zek chuckled. That's what I've been trying to do. Janus strode ahead taking the lead as they crossed the last few meters to the gate. Villa Solis was a cluster of squat round buildings, constructed of white gratinite and located in the heart of the planet's remote moorlands. It was surrounded by two hundred kilometers of bog country, and the only practical way to reach it was by air. All in all, it was one of the most isolated and inaccessible retreats Jaina had ever visited, but she supposed that was the point. Lady Galni had warned them that the only thing her sister the Dutcha enjoyed more than privacy was hunting, and there would certainly be plenty of both available at Villa Solis. As they drew nearer, Jaina kept expecting a panel to slide open in the tarnished crotium gate so a sentry, or at least a security droid, could issue a challenge. But the villa remained eerily silent, with nothing stirring but the dank bog breeze. Too quiet, Zek said. They must know we're here. Yeah, Jaina said. As elusive as stealth X's were, even they created a sonic boom when they sliced down through an atmosphere at many times the local speed of sound. Maybe we scared them. Once they had stopped in front of the gates, a brass-sheathed tentacle shot up to each side of them. Jaina and Zek both snapped the lightsabers off their belts and pivoted so they were standing back to back, and Jaina found herself looking into the bobbing dark blue lens of a servo droid gatekeeper's iPod. You have one minute to leave the estate. The gatekeeper's voice, emitted by a small vocabulator hidden behind its iPod, had been customized to sound sibilant and menacing. Failure to obey will be dealt with harshly. We are here with a message for the Dutcha, Jaina replied. You're not on the schedule. It was the gatekeeper on Zek's side that spoke this time, in a voice that was sugary and feminine. You should have requested an appointment. How? Zek asked. The holonet doesn't reach Terraphon. Our message is from Queen Mother Tenel Ka, Jaina added. It's important. Then you'll have to make an appointment and return when you're on the schedule, the first gatekeeper said. The Dutcha is not in residence at this time. Jaina frowned. The Royal Intelligence Service says she is, she retorted and they haven't been wrong about the whereabouts of any of the other nobles we've visited. The two gatekeepers reared back on their motility tentacles. You have thirty seconds to depart, the first said. In a sweet voice, the second added, Termination procedures are already under prepper. Jaina activated her lightsaber in the same instant Zek's blade snapped to life. They lashed out together not so much slicing through the iPods as incinerating them, then reversed their strokes in perfect unison, 
cut the motility tentacles off at the ground, and pivoted to face the gate. Better mission partners than we would be lovers, too, Jaina observed. No surprise, Zek grunted. We've actually been on missions together. When the attack the gatekeepers had threatened did not materialize, Jaina asked, Why would the Dutcha be so reluctant to hear a message from Tenelka? Don't know, Zek said. Guess we'll have to ask her when we track her down. Jaina glanced up into the night sky, eyeing the bright flecks of the Dutch's gathering fleet. I think there are a couple of things we'll need to ask her about. She reached out in the force and was a little surprised to feel only a single sentient presence on the other side of the gate. Open up, she demanded. We're not here to hurt anyone. There was no response. After a moment, Zek glanced at Jaina and cocked a questioning brow. Jaina shrugged and stepped into position behind him, prepared to counter any attacks they were about to draw. Zek plunged his lightsaber into the seam where the gate met the wall, then began to drag the blade slowly downward, cutting the internal locking bars. A muffled voice sounded from the other side. Stop! They heard a loud clunk. Then the gate retracted into the wall with a pneumatic whoosh. On the other side stood a brawny, moon-faced woman wearing a grimy leather apron over a much-stained tunic. Her eyes were narrow and puffy. Her nose was wide and flat, and her thick lips were curled into a permanent sneer. All in all, she was probably the ugliest tapen whom Jaina had ever seen. The woman frowned at Jaina. It wasn't necessary to have your man cut the Duchess' gate, she said. I would have let you in. Then you shouldn't have taken so long to make up your mind. Jaina deactivated her lightsaber, but continued to glare at the woman. What's your name? Entora, the woman replied. Entora Zar. Well, Entora, Jaina said, the next time a Jedi Knight addresses you, you might want to answer. She and Zek stepped through the gate into an eye-boggling mass of domed white gratinite structures, packed so tightly that at first glance it looked impossible to squeeze between them. Every window was shuttered, every door closed, and aside from the ugly woman, there was no one in sight. Jaina extended her force awareness a few dozen meters deeper into the compound and felt only the furtive presences of tiny vermin creatures. Where is everyone? Zek demanded. Gone, Zar said. Your poor piloting was an affront to the Duchess' sensibilities. Jaina was too astonished by Zar's audacity to be offended. Our piloting? Your entry angle was too steep, Zar said. You couldn't decelerate fast enough to make a graceful approach. I'm surprised you didn't rip your wings off. We weren't trying to make a graceful approach, Jaina said through gritted teeth. And I don't recall asking your opinion. Our craft have unique flight characteristics, Zek explained. They don't handle like XJ-7s, especially in the atmosphere. I doubt you could do any better with an XJ-7, Zar replied. You obviously need more simulator time in anything you fly. This was too much for Jaina. Listen, Rodder, I started flying XJs into combat before I was old enough to sign my own contracts. How many hours have you logged? In an XJ? No, in a pedal car. Jaina retorted, Of course, in an XJ. Zar looked away. None, actually. None? Jaina could not believe what she was hearing. No decent pilot would presume to know the proper atmospheric entry angle for a craft she'd never flown. Then what do you fly? A lot of different stuff, Zar answered with pride. The Naboo Royal N1? the Mark I Headhunter, the Z-Char DFS, 
Those are antiques, not starfighters, Gina objected. And the DFS was a droid fighter, Zek said, scowling suspiciously. Where have you been flying those craft? Zarg glared at Zek clearly offended that a mere male would dare question her credentials. "'The same place I do all my flying,' she said. "'On my holo simulator, I'm a rated instructor.' Jaina's jaw dropped. "'Are you crazy? There's a—' She felt a force nudge from Zek and realized that she was allowing herself to be distracted by what was at best an irrelevancy— and at worst, an intentional delaying tactic. Never mind. Just take us to the Dutcha. But Tsar wasn't ready to drop the holo simulator debate. In fact, I'm probably a better pilot than you, since my unit— You're not, Jaina interrupted, and we're done arguing about it. Jaina pushed past on one side, and Zek on the other, both ignoring Tsar's protests that they had no permission. As the daughter of a famous stateswoman, Gina had learned early that it was always best to ignore blowhards and idiots. There were no human presences in any of the nearby buildings. Gina extended her force awareness deeper into the villa and was surprised to feel nothing there either. But when she reached beyond the compound itself into the surrounding area, she did detect a knot of frightened people deep under the hill in the vicinity of the villa's underground hangar. "'You feel that?' Jaina asked Zek. "'They're hiding from us.' Zek nodded. "'Probably an emergency shelter under the hill with a hangar.' "'That would make sense,' Jaina said. "'But why would they be afraid of us?' Zek shrugged. "'Guess we'll have to ask them.' He did not bring up the possibility of asking Tsar and Jaina did not suggest it. Another conversation with the woman would only cause further delay, and Jaina doubted they would learn anything useful. Tsar was hardly the type of woman a shrewd hapen noble would trust with any information not meant to deceive. They continued deeper into the villa, with Tsar trailing along and protesting. Now and again a mouse droid zipped across a nearby intersection, and once they came across a cleaning droid carefully polishing the gratinite blocks that paved the walkway. Otherwise, the interior of the villa remained as deserted as the entrance had been. Given that the buildings were all locked and that they were simply here to deliver a message, Jaina refrained from breaking in. But from the evidence she noticed as they passed, scarred door frames, an outdoor roasting pit, the sour smell of tanning vats— the villa certainly appeared to be the favorite hunting retreat of a very wealthy noble. The only odd part was that the Dutcha would feel compelled to take her entire household into hiding because two Jedi had arrived with a message from Tenel Ka. A few moments later, they reached the hill at the back of the compound, where an artificial cliff indicated the source of the gratinite that had been used to build Villa Solis. A pair of white towers stood tight against the cliff, one on each side of a large pit. The pit was surrounded by a chest-high wall, and from its interior rose a faint stench of decay and muskiness. After confirming that both towers were sealed as tightly as had been the other buildings, Jaina went to inspect the pit. It was about three meters deep from the foot of the wall, with a muddy bottom littered by crushed bones and animal skulls. Pressed into the thin mud were the impressions of dozens of huge paddle-shaped feet, always arranged in pairs on either side of a long serpentine depression. The back of the pit extended beneath the cliff, creating a large cave beneath the hill. Deep within the cave, Jaina sensed a cluster of semi-intelligent presences. Zek came to her side and peered over the wall, then made a sour face at the smell. I hope that isn't the only way in. Can't be. Jaina pointed at the strange tracks pressed into the mud at the bottom of the pit. No people feet. And I don't see the Dutcha crawling through the mud just to avoid us, either. Zek turned his attention to the towers beside the pit. 
The entrance must be in one of those. He started toward the nearest tower, holding his lightsaber and clearly intending to cut his way inside. Hold on, Jaina said. Let's not do any more damage than we have to. Dachagalni is supposed to be one of Tenelka's most loyal allies. She turned to Zar, who had finally stopped protesting, but was continuing to follow the two Jedi through the compound. How do we get into the emergency shelter? Jaina asked. You can help us, or you can explain to Dachagalni why we had to cut our way in. Zar frowned in confusion. Emergency shelter? She had barely spoken before a chorus of shrill squeals rang out from the pit. Jaina and Zek spun around to find six creatures. At least that was the number of mouths Jaina saw, spilling out of the cave in a slimy gray tangle. They were about as long as speeder bikes, with thick tubular bodies, stubby legs, and flipper-shaped feet. As soon as they saw Jaina and Zek, they launched themselves against the side of the pit. They hit belly first and clawed frantically at the stone, dragging themselves up high enough to thrust their round-nosed heads over the wall, snapping and screeching at the two Jedi. Jaina and Zek retreated a step and ignited their lightsabers, then were nearly knocked over as Zar pushed between them, placing herself between the lightsabers and the creatures from the pit. No, please! She spun and faced the two Jedi, extending her arms to protect the strange creatures. I'll tell you anything you want. Just don't hurt my babies. The creatures began to squeal more excitedly than ever, their heads bobbing up and behind Zar as they licked at her ears and arms, coating her head and shoulders with stringy yellow slime. Jaina wrinkled her nose in disgust. Your babies? They're the Dutch's favorite hunting mergs, Zar said. I'm their handler. Zek deactivated his lightsaber. Don't worry, he said. We're not going to hurt as long as you help us, Jaina interrupted. She sensed Zek's immediate disapproval, but stepped closer to Zar anyway. Sometimes Zek was just too criffing honorable for his own good. Why is the Dutch a hiding from us? She's not hiding, Zar said. I told you. She was so offended by your arrival that she decided to leave. She decided to leave after we arrived? Zek asked. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. Zar continued to hold her arms out protectively. After your sonic booms intruded on her serenity, she summoned me to say that she and the rest of the household would be departing. I was to stay and care for my babies, the mergs, and see to it that you didn't steal anything. Steal anything? Jaina began to have a sinking feeling. Did the Dutch know who we were? She said the Jedi... Zar's arms began to tremble, and her gaze fell on Jaina's still-ignited lightsaber. Please don't hurt my babies. It's not their fault. Nobody's going to hurt your mergs, Zek said. He frowned at Jaina. Right? Jaina deactivated her blade. I guess. To Zar, she said, But you've got to show us how to reach the hang... A low rumble sounded from deep inside the hill. An instant later, the almond-shaped silhouette of a heapen luxury yacht shot into view and began to climb skyward on a pillar of blue efflux. Jaina stretched her force awareness into the hangar and felt only emptiness. Zar, she asked, "'Is it customary for the Duchess to take the entire household?' When she departs Villa Solis? Not at all, Zar replied. About twenty of us stay here all the time. There's a lot to care for besides the mergs. I was afraid you'd say that. Jaina uttered a silent curse, then asked, Have you noticed the fleet orbiting Terraphon? A good pilot always keeps one eye on the sky, Zar said indignantly. 
Besides, they've been sending fighter squadrons down to be refitted all week. All week? Zek repeated. Zar frowned and started to count days on her fingers. Yes, all— Never mind, Jaina said. She turned to Zek. Before she could know about the coup attempt. There was a coup attempt? Zar asked. We never hear anything on Terrafon. Zek put a hand on her shoulder and turned her toward the nearest tower. Go. Find some place safe. Jaina frowned. You think the Dutcha is going to hit her own villa? I know she is. Zek tipped his head toward Zar, who had so far refused to leave. If you needed to leave a decoy behind, who would it be? Me? Zar shook her head emphatically. Never! I'm the Dutch's favorite riding companion. Jaina ignored Zar's protest and nodded to Zek. I see your point, she said. The Dutcha had started to mobilize her fleet before the coup attempt, which meant she had been one of its architects, and that was clearly a secret worth protecting, especially since Tenel Ka still seemed to think the Galni family was loyal. But I don't know that she'd level her own hunting villa just to get us. We're Jedi, Zek countered, and you know what it would mean to her if we get away. She has to be sure. Okay. Jaina had only to recall a few hollow-net accounts of miraculous Jedi escapes to know Zek was right. The Dutcha would be terrified that if they survived any attempts to kill them, they would warn Tenel Ka of her involvement in the coup. She turned to go. Let's get back to the— Jaina stopped when two hulking forms stepped out from behind a dwelling. They had wedge-shaped torsos, massive systems-packed arms, and gray laminanium armor. With red photoreceptors gleaming from the socket mountings of their distinctive death's head faces, there was no mistaking the droid's make. Why these? Jaina's heart leapt into her throat. Even Jedi were a poor match for the accuracy and ferocious firepower of YVH battle droids. She and Zek ignited their lightsabers. Uncle Luke better have a talk with Lando about who he's selling those things to. Zar frowned at their hissing blades. No need for that, Jedi Solo. They're just watch droids. She stepped forward, blocking the droid's line of fire. You two stand down. These guests were just leaving. Negative. The closer droid raised the arm containing its blaster cannon. Please clear an attack lane. Intruders are designated targets. Zar placed her hands on her hips. I decide who the targets are around here, 220. I'm the one the Dutcha left in charge. Ah, uh, Entora, Jaina said. Maybe you'd better listen. Jaina was cut off by the rapid whomping of a blaster cannon and suddenly there was blood and hot light everywhere. Knowing better than to allow the droids to concentrate their ferocious firepower, she and Zek sprang away in opposite directions, tumbling through the air in a wild helix of twists and flips, relying on the Force to stay one eye-blink ahead of the droids' targeting computers. A tremendous cracking echoed through the compound as cannon fire struck the wall around the merg pit, spraying rock chips and superheated dust everywhere. Jaina came down four meters away and rolled into a somersault, then launched herself into a long, arcing spiral. There were so many bolts, the air seemed about to burst into flame, and twice she had to use her lightsaber to deflect attacks that came so close she thought half her face would melt. A cacophony of ear-piercing shrieks sounded behind her, almost as loud as the droid's blaster cannons. Jaina hit the ground rolling and somersaulted into cover behind the wall of the first building she could find. She spun to face her attackers and was surprised to glimpse a string of slimy gray forms clambering through a smoky breach in the merg pit wall. The creature's eyes were wide open, 
They were trailing long strings of yellow drool, and, given their ungainly form and misshaped legs, they were slithering into the compound with a speed Jaina could only think of as astonishing. A volley of cannon bolts tore into the building she was using for cover, then abruptly went wide. She peered around the corner and saw that the pack of fleeing mergs had slammed headlong into the battle droids. Most had clamped their powerful jaws around a droid's leg or arm and were struggling to drag it down. But the smallest was holding what remained of Zar's lifeless body in its mouth and circling the melee, apparently trying to carry her to safety. Jaina glanced across the courtyard at Zek, who was also crouched behind a building studying the situation. She reached out to him in the force and knew instantly they were both thinking the same thing. Go while the going is good. Zek nodded toward her, then rolled in the opposite direction and disappeared behind the building. Jaina did likewise, racing down a twisting pathway that led more or less in the direction of the gate. She pulled her comlink and opened a direct channel to sneak her. Hard fire those engines! We're coming back hot and need to be at takeoff power fast! Sneaker replied with an irritated whistle. No time to explain, just do it! Jaina ordered. Though Jaina couldn't really understand beep code, it was easy enough to guess her astromech's objection. Because they were running low on fuel, Jaina and Zek had shut their stealth X's down without burning off the supply in the preheating cell. Hard-firing the engines now meant forcing cold fuel into the combustion chambers, and that would mean a complete overhaul, assuming, of course, the engines lasted long enough to return to base— Jaina was about halfway back to the gate when the mergs flashed across an adjacent intersection, now chortling and squawking in excitement. A moment later, she heard hissing servo motors and knew one of the battle droids had found her. She dodged around a bend, barely escaping death as a flurry of cannon bolts blasted a meter-wide hole through a gratinite wall. The battle droid pounded after her, its blaster cannon continuing to punch black stars into the building at her back. When Jaina came to the next intersection, she used the force to send a rock clattering down the walkway toward the gate, then deactivated her lightsaber, ducked around the opposite side of the building, and dropped to her belly on the cold walkway. It seemed to take the battle droid forever to arrive. Jaina began to worry that despite her precautions— it had detected her heat signature with a thermal imaging sweep, or had perhaps picked up the pounding of her pulse through an acoustic analysis. She concentrated on her breathing, trying to quiet her heart with a relaxation exercise she rarely used. From the other side of the compound came the sound of Zek's battle against his own pursuer, his lightsaber droning in muffled counterpoint to the rapid crump of the battle droid's blaster cannon— even more troubling was the fear and uncertainty Jaina felt through the Force, the growing desperation as the droid continued to press its assault. She began to fear Zek was not going to make it, that the time had come to see if she could slip away from her own attacker and take Zek's by surprise. And that was when the distant roar of an atmospheric entry crackled down from the sky. Jaina craned her neck, and quickly found a dozen bright efflux tails streaking from the stars. She thought for a moment the Dutcha was sending a squadron of mytils down to support the battle droids, but realized there was another, more important target for the starfighters. Jaina pulled her comlink, intending to warn her astromech that the stealth X was about to come under attack, then heard servo motors hissing around the bend, exactly as she had planned but the battle droid was being uncharacteristically cautious, taking time to sweep the area with its sensors, alert to the possibility of an ambush. Jaina held her breath and pressed herself tighter to the ground, trying to stay calm, trying to slow her breathing and her heart. The droid had probably switched from an attack routine to a stalking routine, and if she could not control her bodily responses, they would give her away. For the next few moments, Jaina could do nothing but lie on the ground and listen to the roar of the mytils grow louder. 
the sound of Zek's lightsaber began to fade as his fight drifted toward the gate, and she could sense his growing desperation through their combat melt. By now he had to be using the Force to keep himself going. Soon his skin would begin to nettle with the effects of drawing on the Force too heavily, and then he would simply stop. Zek would rather die than risk a brush with the dark side, and that was one of the things that frustrated Jaina about him. To him, a thing was either right or wrong, good or evil, and that made every choice simple. Either you loved someone or you didn't. There was no room for uncertainty, no room to be confused about how you felt, to wonder where the boundary lay between a lifelong friendship and love, or even if there was one. Finally, a pair of metallic footfalls sounded from the other side of the building. Jaina remained where she was, working harder than ever to quiet her heart and her breathing. The droid would be going into a flushing routine now, and it would be alert to the possibility of attack. Another trio of footfalls sounded from the other side of the building, then a whole series. Jaina rose as quietly as possible, then slipped around the bend and saw the battle droid moving down another walkway toward the gate. She started after it, running as silently as was possible, her lightsaber still deactivated but cocked to strike. She was almost there when the droid pivoted, presenting its flank and fixing its red photoreceptors on her face. Its arm came up, and Jaina's throat cramped with fear as she found herself looking down the barrel of a blaster cannon. She dropped into a slide, and a stream of colored bolts crumped past so close she felt her skin blistering beneath its heat. The droid lowered its arm, blasting head-sized craters out of the walkway as it tried to track her. Jaina activated her lightsaber and slammed the blade into its knee as hard as she could. The leg came off in a shower of sparks and hydraulic fluid, and the droid crashed down almost on top of her, jamming the cannon barrel against the ground and blowing its own arm apart as it continued to fire. A spray of hot shrapnel sliced into Jaina's back and neck. She continued her slide, using the force to pull herself free, then switched off her lightsaber and sprang to her feet a couple of meters down the walkway. She raced around the bend just ahead of a mini-missile that reduced five meters of gratinite wall to crashing rubble. Once Jaina's ears had stopped ringing, she was relieved to hear the boom, boom, boom of a grenade volley coming from the other side of the villa. She reached out to Zek through their battle meld and sensed his presence somewhere ahead, near the gate. There was no way to tell exactly what had happened, but from the sounds of it, he too had found a way to cripple the droid chasing him. They were going to make it back to the stealth X's after all. Then a long series of sonic booms shook the villa, and Jaina looked up to see the mytils streaking down toward the stealth X's. She pulled her comlink and opened a channel to her astromech. Sneaker, bring up the shields, and tell— She was interrupted by a negative chirp. Of course. With all that cold congealed fuel in the system, even hard-firing the engines would not have them at full power yet. All right, Sneaker, just do your— the astromex acknowledging Tweedle vanished in the thundering crash of a missile detonation. A brilliant flash lit the sky outside the villa, then several more detonations came, each brighter than the last, and all in the approximate area of the stealth X's. By the time the explosion stopped, Jaina had reached the front courtyard of the villa. The gate had been closed, and the mergs were clawing at it in such a panic they had gouged the hard crotium. Zack was standing atop the wall, staring out toward a plume of black smoke. Even had Jaina not sensed his frustration, she would have known by the angry cloud on his face that their starfighters had been destroyed. A distant roar sounded out over the bog, and Jaina looked up to see the mytils wheeling around for another pass. She raced forward and force sprang over the merg pack, then came down atop the wall next to Zek. Where their stealth X's had been, there were now six smoking craters. 
We'd better get out of here, Jaina said. She turned her attention back to the sky and saw that the Mytils were already diving back toward the villa. You were right about the Dutcha. When it comes to Jedi, she doesn't think there's any such thing as overkill. There isn't, Zek said darkly. And when we find a way off of this mud ball, I'm going to hunt her down and prove it. Instead of jumping down outside the wall and running for cover in the bogs, he dropped back inside the wall and shoved through the screeching mergs toward the gate controls. Are you crazy? Jaina cried from the top of the wall. Those mytils will be dropping bombs in about five seconds. Then help get these gates open. Jaina started to protest, then realized she would just be wasting time. Whatever else he was, Zek was as kind and courageous as Jedi came, and nothing was going to change that. Not even her. Zek, sometimes you're a real pain in the neck. She used the Force to pull a pair of mergs out of his way, and he finally reached the gate controls. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm kind of starting to like it. Now you tell me. Zek pulled the lock slicer out of his equipment belt and started to work on the gate controls. Let me know when we're out of time. Why? Jaina turned toward the approaching Mytils. Would it make any difference? Not really, Zek said. The lock slicer surprised Jaina by beeping a success signal after only a couple of seconds. The gates hissed open, and the mergs shot out toward the bog. But it's good to know you waited. Chapter 14 With dim blue lighting and the sweet taint of Rekka smoke in the air, Telker Station Cantina was the kind of place where smart customers kept their backs to as many walls as possible. Its only ceiling was a disorganized web of ventilation ducts suspended in the murk above, and there was a half-concealed entrance somewhere along every one of its eight walls. The patrons were clustered in groups of three and four, sitting around corroded steel tables and openly studying Han and his companions. What are we waiting for? Nashta demanded from behind Han. I'm thirsty. Just being sure, Han said. The cantina's clients were exclusively human and near-human, with no droids, and roughly balanced between handsome men with scroungy three-day beards and beautiful heapen women dressed to look tough but available. C-3PO and the Nogri were back in the Falcon so Han thought he and his two female companions would fit right in, unless someone recognized him or Leia from an old hollow news broadcast. I can't believe Hapen Security wouldn't cover this place. They will, but there won't be many. Nashta pushed past Han and started toward the bar. If they cause us any trouble, we'll kill them. Yeah, that's a great plan. Han retorted. We wouldn't want to cause a scene or anything. But Nashta was already halfway to the bar, no doubt far more aware of the gazes furtively following her progress than she let on. Having rebuffed Leia's suggestion that they all wear disguises, claiming her contact would not show up unless both she and the Solos were easily recognizable, she now seemed determined to draw the entire station's attention. I don't like it, Han said to Leia. She's testing us. Clearly, Leia said. But she's our only lead. What are we going to do? How about not going along? Han took Leia's arm and turned toward the grimy access corridor. We'll head back to the Falcon and let her come to us. Leia pulled him back into the cantina entrance and take the chance that she'd just disappear? She freed herself from his grasp. We can't. Too much depends on her. Leia started after their companion. Han cursed under his breath, then reluctantly followed the pair toward the bar. The cantina was almost certainly being watched by Hapen security, and Nashta was deliberately exposing the solos to see what happened. 
If someone tried to kill or capture them, she would probably accept their story and let them fly her the rest of the way to her employers. On the other hand, if nothing happened, or if the capture efforts appeared insincere, she would either slip away quietly or try to kill them herself. Han was betting on kill. At the bar, an aproned bartender with a cleft chin and dark eyes came over to take their orders. Han was immediately suspicious of the fellow's athletic build and clean-shaven face. But if he was a heapin' agent, he was a well-prepared one. He fixed Leia's fog blaster and even Nashta's red cloud without having to consult the data pad behind the bar for a drink recipe. He placed the two drinks on the counter, along with a geyser ale for Han, then said, Thirty credits. Thirty credits? Han objected. I see why they call this a pirate station. The bartender merely pointed at Nashta's red cloud. Blood ain't cheap. Blood? Han made a sour face, but removed a pair of credit chips from his pocket and laid them on the counter. At that price, I hope it's yours. They took a seat in the nearest corner at a rust-stained table that looked as if it hadn't been wiped down in a month. Leia refused to set her glass down, and even Han refrained from resting his elbows on the surface. If Nashtan noticed the filth, she didn't show it, simply dropping onto the bench opposite the solos with her back against the wall, then resting one arm along the table. Han took a sip of geyser and frowned at how flat it was. I hope we don't have to wait long. He glanced around the cantina casually, trying to decide whether Nashta's contact was the guy in the new utilities or that classy-looking brunette in the Syntex vest. I can't bring myself to drink two of these. It was brewed back when Ta Chum was queen mother. Nashta shrugged. It may take a while. You are unexpected companions, so my contact will be careful. She took a long sip of her red cloud, then raised it toward Han. But you can always try one of these. They're fresh. Han made a sour face. No, thanks. I'd rather drink water. From here? Leia glanced at the filthy table. Don't you dare. They sat for a time, waiting for a contact that probably did not exist to approach. Han and Leia only sipped at their drinks. Han, because his geyser barely tasted like ale, and Leia because she hated fog blasters and only ordered them when she wanted to nurse a drink without having to think about it. But Nashta drank more steadily, draining half her glass within the first quarter hour. After another couple of minutes, she leaned across the table to Leia. Someone is watching you. Yes, I have that feeling too, Leia said. Probably a hapen surveillance team, Han said wryly. Maybe we should get out of here before the backup arrives. Nashta shook her head. He doesn't look hapen, and you may know him. He's trying very hard to keep out of your sight line. Han turned toward Leia, straddling the bench as though he were going to face her, and sneaking a glance toward the corner where Nashta was looking. He glimpsed a square-shouldered man with a thick beard and a mop of dark hair hanging in his eyes. The fellow quickly turned toward the wall to hide his face, but failed to change his upright posture, or the military precision of his movements. You know, something does look kind of familiar about him, Han said. He's trying to hide it, but that guy is a soldier, and I have this crazy feeling we do know him. We should, Leia said. She was still looking across the table toward Nashta, but Han could tell by her unfocused gaze that her concentration was on the force. I think he almost married our daughter. What? Han spoke loudly enough that, despite the raucous buzz of scrack music, he drew glances from several nearby tables. He lowered his voice and leaned closer to Leia. Come on. 
You can't be telling me that's who I think you mean. I don't understand either, Leia said. But his presence feels very familiar. You know him? Nashta asked. Then we must go say hello. Before Han could stop her, Nashta rose and started across the cantina, weaving just enough to suggest it was not an act. Uh-oh, Leia said. This looks like trouble. The Solos rose and started after her. Han was surprised at Nashta's condition. Whatever else she was, she was clearly a top-notch assassin. And top-notch assassins did not let themselves get intoxicated on a job, and probably not many other times either. They arrived at the bearded man's table, just as Nashta sat on the bench opposite him. Me why you are following my friends, she was saying, and your death will be a painless one. You'll have to forgive our friend, Leia said, sliding onto the bench on the bearded man's side of the table. I'm afraid she doesn't hold her spirits very well. Yeah, she'll probably miss. Han slid onto the bench next to Nashta, positioning himself close enough that she would have to push him out of the way before she could reach the blaster in her thigh holster. At least the first time. Then let's hope it doesn't come to that. The bearded man reluctantly looked away from the wall. Though the hair hanging over his brow concealed the crooked scar running up his forehead, there was no mistaking the steely green eyes. Because I never miss the first time. Nashta tensed, but Han slapped a hand on her thigh, blocking access to her holster, and smiled across the table. Jagged fell. He was genuinely pleased. Glad to see we didn't kill you after all. Leia frowned. What Han means to say is we're happy to see you well. We inquired about you many times, but Aristic Reform Bee kept claiming your status was a military secret. Because I had yet to be recovered. Fell's voice was polite but reserved. After you shot me down, I was marooned for two years. Two years? Leia touched his forearm, drawing a flinch visible even across the table. She quickly withdrew her hand. Jagged, I am sorry. Before we departed to Noop, Aristic Reform Bee led us to believe your recovery was imminent. Tanoop can be a very dangerous planet, as you know, he said. The recovery team vanished, and the decision was made to risk no more lives on behalf of one pilot. Sorry, kid. That was a tough break, Han said. So how did you get out of the jungle? My family hired a private rescue company, and one of their search parties met a— Fell stopped, picking his words carefully. They met an unfortunate end. I repaired one of their comm sets, and when the next party arrived looking for them, I was able to make contact. Telker Station is a long way from the Unknown Regions, Nashta said suspiciously. What are you doing here? Looking for the Solos, of course, Fell said. Han raised his brow. Kid, if this is about Jaina, it isn't. Fell said, a little too forcefully. Jaina has caused the Fell family enough problems for one lifetime. All right, Han said, wincing inside at the sharpness of Fell's voice. He had always kind of liked Fell, and there had been a time when he would have gladly welcomed him as a son-in-law, except for the part about dragging Jaina off to live in the Chiss Ascendancy. I was just saying that if I'm here because of Alima Rar, Fell said, cutting him off. Alima? Leia furrowed her brow. I don't understand. She's dead. No more than I am, Fell said. Han looked over at Leia. You said some kind of spider sloth ate her. I said 
I was fairly sure, Leia corrected. She looked back to Fel. It had half her body in its mouth. I can't imagine she escaped, much less survived. I assure you she did both, Fel said. The creature— He let his sentence trail off when the bartender suddenly appeared, carrying the drinks Han, Leia, and Nashta had left on their first table. One table at a time, the bartender said. He banged the drinks down and turned to Fel. You drinking or leaving? Fel's eyes went to the mug of ale sitting in front of Han. I'll have one of those. The bartender grunted an acknowledgment and departed. Han eyed the glasses. His drink and Leia's were still about three-quarters full, but Nashta had emptied almost all of hers. That bartender seems pretty determined to see us finish our drinks. I wouldn't indulge him if I were you, Fel said. Nashta narrowed her eyes. Why? Because drinking can be bad for your health, Han said, resisting the urge to look around. He was pretty sure now that the bartender was part of a Hapen security team and he wanted to hear the rest of Fell's story before the fighting started. Didn't anyone ever tell you that? Nashta turned to glare at the bartender, but said nothing. Fell pretended not to notice and shifted his gaze back to Leia. I was preparing to tell you about Alima, he said. She killed the creature before it had a chance to eat her. You found its carcass? Leia asked. Fell shook his head. Bodies decompose too fast in the jungle. He reached inside his jacket, causing Nashta to reach for her thigh holster again. Whoa there, Han said, managing to clasp the assassin's arm before she could draw the blaster. Nashta squinted at him in disbelief. How'd you do that? Old smuggling trick, Han said casually. Something was definitely wrong with their drinks. He had seen how fast Nashta was, and he should never have been able to stop her. Not on his best day thirty years earlier. Jag isn't going to hurt anyone here. He just wants to show us something. Nashta squinted across the table, but she pulled her hand away from her holster. Don't try anything stupid. You have nothing to fear from me, I assure you, Fell said. Once it was clear she would not be trying to blast him, he pulled a coil of braided hide strips from inside his jacket. He held it in front of Leia. You know what this is, I assume? Leia nodded. A Twi'lek memory cord. A long one. Correct. I found it on Tanoop shortly after I discovered the bodies of the commercial search party I mentioned. He laid it on the table. But their vessel was missing, and I followed the tracks of a lame female back to a cave where she had been living. And that's where you found this? Leia asked. Fell nodded. My family had it researched. The first part seems to recount how she saved herself by cutting the spider sloth's throat from the inside. It bit down, just as you described, but the creature was already dying, and didn't do as much damage as you led Aristic Reformby to believe. Her lightsaber was activated when the creature took her, Leia said. I just didn't think she'd kill the thing quickly enough to survive. She nearly didn't, Fell said he pointed to the next set of knots. These describe her wounds and recovery. Her arm and six ribs were fractured, and she had several deep wounds in her abdomen and back. Fortunately for her, and unfortunately for us, when the Killicks evacuated after the battle, they left thousands of stragglers behind. She was able to summon a small group to care for her. Wait a minute. Han said. He was doing his best to keep an unobtrusive eye on the rest of the cantina, 
and so far the Hapen security team seemed willing to wait for them to finish their drinks and pass out. Are you saying the Killicks are still there? I doubt it, Fell said. They were castaways, just as I was. I had regular, um, encounters with them during the first year, but they were always from different nests, and by the second year they were beginning to disappear. I think they lived out their lives and died. That makes sense. Killicks have short lifespans, Leia said. But a year would have been enough to nurse Alima back to health. Indeed. She records each of their deaths in detail. Fell paused, then indicated a set of knots that seemed to repeat themselves every four or five centimeters. But these knots are the reason I'm here. They appear to be a recurring list of injuries received at your hands. And the knots between appear to be lists of possible retaliations. What are you getting at? Han demanded. Are you saying that crazy trollop is coming after Leia? I'm telling you what I found in her cave, Fell replied evenly. What you make of it is your business. Leia's eyes flashed a warning at Han. Then she turned back to Fell. Thank you for telling me, Jagged. After what happened on Tanoop, I know it couldn't have been easy for you. Easy doesn't matter. Fell's gaze grew distant, and perhaps a little hard. You warned me to eject, and I had a debt to repay. Now I have. I see. Leia's expression turned sad. So now you'll be heading back to the Ascendancy? Fell shook his head. No. I'll be watching you. Han would have asked why, except that was when the bartender returned. He set Fel's ale on the table, then frowned at Nashta, who was slumped in the corner with the same unfocused gaze that Leia often assumed when she entered a force trance. Is Baldy all right? he asked. I don't want nobody dying in here. She's fine. Han slurred his words deliberately but he truly was feeling a little warm and drowsy. Just forgets to close her eyes. The bartender scowled in suspicion. Han thought he might have overdone it, but Fell made a point of lifting his own mug to his lips and taking a small sip. Excellent! He smacked his lips with exaggerated pleasure, then set his mug on the table and wiped the froth away with his sleeve. Very thirst-quenching, Han frowned. Really? You don't think it's a little flat? Not at all. Fell's eyes flicked away nervously. But when it comes to ale, my tastes aren't very refined. That must be it. Han raised his own mug to his lips and took another small sip, then nodded. Yeah. The more you drink, the better it tastes. The bartender grunted and returned to his bar. Once he was gone, Han turned back to Fell. So why are you watching us? Because we're bait, Leia surmised. Her face was a bit flushed, but she seemed alert enough to finish the conversation and run. She turned to Fell. Your assignment is to hunt down Alima and make sure she can't restart the Dark Nest, isn't it? That's my intention, yes, Fell said, but not my assignment. I'm no longer with the Ascendancy military, Han frowned. If you're not on assignment, what are you doing here? I have nothing to hide, Fell pretended to take another long drink from his mug. I'm in exile. Exile? Leia asked. Why? As you know, I guaranteed Lobaka's parole at Koribu. When he participated in the attack on Supply Depot Thrago, 
my family became liable for the damage he inflicted on the ascendancy from that point on. A look of sorrow suddenly came over Leia's face, and Han's stomach began to feel a bit hollow. It hadn't been him who tricked Lobaka and the others into attacking Supply Depot Thrago, but it had been his son Jason. As I'm sure you know, Wookiees can do a lot of damage, Fel continued, especially Jedi Wookiees. When my family couldn't cover the expenses, I was forced to leave the Ascendancy. Leia's chin dropped. Jagged, I'm sorry. If there's anything we can do— There isn't, Fel said a little sharply. There's nothing any Jedi or Solo can do that would change the decree of the ruling families. I know things look bad now, but give it some time, Leia said. After you find Alima, I'm sure the Ascendancy will reconsider— Then you don't know the Ascendancy, Fel snapped. Finding Alima will redeem my family's honor and give it the means to rebuild its fortune, but my situation will remain the same. If ever I return to the Ascendancy, my entire family will be dishonored. Well, whatever we can do. Han didn't like the tone Fel was taking with Leia, but the kid did have a pretty good reason to be angry. Use us as bait all you want. Everyone else does. He cast a meaningful glance over at Nashta, who was still slumped against the wall, staring off into space. I am using you as bait. Fell pushed his mug to the table center and started to rise. And now, if you'll excuse me, not so fast. Han took a quick glance around and was dismayed to notice half a dozen pairs of eyes turned in their direction. There's one thing about your story that bothers me. Jag did not return to his seat. That's really not my problem, Captain Solo. For old time's sake, Leia said. She grabbed Fell behind the elbow and, using the force, pulled him down onto the bench. I think Han is saying that your account doesn't add up. Yeah, Han said. That's exactly what I'm saying. There's no way you found us on your own. Actually, it wasn't difficult at all, Fell said. The Hollow News is filled with stories about your defection to Corellia. This isn't Corellia, Han said. True, but I happen to see a communique from Admiral Blatu. Fell glanced nervously around the cantina, then continued. He was convinced that Corellia's next move would be an attempt to persuade Hapes to enter the war on her side. You're lying, Han said, with more hope than conviction. Despite his fury over Gedjin using them to set up the assassination attempt on Tenel Ka, his heart remained with Corellia, and it alarmed him to think that the Galactic Alliance was good enough to predict Gedjin's desperate ploy. Nobody sees that kind of communique. There are plenty of officers in the Galactic Alliance who value honor as highly as the Chiss, Fell said. Is it too much to believe that one of them would assist me with the hunt for Ali Marar? Especially since it was the Alliance who asserted that she was dead? He's got a point, Leia said to Han, and I don't feel like he's lying. Han understood what she was saying, that she could sense through the Force that Fell was telling the truth. But he remained suspicious. It's still a long way from that message to Telker Station. Not as long as you think, Captain Solo, Fell said. You two have known the Queen Mother since she was a child. Who else was Corellia going to send? Which gets you halfway here. Leia pointed out. But nothing you've said explains how you went from Hapes to Telker Station. That was the simplest part of all. Fell glanced across the cantina. I followed him. Han followed Fell's gaze to the bartender, who was pretending to wipe down the counter.
but watching them. Of course, Leia said quietly. Hapen security. Fell nodded. His team departed the Fountain Palace a few hours after your attack on the Queen Mother. That right? It irked Han to let Fell believe he and Leia had actually tried to kill Tenel Ka. Clearly, the kid had already come to the conclusion that none of the Solos had any honor. But Han could hardly set the record straight with Nashta sitting beside him. And you just happened to slap your homing beacon on their ship? Not really. Fell rose to his feet again. I picked his team because I heard a hangar tech say it was going to the vilest den of corruption and degeneracy in consortium space. Naturally, I knew you would show up sooner or later. You might want to be careful how you put that next time. Han was getting tired of Fell's bitter exile act, but he had to admit the kid's logic was pretty good. Telker Station was exactly the kind of place where an outlaw ship hanging around this part of the consortium would eventually put in for supplies. But thanks for warning us about the drinks. You're welcome, though I suspect you were expecting trouble. Fell's gaze slid over to Nashta, who was now sitting up and blinking. Now you'll have to excuse me. This fight really won't be any of my concern. Fell started toward the exit, leaving Han and his companions to locate the security team. It was hardly difficult. They were the ones trying too hard to mind their own business, appearing more interested in their drinks or conversation than in what was happening around them. Han quickly counted a standard surveillance team of six agents, including the bartender. They were scattered around the cantina near the exits with a clear line of sight to the Solos, and well-positioned to cut off any escape attempt. It took longer to locate the team leader. Han was expecting a woman to be in charge, and initially paid no attention to the scrawny fellow seated alone at the end of the bar. But the second time he looked, the man was studying their half-filled glasses and muttering into his drink. We just ran out of time. As Han spoke, he was swinging his legs out from beneath the table and dropping his hand toward his blaster holster. If he wanted to convince Nashta that he and Leia were for real without a lot of bloodshed, he had to act now. I think they're mad because we don't like the drinks. The leader looked away and muttered into his drink more urgently. Han flipped the power setting on his blaster to stun then drew and fired twice without standing. The first bolt only grazed the leader's abdomen, melting a dark line across the front of his tunic and causing him to hunch over in pain. The second caught him full in the flank, knocking him to the floor in a convulsing mass. In the instant of stunned silence that followed, Han thought his plan might succeed, that he and Leia and Nashta might actually disappear into the station's tangled corridors before the surveillance team recovered from its shock. Then he stood. His knees went weak, and his head began to spin, and he had to brace himself on the table. Han? Pulling her lightsaber from beneath her robe as she moved, Leia rose and started to reach for him, then had to put a hand down to catch herself. Whoa! Strong stuff! Yeah, Han said. The security team was already recovering from its shock and drawing weapons. Really hits you. Renatil, a bounty hunter favorite, explained Nashta. Suddenly she seemed alert and ready to fight, clearly a result of the force trance she had entered. You don't notice it until you try to stand. Then you fall flat on your face. Thanks for the warning, Han griped starting to feel even more queasy and dizzy. Half the security team, two tall burly men and a stony-eyed woman with high cheeks and thin brows, were already bringing blaster pistols to bear and shouting orders to surrender. Leia's lightsaber came to life with a sharp snap hiss, but Nashta showed no sign of rising to go with the solos. 
Han frowned at her. You coming? Not yet. She drew a long-barreled blaster from her thigh holster. I hate being drugged. Then you'd better come with us now, Han said. He stepped in front of her, extending a hand as though to help, but actually trying to block her line of fire. If you think this is bad, wait until the Hapen interrogators— Nashta raised her blaster and squeezed the trigger, sending a bolt of blue heat screeling past Han's ear. He cried out in astonishment, then turned and saw the bartender tumbling away behind the bar. A T-21 repeating blaster flying from his hands and a wisp of smoke rising between his eyes. Han dropped his head. I really wish you hadn't done that. Now things are going to get... Before he could finish, the cantina broke into an uproar of shouting voices and screaming weapons. Leia's lightsaber growled as she brought her blade around to defend. Han! she yelled. A little help? Han whirled around to find Leia frantically batting aside full-power blaster bolts, doing her best to avoid hurting anyone by directing the attacks up into the web of ducts that served as the cantina ceiling. But the Renatil was having its effect on her, slowing her reflexes enough that some bolts ricocheted off a wall or the floor instead, and a couple even slipped through and went screaming past Han's head. Keeping his own blaster set to stun, Han began to return fire, concentrating on a trio of agents between them and the exit. He dropped one, and Leia started toward the exit, staggering and weaving. Blaster bolts began to pour in from behind. Han spun around to lay covering fire, but the cantina slipped into a renatil-laced spin, and he could see nothing but whirling blurs of color. He pointed his blaster into the stream of blue bolts and held the trigger down, then cried out in shock as something hot slammed into his shoulder. Han was on the floor before he knew he was falling, his nostrils burning with the smell of scorched flesh, one side of his body throbbing in searing pain. To his surprise— he was still holding his blaster pistol, pouring fire toward a pair of amorphous forms that were fast taking the shape of charging security agents. Han? Leia cried. Are you— He'll be fine, Nashta called. Finally deciding to help out, she slipped off the bench and knelt at Han's side. She fired twice, and both agents went down with scorch holes in their faces. Perhaps I believe your story after all— too late, Han groaned. If we get out of here, you're on your own. Oh, you're angry? Nashta patted him on the cheek, then turned to face Leia's direction. How cute! She fired a dozen times, and suddenly the only sound in the cantina was the drone of Leia's lightsaber. Han rolled to his knees, nearly passing out from the pain and the renatil, and spun around. Leia was standing two meters ahead, holding her lightsaber at her side and staring at the motionless bodies of several Hapen security agents. When it grew obvious they were all dead, Leia deactivated her lightsaber and knelt beside Han. How bad I'll live. We've got other things to worry about. Han shifted his eyes toward Nashta, who was still kneeling on the floor beside him. That was just a surveillance team, but Han winced in pain as Leia pulled him to his feet. They had to have called for backup the minute they identified us, she said, finishing his sentence. You're right. We have to get out of here. Before we meet my contact? Nashta asked. What contact? Han demanded. You were just testing us but Nashta was already staggering toward the back of the cantina, clearly feeling the effects of the Renatil even more than the Solos. Though most of the bystanders were evacuating as quickly as possible, a classy-looking brunette in a red Syntex vest was standing just inside the rear exit, her eyes darting around nervously as Nashta approached. Han's shoulder was killing him, but he was beginning to think this might have been more than a test after all. What do you think? he asked Leia. I think we passed, Leia said. 
Are you up to this? For Tenel Ka, I'm up to anything. Han led the way after Nashta, grimacing inside as he and Leia stepped around wounded bystanders and motionless security agents. He was sickened by the thought of so many people getting killed, just because Nashta was too lazy to adjust the power setting on her blaster. But the stakes were too high to let his feelings show. The lives of Tenel Ka and her daughter depended on finding out who was behind the coup, and so did the stability of the Hapes Consortium. By the time Han and Leia arrived, Nashta was already talking to the woman. Come alone? she was asking. That was the agreement. The woman eyed the solos and frowned. For both of us. Those agents just proved that the solos are on your side, Nashta said, waving a hand at the dead Hapens. And I needed a ride. Your assassination plan was a setup. That's impossible, the woman retorted. If you think the Council is going to accept the blame for your failure, Nashta placed a hand over the woman's mouth, then slammed her against a durasteel wall and leaned in close. It is not a matter of what the Council will accept, Lady Morwan. Nashta's voice was cold and menacing. It is a matter of what I am going to do. The woman's eyes slid toward Leia as though seeking help. She's right, Lady Morwan, Leia said. They were waiting for us. Someone on your council is a spy. Morwan's eyes widened in alarm, and Han had to force himself not to smile. They had learned a lot about the coup already, but Leia had done something even more important. She had started to sow suspicion and discord within the organization itself. After a moment, Morwan nodded, and Nashta removed her hand. "'What are you going to do?' Morwan asked. "'Spy or no spy, the Council has paid you a hut's treasure. They expect you to earn your fee.' "'I will. My way.' Morwan considered this for a moment, then said, "'Very well. But the Council wants you to attend to the Chunda first. "'The child?' Nashta frowned. "'What about the Queen Mother?' After, Morwan said, we will always be able to find the Queen Mother. But now that we have made our intentions clear, the Chunda will be sent into hiding. Nashta did not even hesitate. I require another fee. Of course, once you have eliminated the Chunda, Morwan said. Your first fee will be payment for that. Nashta considered this, then nodded. Agreed. She stepped back and smoothed Morwan's vest. What kind of vessel did you come in? A Batog skiff. Morwan lowered her brow, clearly confused. Your instructions said to come in something small and anonymous— and you did well, Nashta said. Give me the security code. Morwan frowned. The security code? I need transport. Nashta glanced at Han. The Falcon is not very anonymous, even with the false transponder codes. But how will I? You are not my problem. Nashta jabbed her thumb into Morwan's larynx. The code! Elephon, Morwan gasped. That's the hatch code. Nashta eased the pressure on Morwan's throat. And the pilot's code? Ramila. Nashta smiled. Was that so hard? She lowered her hand and turned to Han and Leia. I trust we won't meet again. I suspect it would be more pleasant for me than you. That's it? Han asked. 
You're just going? Nashta thought for a moment, then raised her brow as though remembering something. Ah, the problem with your son. She pulled a data chip from her utility belt and passed it to Han. Contact instructions. Leave a message when you're ready. She started through the exit, then stopped and looked back, smiling. I hope you will contact me. I'm looking forward to working with you on that. Not going to happen, Leia said, snatching the chip from Han. Jason is our son. And Tenel Ka was your friend, Nashta countered. Yet here you are. She disappeared out the exit, leaving Han and Leia to stand there fuming. Han caught Leia's eye, then glanced after Nashta, silently asking if they should try to take the assassin out now. Leia gave a quick shake of her head. With him already injured, Han knew their odds were poor. Besides, there was a good chance that Tenel Ka and her security team, not to mention the Star Destroyers, would stop Nashta on their own. What they would not be able to do, however, was find out who was on Morwan's mysterious council. Leia slipped a hand under Han's arm. Come on, flyboy. We'd better get you back to the Falcon and take a look at that blaster burn. She turned him toward the opposite side of the cantina and started away, then suddenly stopped and looked back over her shoulder as though she had just remembered something. Forgive my rudeness, Lady Morwan. Can we give you a lift somewhere? Please. Morwan started after them, not even attempting to hide her relief. I was afraid you'd never ask. Chapter 15 After a hasty departure from Telker Station, the Falcon emerged from her first hyperspace jump in a pocket of real space listed on the charts as Knot Holes. As far as Leia could tell, the name was a reference to the dozens of narrow hyperspace lanes that punched through the black depths of transitory mists, creating a torn curtain tableau of jagged, star-filled shapes. Han, who was seated in the co-pilot seat while Leia did the flying, pointed toward a crescent of stars hanging on the starboard side of the viewport. That way. Han was sweating with pain and unable to move his wounded shoulder. But he refused to go back to the medical bay until they were a safe distance away from Telker Station. He glanced back toward Lady Morwan, who was sitting behind Leia at the navigator station, then added, We're heading back to the interior? Correct. Morwan replied. Her voice grew a little louder as she addressed the rest of her reply to the back of Leia's head. I hope that won't be an inconvenience, Princess. Not at all. Leia turned the yoke in the direction Han had indicated and caught him watching the S-thread display, no doubt checking signal strength. Once they figured out whom Lady Morwan was working for, they would need to access the holonet and pass the intelligence on as quickly as possible. We're entirely at your service— We've been operating on our own initiative since the first assassination attempt failed. Assassination. Morwan's voice held a definite tone of remorse as she repeated the word. Depose sounds so much better, but I suppose assassination is more honest, isn't it? If the Council didn't want the Queen Mother killed, it wouldn't have hired Aura Singh. The name made Leia lift her brow. She knew from historical records that Aura Singh had been a ruthless killer of Jedi Knights during the Old Republic. Before she could ask if that was Nashta's real name, Han twisted around to look squarely at Morwan. Don't tell me you're growing a conscience all of a sudden. I'm as dedicated to the Consortium's independence as you are to Corellia's. Morwan's voice had grown just cold enough to show her displeasure at being questioned by a man. That doesn't mean I relish the deaths of the Queen Mother and the Chunda. Of course not, Leia said. 
she glanced at Morwan's reflection in the canopy, wondering the same thing she knew Han was. Were Morwan's misgivings strong enough to make her change sides and simply reveal the identity of the coup organizers? Decisions like these are never easy. Perhaps I can be of some assistance, C-3PO offered. If you're talking about the woman who accompanied us on our escape from Fountain Palace, I have some data suggesting she couldn't possibly be Aura Singh. Just because she said her name was Nashta doesn't mean it was, Han said. If that's your data, forget it. I'm well acquainted with the use of aliases, Captain Solo, C-3PO replied. Why, I have an entire sector of memory dedicated to the identities you and Princess Leia have assumed. We're more interested in Aura Singh, Leia said. If Lady Morwan says she was, I'm inclined to believe her. I'm afraid Lady Morwan must be mistaken, C-3PO said. According to the records Master Skywalker found aboard the Chuunthor, Aura Singh was a nine-year-old Jedi trainee who was captured by pirates more than seventy-five standard years ago. She seems to have felt rather betrayed by the Jedi Order's failure to rescue her, because she returned years later as a bounty hunter who specialized in hunting and killing Jedi. She was finally captured by Jedi Ayla Sakura, then imprisoned in the penal colony on Oovo 4. There is no record of her release. Maybe that's because there are no records from Oovo 4, Han replied. When the Yuzhan Vong leveled the place, they were incinerated along with the guards, the confinement domes, and probably most of the prisoners. Perhaps, C-3PO replied. But the warden was an excellent administrator. He maintained an off-world backup. 3PO, Han's trying to say there wouldn't be a release record, Leia explained. The crescent of stars that Han had pointed out was in the center of the canopy now, shining through the black curtain of the transitory mists like a tipped smile. If Aura Singh escaped during the attack, there would have been no one left to report it. C-3PO fell silent for a moment, then said, Oh, I hadn't considered that. I am curious about how you chose Aura, Leia said. She's hardly a well-known killer of Jedi anymore. And even if she was, this isn't the kind of job you'd look up an eighty-year-old woman for, Han pointed out. Actually, she found me, Morwan explained. When the Heritage Council assigned me to find someone capable of removing the Queen Mother from her throne, I began by assembling a history of known Jedi deaths— when I came across the story of Aura Singh, I decided to research her as well, hoping to learn something that would help me choose my assassin wisely. I must have tripped an alarm gate, she continued. Singh showed up a couple of weeks later, demanding to know why I was investigating her. After that, it was hire or die. Sounds like you didn't have much choice, Han said sympathetically. I hope that doesn't mean you're having second thoughts now. I'm not. Morwan's tone grew defensive. But I don't see why you were so concerned about my feelings, Captain Solo. I'm not even a member of the Council. The coup will go on, no matter how I feel. Okay, don't get all touchy on me. Han turned forward again, grunting as the motion aggravated his wound. I'm just trying to figure out who set us up at the palace, that's all. It wasn't me. Morwan stood and stepped between the pilot's and co-pilot seats, then gently slipped a hand under Han's injured arm. Time for you to go to Medbay. Not yet. Han tried to pull his arm free, but managed only to cause himself so much pain that he gasped. Not until we're in the interior. By the time we reach the interior, you may have an infection, Morwan said. Clearly unaccustomed to hearing no from a mere man, she continued to pull, slowly drawing Han to his feet. 
and the way your arm won't move isn't good. The blaster wound may have fused— Are you insane? This last remark Morwan screeched as the barrel of Han's blaster suddenly appeared beneath her nose. No means no, Han warned. Didn't your mother teach you that? Morwan released his arm, but refused to back down. You aren't that tough, Captain Solo. When the numb spray wears off, you'll be screaming in pain. Probably, Leia said, and he'll be sitting right there doing it. I've met Rontos who aren't as stubborn. Morwan turned to Leia, her mouth agape in surprise. And you put up with that? I have a shock collar, Leia replied, but it just makes him drool. Morwan's brow shot up in alarm. Be careful. Turning it up that high may affect his performance. She finally seemed to realize Leia was joking and let the sentence trail off. Please forgive me. It's sometimes hard to remember that the rest of the galaxy has a more tolerant view of men. Sometimes I find it hard to believe myself. Scowling at Han's blaster, Leia assumed the high-pitched voice a mother might use with a child. Han, dear, why don't you put that nasty blaster away? Maybe C-3PO will take the lady back to the med bay and help her find some back to salve and bandages. And then you can stay in the cockpit with the grown-ups. All right. You don't have to go all sarcastic on me. Han holstered his blaster, then dropped back into the co-pilot seat and winced. I was just trying to make a point. You've succeeded beyond your wildest dreams, Captain Solo, Morwan said. Next time, please feel free to yell. She turned away and followed C-3PO down the access corridor. Once the protocol droid's metallic steps had died away... Han leaned closer to Leia and spoke in a soft voice. Once we know who she's working for, we need to access the holonet and see that our intelligence reaches Tenelka. Leia finished, I know. Good. Because we might not have much time. Leia finished again, I know, Han. Maybe you should activate the medbay monitoring cam. Han lowered his brow. Not yet. No one's sticking me in med bay until we've handled— It's not you I want to watch, Leia said. What if Lady Morwan isn't using her real name? Oh, yeah. Han settled back into the co-pilot's chair and activated the med bay cam. I guess a picture could be kind of useful. Kind of, she said in a wry voice. Given even a moderately clear image— Leia felt certain that the Hapen Intelligence Service, one of the finest in the galaxy, would be able to identify Morwan and her superiors. Han brought the medbay feed up on his display. Great. Three P.O.'s blocking the angle. Leia glanced over to find the golden droid standing in front of Morwan, his head canted sideways as he pointed to a drawer. On the bunk was a tray where she was gathering supplies— be patient, Leia said. She'll lean into view when she opens the salve drawer. Han grunted an acknowledgment and slumped back in his seat, looking more exhausted and discouraged than he had in years. It was as though all the struggle and loss they had endured through four decades of service to the galaxy had finally grown too heavy for even Han Solo to bear. Leia reached over and touched his arm. How are you doing? Don't worry about me. He nodded at the crescent of stars outside the canopy. It was growing larger and more distinct by the moment, the black edges of the transitory mists seeming to pull away more quickly as the falcon drew nearer. I just need to hold on another ten minutes. Once we're in the mouth of that passage, we'll have a good signal. I'm not talking about your shoulder, Han. I mean, how are you doing? With Nashta, or rather Aura Singh, a constant presence since the failed assassination attempt, 
This was the first chance they'd had to talk over their decision to protect Tenelka, and Leia wanted to be sure Han realized what it would mean for Corellia. No matter how you look at it, we're working against Corellia's interests here. I can sense how that troubles you. Han frowned, and Leia thought he was about to object for the thousandth time to having his mind read by his own wife. Instead, he let out a weary sigh and dropped his chin in frustration. It's not what we're doing that bothers me, he said. It's Gedjin. I hate being played. Leia nodded sympathetically. Me too. But this is bigger than our feelings. If we're doing this just because Gedjin played us, we're doing it for the wrong reasons. I'm sure he felt he had no other choice. Corellia is in a desperate situation. Desperate doesn't matter, Han said. He turned to face her. When you let me talk you into this, way back when we still had a life on Coruscant, Corellia was supposed to be in the right. We agreed Corellia was entitled to her independence, Leia said cautiously. But she had to declare herself totally independent. She couldn't demand the benefits of Alliance membership without obeying Alliance law. Right, Han said, barely paying attention. But Thraken was playing games from the start, building secret fleets and trying to reactivate Centerpoint. And now Gedjin used us to try to expand the war. What are you saying, Han? Leia studied his pupils, looking for dilation or disparate size or some other sign that he needed another stim shot to keep him out of shock. That we should go back to the Alliance? Han looked at her as though she had just asked him to step through an airlock naked. And help Omas choke the last dregs of independence out of the galaxy? His face grew angry. No way. He doesn't get to use Corellia as an excuse for that. Okay. So what do you want to do? Han shrugged the one shoulder he could still move. I think we're doing it, Leia. You're sure? Leia already knew the answer. Han was never unsure about anything. But she wanted to hear him say it. You know that keeping the consortium out of the war might be the difference between survival and defeat for Corellia. A defiant light came to Han's eye. Don't underestimate Wedge. Neothel hasn't seen Tricky until— I'm not saying Corellia doesn't have a chance, Han, Leia interrupted. Just that it's a small one, and we're about to make it smaller. Yeah, but what choice do we have? Let Gedjin arrange the assassination of Tenel Ka and a four-year-old kid? Han shook his head sharply. I don't want Corellia to win her freedom that way. If she can't do it without dragging hapes and the rest of the galaxy into a big civil war, she shouldn't do it at all. I guess you are, sure, Leia said. You aren't? Oh, I'm sure, Leia said. I'm fine with this. Han looked confused. Then why are we talking it to death? He turned back to his display and remained silent a moment, then spoke in a sad voice. I just wish somebody in this galaxy could be trusted. Somebody can. Leia smiled. I'm sitting next to him. A look of mild surprise flashed across Han's face, but he continued to watch his display and pretended not to hear. Even after all he had done to help overthrow the Emperor and win the war against the Yuzhan Vong, he still refused to think of himself as one of the good guys. In his mind, Leia suspected, good guy was just too close to sucker. On the display, Morwan finally leaned out from behind C-3PO, presenting a clear profile as she reached for the salve drawer. Han captured the image, then another of her full face as she turned to ask 3PO a question. The droid pointed at another drawer, and from this one, Morwan pulled a sonic scalpel. Han sat up straight. What's that for? 
probably to cut away dead tissue, Leia said. Up here? You aren't giving her much choice, Leia said. I wouldn't worry about it. From what I've seen so far, she knows her combat medicine. Great, Han said. She'll know right where to cut when she slits my throat. Leia lowered her chin, giving him a don't-be-ridiculous look. With a Jedi and two Nogri aboard? Han considered this a moment, then said, She's still not getting near me with that scalpel. You know how she feels about men. It has to be done, or you could develop a necrotic infection, Leia said. I'm pretty sure you can trust Lady Morwan. But you can always ask 3PO to do it instead. Thanks, Han grumbled. I'd rather kiss a hut. No, you wouldn't, Leia replied quickly. Take it from me. On Han's display, Morwan finally picked up the supply tray and started forward again. Han saved the images he had captured, then deactivated the monitoring cam and replaced the image on his display with a drive nacelle temperature readout. Once he had finished, Han leaned toward Leia again. You know, maybe you're right about trusting Morwan, he said quietly. She's not exactly happy about killing Tenelka and Alana. Maybe we could convince her— Not going to happen, Leia said, cutting him off. She's a true believer in consortium independence. She may regret the necessities of the coup, but we'll never talk her into betraying the ringleaders. Han dropped back into his chair, exhaling in frustration. So we're back to doing this the hard way. I'm afraid so. Leia said. We keep playing spies. C-3PO's metallic steps rang up the access corridor, punctuating the sharp tones of Morwan's indignant voice. I'm a field surgeon by training, 3PO, she was saying. I think I can remember how to use an irrigation bulb. I'm certain you can, C-3PO replied. It's really quite simple— as long as you use the proper antibiotic. I know, 3PO, Morwan said. Does the Alliance program all its male pattern droids to be as condescending as you are? I'm afraid your question is based on an erroneous assumption, Lady Morwan. I don't even have a condescension module. C-3PO paused a moment, then added, But please don't feel bad about it. Most female humans make the same mistake. Morwan's only reply was a groan of exasperation. A moment later, she led C-3PO onto the flight deck. I don't know how you live in a gender-equal society, Princess Leia, she said. Even your droids have insufferable egos. You get used to it. Leia nonchalantly turned her gaze forward again. Their destination now filled most of the canopy— with a frame of dark mist swirling around the edges of the Star Crescent. Did I hear you telling 3PO you're a field surgeon? Was, Morwan corrected. I, um, moved on after the Koribu escapade. Leia's brow rose. You were at Koribu? The Battle of Koribu had been short but vicious— the result of a misunderstanding during the Dark Nest Crisis between a Hapen commander and his Chiss counterpart. Aboard the Kendall? Morwan hesitated before answering, just long enough to suggest that she realized she had given away more information about herself than was probably wise. As a matter of fact, I did serve aboard the Kendall, she finally said. How did you know? I recognized you— from when we transported the Killix, Leia lied. The truth was that she had just tossed out the name of the Hapen flagship, hoping to trick Morwan into revealing the name of the vessel she'd served on. So you served with Ailson Gray? I wouldn't say with. The pitch of Morwan's voice was just a touch higher than normal, but it was enough to confirm the ripple of anxiety that Leia felt through the Force. I wasn't part of the command staff. Lady Morwan, didn't anyone ever tell you it's impossible to lie to a Jedi? 
Leia caught Han's gaze in the canopy reflection and held it, making sure he understood the significance of the question. Hapen officers tended to draw their command staffs from their own houses, so chances were good that they had just identified the coup ringleader. But don't worry. Your Dutch's secret is safe with us. Yeah, Han said. Who are we going to tell? Chapter 16 Luke woke with the same troubled spirit he did every time he dreamed of the face, his chest heavy with the weight of a duty unanswered, his stomach churning with premonitions of failure. The face always came to him half-hidden beneath a raised hood, betraying only a hint of its appearance. A mouth frozen into a lopsided grimace of anguish, a jagged brow fixed in a permanent scowl of disapproval, a pair of ebony eyes shining with perpetual malice. He never saw enough of the face to know whether it was the same one each time, but the emotions always came in order. Pain, condemnation, spite. Luke had no idea what the pattern meant, but he felt sure it was a storm warning. A beckoning whistle sounded from the far side of the Jade Shadow's elegant master cabin, where R2-D2 stood in the hatchway, rocking back and forth on his support arms. Luke allowed himself the fantasy of using the Force to push the little droid back into the corridor and closing his eyes again. Since learning of Lumia's involvement with G.A.G., he had been so worried about Ben that he had barely been able to sleep, and even when he did, he was so troubled by dreams that he never woke feeling refreshed. R2-D2 let out an impatient bleat, then extended his charging arm and started across the floor. All right, no need for the Ronto prod. Luke swung his feet around and sat on the edge of the bunk. I'm awake. R2-D2 issued a doubtful whistle, but stopped and retracted the charging arm as Luke pulled on his boots. The steady thrumming in the deck suggested that the shadow had emerged from hyperspace and was decelerating hard, presumably on its final approach to the planet Hapes. Luke could sense Mara's impatience through their force bond, though not the cause. Perhaps she was having a hard time securing approach clearance from the Hapen Defense Forces, or perhaps she was simply eager to get Ben away from any influence Lumia might be exerting over Jason and G.A.G. Once his boots were fastened, Luke grabbed his robe and started forward through the observation salon. The cratered faces of two silver moons were sliding past outside the shadow's starboard viewport. Outside the other, the ion tails of half a dozen starships were crawling across the star-flecked velvet. In the distance hung a white motionless disk, no doubt one of the battle dragons that would be screening Hapes after the attempt on Tenelka's life. Luke continued forward onto the flight deck, where the cloud-modeled disk of the planet itself hung dead ahead. Its sparkling oceans and forested islands were as beautiful as ever. But Luke was more interested in the thumb-sized wedge slowly drifting toward the center of the canopy. Instead of the customary white, the Star Destroyer's hull was matte black, with the telltale dome of a gravity well generator bulging beneath its belly and a cloaking cone rising midway down its spine. It was the first time Luke had seen the new G.A.G. Star Destroyer. He didn't much like it, and he really didn't like that it had been named the Anakin Solo, after his dead nephew. A canopy section opaqued into a mirror, and Mara's face appeared in the reflection, looking focused and worried. The shadow had a drop-deck helm, with the pilot seated down in the nose of the cockpit, so she had to tilt her head slightly upward to meet his gaze. We just received a very interesting holler recording, she said. From Jason? Mara shook her head. From Han. We laid over the hollow net from the Jedi Temple. Really? Luke lifted his brow. Before leaving the Jedi Temple, they had been briefed on the Solo's participation in the assassination attempt, explaining how they're being impersonated by clones and weren't even on hapes when someone tried to kill Tenel Ka, because that's the only thing that makes sense. Not exactly, 
Mara said. And it only gets more confusing. Han and Leia are spying on the coup plotters. Spying? Luke frowned, trying to work out the course of events that would lead the Solos from Corellia to the assassination attempt to becoming spies for the Galactic Alliance. You're right, it is confusing. But whatever Han and Leia do usually is. What was in the message? They've learned the identity of one of the ringleaders, Mara said. Han wants us to pass the information to Tenel Ka as soon as possible. Luke looked out the front of the canopy, where the Anakin's silhouette now hung dead ahead of the shadow. Then why are we heading for the Anakin? I tried to relay the message to Tenel Ka. My signal was routed to Princess Holder. He suggested I try again after we were aboard the Anakin. The Anakin. Luke closed his eyes and expanded his force awareness toward the Star Destroyer. It did not take long to find the familiar, level-headed presence of Tenel Ka. What's she doing there? Protecting Alana, I'm sure. I doubt she needed Han to tell her there was a traitor on her staff, or that her daughter is just as much a target as she is. So she turns to Jason, Luke said. He was struck, as he so often was, by how lonely and sad Tenel Ka's life had become, how much she was sacrificing to ensure a stable and humane government for her father's people. I guess that makes sense. Mara nodded. When you can't trust your new friends, you go to your old ones. She fell silent a moment, then added, Especially if one of them happens to be a very close friend. Luke raised his brow. You think Jason and Tenel Ka are lovers? He sneaks off to see someone every few months, Mara said. Tenel Ka? Luke frowned, trying to imagine Tenel Ka having secret trysts with someone as dangerous to her throne as Jason, then shook his head. If she weren't the Queen Mother, maybe. But there's no future in it. And you think that would stop them? Maybe not Jason, Luke said. But a Jedi lover would cause too many problems for Tenel Ka. She wouldn't take such a foolish risk, no matter how she felt about him. Mara's expression remained doubtful. Tenel Ka has to have something for herself. She's giving everything else to the consortium. Okay, it's possible, Luke said. He did not understand why he found the idea so alarming. Was it merely because of his fears concerning Jason, or did his misgivings go deeper than that? Perhaps it made him fear that Lumia's corruption was spreading faster than he could contain it. And that's all the more reason we shouldn't speculate. We could be putting Tenel Ka's life at risk. All right, Mara said, taking the point. But aren't you even a little curious about Alana? Of course, Luke admitted. But Jason can't be the father. The timing is just wrong. Mara put on a pout that looked completely out of place on her strong face. Spoil sport? I'm just saying that it's impossible. Suddenly Luke felt the need to spell out his reasoning, perhaps because now Mara had him wondering about Alana's paternity. For six months after the Battle of Koribu, Jason was confined to the Academy on Asus, along with the rest of the Jedi Knights involved, and that's when Alana had to have been conceived. If Jason had been slipping off to visit Tenel Ka, we would have known. Mara let out an exaggerated sigh of disappointment. Killjoy? Okay, okay. Realizing that Mara was teasing him now, Luke smiled and raised his hands. I surrender. I'm sure we can think of another explanation. We know he visited Tenel Ka when he asked for the fleet she sent to Koribu. Maybe Alana's gestation took a whole year. Mara winced in empathic discomfort. Now you're just being cruel. She flicked her gaze toward the reflection of the co-pilot's chair. Take a seat. You look like you've been wrestling rancors in your sleep. I wish. Luke slipped into the co-pilot's seat behind her. It was the face again. 
Mara's expression grew serious. Jason? Luke shrugged. Maybe. I never see it clearly enough. Then you can't be sure. It was male, Luke replied. He could feel through the force how worried Mara was about Ben, how alarmed she was by the relationship they had discovered between G.A.G. -G. and Lumia. So he did not understand why she still refused to see what was happening to Jason. Who else could it be? That's the point, Luke, Mara said. We don't know. So far the only connection we have between Jason and Lumia is some evidence suggesting she's been working with G.A.G. And you don't find that alarming? Like a gun dark in a petting zoo, Mara replied. She turned her gaze back to the Anakin Solo, which was steadily growing in the center of the canopy. But there's a big difference between suspicion and fact. What if Lumia wasn't working for G.A.G.? What if someone in G.A.G. is working for her? You think she subverted one of Jason's subordinates? I think we need to be open to the possibility. Mara corrected. You don't like what Jason's doing with G.A.G., so you're predisposed to assume the worst. All I'm saying is we can't let emotion color our judgment. Luke fell silent a moment, then let out a long breath. You're right. Maybe I'm assuming the worst because I don't like Jason's methods. But your advice is good for both of us, you know. I think you blind yourself to what's happening with Jason because he's the one who convinced Ben not to hide from the Force. Mara nodded. Guilty as charged, she said, keeping her eyes forward. That's why we have to work together on this, Skywalker. We need to keep each other honest. And if we don't like what we find, we're going to need each other more than ever. Her tone made Luke frown. What are you saying? You know what I mean, Skywalker, she replied. If you're right, if Jason has been making a fool of me, he won't be easy to handle. It'll take both of us. Luke raised his brow, surprised by the ice in Mara's voice. What about that sense of certainty you experienced back at the sparring arena? You said we had to let Ben follow his own path that you thought the Force had drawn him to Jason for a reason. I still think that, Mara said. But we have a path to follow, too. Maybe this is where all our paths converge, where Ben's path finally joins ours. Only Ben's? Luke asked. He was beginning to sense some of the old ruthlessness in Mara, some of her old assassin instinct, and it scared him. What about Jason? If I'm wrong, Jason won't have a path, Mara said. We'll have to end it. Now I think you're the one who's assuming the worst, he said. I'm worried about Jason, but I'm not ready to kill him. Then you're not being realistic, Mara said. If he is working with Lumia, we won't have a choice— I won't let him take Ben down that path with him. Of course not. But whatever Jason has become, it's due to what happened after he was captured by the Yuzhan Vong. And I'm the one who sent him on that mission. Luke paused, still struggling with the decision that had cost the life of his nephew Anakin and so many other young Jedi Knights, still wondering what else he could have done to save the Jedi. I won't give up on Jason just because he's lost his way. If he has fallen under Lumia's sway, I'm going to bring him back under mine. Mara's gaze strayed back to Luke's reflection in the mirrored panel. Why doesn't that surprise me? Luke flashed an innocent smile. Because you're used to me doing the impossible? Mara sighed. Something like that. She looked back to the Anakin, which was now an arm-length wedge silhouetted against the sparkling waters of a Hapen ocean. But you'd better not be intending to redeem Lumia, too. I draw the line at ex-girlfriends. Don't worry, Luke said. Even I'm not that naive. Lumia is going down. 
the comm channel squawked as a traffic controller issued approach clearance for the shadow. For the next few minutes, as the dark mass of the Anakin continued to swell in the canopy, they were kept busy making course corrections and providing identity verifications. A pair of XJ-5 chase X's flew by to confirm their identities visually, then irritated Mara by looping around to fall into the kill zone directly behind the shadow. Finally, when the shadow had drawn so close they could see nothing ahead except the dark tiers of the Star Destroyer's blocky superstructure, the traffic controller gave them clearance to berth in the command hangar. Mara dropped beneath the sky of black durasteel that was the Anakin's belly, then angled aft to a small launching bay defended by two quad-cannon laser turrets. She used the attitude thrusters to rise through the barrier shield into the hangar, where a set of beacon lights led her to the designated berth. No sooner had the shadow set down than an honor guard of twenty GAG troopers emerged from an access hatch. They arrayed themselves in two columns and came to attention facing each other, and a moment later Jason appeared and strode down the aisle between them. A black cape billowed from the shoulders of his black colonel's uniform. Oh, boy, Mara said, unbuckling her crash webbing. Does he know who he looks like? He does if he bothered to look in a mirror. Luke was disappointed to see that their son was not accompanying Jason, but hardly surprised. He had not felt Ben's presence when he reached out to see if Tenel Ka was aboard the Anakin. I just hope that's not the point. He might as well be a recruiting hollow for Corellian terrorists. As they shut down the shadow, Luke expanded his force awareness to the entire Star Destroyer, searching for any hint that Lumia was aboard. He felt a second presence near Tenel Ka's that seemed very strong in the force. Her daughter Alana, he suspected, but nothing dark enough to be Lumia. Of course, that didn't mean much. Jason was standing right there in front of him, and Luke couldn't sense his presence either. Once all systems had been placed on standby, they went aft and found Jason waiting at the bottom of the boarding ramp. His face was gray and furrowed, and the purple circles beneath his eyes suggested that he had not been sleeping well, if at all. He bowed first to Mara, then to Luke. Master Skywalker, welcome aboard the Anakin Solo. Jason's voice sounded genuinely warm, though it was impossible to read his true feelings. What a pleasant surprise. You might want to reserve judgment on that, Mara said. We need to talk. Of course. Jason remained at the foot of the boarding ramp, making no move to allow them any farther aboard. Is something wrong? You'd be safe to assume that, Luke said. Where's Ben? On a mission, Jason replied. He's in a calm blackout zone at the moment. But if it's important, I could dispatch... We'll talk about that later. In private. Luke had to struggle to keep his voice even. With Lumia on the loose, he did not like the thought of Ben being on a mission anywhere. First, we need to speak with the Queen Mother. We have an urgent message for her. Jason's eyes widened with surprise. Tenel Ka? Now, Jason, Luke said. And we'll need a projector. Jason let out his breath. Very well. He stepped aside and led them and R2-D2 up the aisle between the honor guard. I'm sorry for hesitating. But she asked me to keep her presence confidential. Aside from the Chamberlain she brought along... Princess Soldier is the only hapen who knows she's aboard. They passed through a hatchway into a small foyer, where four GAG troopers stood guard over a bank of lift tubes. Most of the tubes had a small sign next to them, listing a destination such as engineering or communications. But at the far end of the foyer, a tube large enough for five people remained unlabeled. It descends to the detention center, Jason explained, apparently noticing what Luke was looking at. We find that prisoners are less likely to resist if they don't realize they've reached the end of the journey. Very practical, Luke said, 
trying not to be alarmed by how proficient his nephew had become at the art of imprisonment and interrogation. I assume it results in fewer injuries to the prisoners. Jason nodded. That, too. A shudder of revulsion ran down Luke's spine. But if Mara was alarmed by Jason's apparent indifference to his prisoner's welfare, she did not show it. She merely followed him across the foyer to a lift labeled Bridge, then stepped into the tube and rose out of sight. Jason turned to Luke. After you. Luke waved R2-D2 into the lift ahead of him, then followed without replying. His stomach sank as the two balls blurred past. A moment later he came to a stop and stepped out into a sparse durasteel anteroom, where another detail of GAG sentries stood guard over several hatchways leading into a maze of blue-white corridors. A single transparasteel wall, the only one without any openings in it, overlooked the flight deck one level below. Most of the officers there still wore the blue and gray uniforms of a normal Galactic Alliance Star Destroyer complement. But Luke could not help noticing the sense of pride and purpose that they radiated into the Force. Whatever Jason's other faults, he was clearly a good leader. Jason stepped out of the lift behind Luke and spoke to an ebony-skinned trooper standing directly across from them. Sergeant Darb. Take an escort detail to the Situation Room and inform the Queen Mother that the Master's Skywalker would like to speak with her. We'll be waiting in the briefing cabin. Very well, Colonel. The sergeant saluted sharply and left to obey. Jason turned away from the flight deck, leading R2-D2 and the Skywalkers down a short corridor into a state-of-the-art briefing cabin with a large holocom unit at one end of a sunken speaking stage. The area was enclosed by a circle of flow-form chairs, each with a panel built into the arm to control individualized comm units, vid displays, and even automatic calf dispensers. Jason went to a chair at the far end of the oval, then turned to face Luke and Mara. I'm afraid it will be a few minutes before Sergeant Darb arrives with the Queen Mother. After the attempt on her life, I'm insisting on level five security protocols, even aboard the Anakin. It certainly won't hurt anything, Mara said, though from what I've sensed so far, your crew seems exceptionally focused and alert, almost fanatic. It's hard to imagine an assassin remaining undetected long enough to defeat security. Thank you. Coming from you, Aunt Mara, I take that as quite a compliment. He sat down and motioned the Skywalkers toward a pair of nearby seats. There's a beverage menu in the arm display if you'd like something to drink. Luke remained standing. Thanks, but we're not thirsty. I see. Jason's expression turned from pleasant to disappointed, and he shifted to the edge of his seat. Then why don't we get whatever is bothering you out in the open? I know you disapprove of my methods, but the hostility I sense runs deeper than that, and it pains me. You and Ben are the only family I have left. That's hardly true, Mara objected. What about Jaina and your parents? You know how strained my relationship with Jaina has been, Jason said. I'm afraid her insubordination at Corellia finally snapped it. We're not speaking, and I suspect things are going to stay that way. Maybe things would be different if you hadn't brought her up on charges, Luke pointed out. What should I have done? Look the other way because she's my sister? Jason's voice was cracking, but his expression remained confident and his gaze steady. The Galactic Alliance can't survive if her leaders keep playing favorites. That kind of thing is why Corellia thinks she doesn't have to live by the same laws as the rest of the Alliance. The rules apply to everyone, or to no one. Luke did not need the Force to sense the conviction behind his nephew's words. It was pouring off Jason like heat from a star, bathing everyone near him in its glow, no doubt burning those who came too close. What about your parents? Mara asked. 
Are you turning your back on them because they don't share your beliefs? Not at all. I'm turning my back on them because they tried to assassinate the ruler of an Alliance member state. Someone who's always been a friend to them. Jason stood. My parents are terrorist scum. And that is why I have turned my back on them. The fire in Jason's eyes was as anguished as it was intense, and Luke finally began to understand just how alone his nephew really was. He had lost his younger brother during the last Pangalactic War and renounced his sister and parents in an attempt to prevent another one, and in his unwavering battle against the evil he saw threatening the galaxy, he was clearly ready to surrender his relationship with his aunt and uncle as well. Like the Yuzhan Vong who had once held him captive, Jason had become capable of any sacrifice, and just as intolerant of those who did not share his commitment. Jason Solo had fallen not because he was selfish, Luke realized, but because he was selfless. Jason, I know your parents' actions are confusing, Mara said, but you need to trust your— Let Jason judge his parents for himself, Luke interrupted. Their only hope of bringing Jason back was to shock him, to let him discover for himself just how wrong he was. At the moment, I'm more interested in where Ben is. He's aboard a reconnaissance skiff, Jason replied. I'd offer to holocom him for you, but they're in the transitory mists. What's Ben doing in the transitory mists? Mara demanded. Looking for Jaina and Zek, Jason answered. They went to Terrafon to deliver a message for Tenel Ka and haven't returned yet. I sent the reconnaissance skiff to investigate, and Ben went along to see if he could help find them through the force. Mara's voice grew sharp. Alone? Of course not. As I told you, he's aboard a reconnaissance skiff with an excellent crew. A concerned frown came to Jason's face. What's wrong? Didn't I warn you that Lumia had returned? Luke's tone was just as sharp as Mara's. That I was worried she would come at me through him? Yes, Jason said. But that was back on Coruscant. I don't think there's any reason to worry out here. Why not? Mara demanded. Because you're sure Lumia isn't interested in him? Jason's frown turned indignant. How would I know that? Jason, we found Lumia's apartment, Luke said. We know she's been working for GAG. Jason's eyes widened. It was not an unreasonable reaction, given the subject matter— but Luke still wished his nephew wasn't so good at hiding his feelings in the Force. You might think you've been using her for your own ends, Luke continued, but you're fooling yourself. Lumia always has an agenda of working with G.A.G. How? Jason interrupted. I certainly haven't seen her in uniform. Don't insult us by denying it, Mara said. She was living in a G.A.G. safe house, and she had been accessing G.A.G. files on the True Victory Party. Then she's the one who's been assassinating the Bothans? Jason asked. Why? What could she stand to gain by spreading the war? You won't get out of this by changing the subject, Luke said. It was impossible to say whether Jason's surprise was genuine or feigned, so Luke assumed it was feigned. We know she came with you. She left her apartment the same day the Anakin left Coruscant. You think she followed us? Jason dropped into his chair and punched a button. The Anakin needs to remain here in support of Queen Mother Tenel Ka. But I'll take a skiff personally. We'll be handling that ourselves, Mara said. Ben will be returning to Coruscant with us after this is finished. Do you think that's wise? The calm light on the arm of Jason's chair blinked on, but he ignored it and continued to speak to Mara. It will only interrupt Ben's training, 
and if Lumia is trying to get at him, she'll have an easier time stalking him on Coruscant. Ben is done with G.A.G., Luke said. I don't understand yet why Lumia is involved with G.A.G., but I do know she is. My decision is final. Jason's face fell. Very well. He deactivated the comm unit, then composed himself and continued. There's a refueling depot at Roku, just outside the mists. You can rendezvous with him there. Thank you, Mara said. Jason nodded absent-mindedly, then said, I hope you'll at least share the details of your investigation. If someone in my command is using Lumia as an agent, I need to know. Of course. Tresina Lobi had been trying to track Lumia down for some time. Luke was giving a slightly altered version of events, in part because he wanted to learn how much Jason did know about Lumia's relationship with G.A.G. Apparently she succeeded, because we found her body in Fellowship Plaza the morning you left for Hapes. Fellowship Plaza? This time Jason's shock was real. Luke felt it through the force. Master Lobi is dead? That's right, Mara said. Though her answer was casual, Luke could sense through their force bond how closely she was studying Jason. She had already calmed the temple with the address of Lumia's apartment. Mara's account of events was even less accurate than Luke's, and far more distracting to Jason who barely managed to reply with a murmured, how unfortunate. Luke was trying to decide how best to proceed, how best to keep Jason off guard so they could continue pressuring him, when the cabin door hissed open. Tenel Ka entered, wearing an Electrotex flight suit tailored tightly enough to suggest that her physical training remained as intense as ever. She crossed to Luke and Mara her radiant smile at odds with the aura of tension and worry that hung about her in the force. Master Skywalker, thank you for coming. She embraced Luke, then did the same with Mara. You are unexpected, but very welcome. We can use all the help we can find. Thank you, Your Majesty, Luke said. Unfortunately, we're here on a different matter. But we do have a message that I'm sure will prove very useful, Mara added. I hope it includes word of when the Alliance reinforcements will arrive. The woman who said this was still in the cabin doorway, trailing half a dozen steps behind Tenel Ka. She was tall and pretentious-looking, with a long nose and a mouth turned permanently downward at the corners. After lending so many of our fleets to the Galactic Alliance, our enemies have us at a terrible disadvantage. Tenel Ka's face reddened, but she turned and politely motioned at the woman. Masters Skywalker, allow me to present my chamberlain, Lady Galni, younger sister to the Dutcha Galni of Terrafon. Luke noted that the name was the same as the planet to which Ben had been sent but merely bowed to Galni and did not remark on the coincidence. Chief Omas and Admiral Neothel are assembling a sizable defense fleet, he said. It should be able to depart Coruscant in a week. A week, Lady Galni burst out. By then the usurpers will have mined the hyperspace lanes and be attacking Hapes itself. There's no need to worry about the mines, Lady Galni, Mara said. Alliance fleets are well equipped to deal with them. Once the defense fleet is underway, the usurpers won't delay it for long. Of course they won't. Tenel Ka's voice carried more confidence than Luke sensed in her through the force. Is that the message you mentioned? Actually, no, Luke said. That message is for your ears alone. He threw a tactful glance in Lady Galni's direction, but she merely smirked and remained where she was. 
I'm the Queen Mother's highest-ranking advisor. To perform my duties properly, I must hear whatever she hears. Then I'm sure she'll fill you in later. Mara took the woman by the arm and started her toward the door. But our instructions were explicit. Jason rose. In that case, perhaps I'd better go as— No, you stay. Luke motioned him back into his chair. You need to see this more than Tenelka does. Jason raised his brow, but returned to his seat. Mara pushed Lady Galni out the door with instructions to Sergeant Darb to have her escorted back to her quarters. I'm sorry about that, Your Majesty, Luke said to Tenelka, but it's possible that someone close to you is a traitor. Tenelka nodded. Yes, I have been having premonitions of that myself, though I don't believe it is Lady Galni. She smiled. I can still sense when someone is lying to me, you know. She is a fool, but she is an honest one. That doesn't mean she can be trusted with your secrets, Mara said, returning to Tenelka's side. Anyone with that much interest in another person's business won't keep it private. I am counting on that. With the Anakin Solo in orbit around Hapes, I need someone with me who will report to the rumor mongers that I have not been sleeping with her Jedi commander. Tenelka glanced in Jason's direction and smiled again. Besides, her sister, the Dutch Agalni, is one of my most devoted nobles. It serves my purpose to cultivate the illusion of a special relationship with Lady Galni. Luke snorted in amazement. Your life is a maze, Your Majesty. I don't know how you live it. Because I was well prepared, Master Skywalker, Tenelka said solemnly, and I thank you every day. Luke actually blushed, but he remained composed enough to reply, And you've always made me very proud, Tenelka. Though we are disappointed that we haven't met Alana yet, Mara added sternly. I trust that will change before we depart today? Jason started around the chairs, clearly alarmed. That won't be— Perhaps, Tenelka said. But as Jason was about to say, Alana has been very upset by the assassination attempt, particularly since there was a Jedi involved— it might be best if we put it off until another time. Luke and Mara exchanged baffled glances. Maybe Alana really had been traumatized by the attack, or maybe the rumors of deformity were true. In any case, they had no choice but to accept Tenelka's excuse. I'm sorry to hear that, Luke said. I was looking forward to meeting her. But the message may clarify a few things about Leia's involvement. Mara's voice had just a hint of petulance, as though she felt Tenelka should have known better than to think the Solos would really try to kill her. She used the Force to lower R2-D2 into the speaking area, then said, Play Han's message. R2-D2 acknowledged the order with a chirp, then went over to the holocom unit and inserted his interface arm into a data socket. A rosy blur appeared over the projection pad and quickly resolved itself into an image of Han's face. His skin was pale and waxy with shock, and his mouth was hanging in a lopsided grimace of pain. Luke immediately felt a pang of concern. Mara hadn't warned him that Han was wounded, but when he glanced over at his nephew, Jason's eyes were hard and narrow. Listen up, kid. Han's voice was low and raspy, as though he was trying to avoid being overheard. I don't have long. We've got someone aboard who can't know about this. But I need you to relay this hollow to Tenelka, and only to Tenelka. Someone close to her is a traitor, and it could go bad on us if this message got back to the wrong people. The image changed to the profile of a beautiful hapen woman with long brunette curls and high cheeks. She seemed to be leaning over something, 
Luke thought it might be a bench or table, until he saw her remove a tube of bacta salve from a drawer in the falcon's medbay. Han's voice continued, This is a woman named Morwan, but that might be an alias. She was a flight surgeon aboard the Kendall at the Battle of Koribu. We're fairly sure she's in service to the Algrave family of the Relifon Moons, and she's the contact between the Heritage Council, that's what the nobles behind the coup call themselves, and the assassin who escaped with us. The woman's image changed to full face, and she looked even more striking, with full lips and soft, slanted eyes. Han kept speaking. We heard her tell the assassin to take care of Alana first. The woman's image vanished. Then Han's face reappeared, looking even more distressed than he had a moment earlier. Luke, Tenel Khan needs to take this threat seriously. The assassin's name is Aura Singh. Luke was so shocked that he temporarily shut out Han's voice. He knew Aura Singh's name from records of the old Jedi Order that he had gathered and studied over the years. Thinks she might have been some sort of Jedi about eighty years ago, Han was saying. That's all we know, but there's something else. Keep an eye out for Alima Rar. We bumped into Jag Fell out at Telker Station, and— Han stopped and glanced over his shoulder. Then his voice dropped to a whisper. Gotta go. Tell Tenelkal we're sorry about that mess in the palace. Gijin was using us to set her up, and we didn't know. The hologram vanished, leaving them to stand there in silence. Though Luke was intrigued by the mentions of Alima Rar and Jagged Fell, he didn't give it much thought. He was more interested in his nephew's reaction to what they had just seen. Jason was keeping his Force presence buried and unreadable, but he was scowling at the floor and taking long breaths. Luke resisted the temptation to suggest that it had been wrong to doubt the Solos in the first place. If Jason was going to break the Dark Side's hold, he had to rediscover for himself that a Jedi trusted his feelings as much as his eyes. After a few moments of silence, Tenel Ka said, Thank you for showing us this message. It is certainly easier to believe the Solos were being used than that they were trying to kill me. Jason surprised Luke by nodding. And it explains some of those witness conflicts you mentioned, he said. If my parents were being used by Gedjin, once they realized what was happening, they would have tried to prevent the attack. A warm sense of relief rose inside Luke. Not only was Jason open to the idea that his parents were innocent, he was looking for reasons to believe they were. Luke grew even more confident that he would be able to turn Jason away from the dark side, whatever his nephew's relationship with Lumia. I hate to be a wet blanket, Mara said, but to me, this smells like they're inviting us to a hut's banquet. Luke lowered his brow. What are you saying? He wanted to tell her to stop planting doubts in Jason's mind, but he sensed through their force bond that Mara was only trying to be certain Jason understood his mistake, to be sure that Jason believed in his heart that his parents were not only innocent of aiding the assassination attempt, but incapable of it. That this might be misinformation? I'm saying their message is convenient. Mara addressed her comments to Jason. If they were involved, the message would be a good way to throw off suspicion and feed us misinformation. Jason's eyes widened. I'm surprised to hear you say that, Aunt Mara. There was a note of resentment, perhaps even anger, in his voice. I thought you had a better opinion of my parents than that. Mara's gaze did not waver. I have a very high opinion of Han and Leia, which is why we have to consider the possibility that they're deceiving us. She paused, then with perfect timing turned to Tenel Ka as though she were dismissing Jason's opinion. This is war, 
and the solos are fighting for the other side. We have to be careful. We also have to take into account who they are, Jason said, also turning to Tenelka. You know my parents. They're not murderers. I think we should trust this message. Luke's heart filled with joy. Clearly Jason remained in touch with his emotions, and that meant there was still hope of guiding him back to the light side. After a moment's thought, Tenelka nodded to Jason. So do I. She turned to Mara with an apologetic air. You don't know of the discrepancies in the witness accounts, but there was some question of whom the Solos were fighting during the attack. Their message clears that up. Well, it's your decision. Despite Mara's reply, Luke could sense that she was as happy as he was about the results. I just wanted to be sure you had considered the possibility. And I'm grateful for that. It could not have been easy. Tenelka turned back to Jason. Obviously, this means we both need to cancel the orders regarding your parents. Orders? Luke asked. Capture and detain, Jason explained. He thought for a moment, then shook his head. But we can't. If they're right about a traitor in your court— And that much seems obvious— Tenelka interrupted. Then cancelling the orders would give them away. Mara finished. You have to let the orders stand. Jason nodded. Anything else could be a death sentence. Very well. They've proven quite adept at eluding us so far. Tenelka fell silent for a moment, then said, now we must consider what we do about Algre and her Heritage Council. There's only one thing to do, Jason said. Exactly. Tenelka went to his side. I have no right to ask you to do this. Of course you do, Jason replied. You don't know which of your own fleet commanders you can trust. The Hapes Consortium is a loyal member of the Galactic Alliance, and it's my duty to aid you any way I can. But I'm afraid the Anakin Solo won't be enough. As I recall from the intelligence file, House Algre has a dozen battle dragons of its own. Correct. And I will provide you with a large enough flotilla to assure your victory, Tenelka said. But that isn't what I was talking about. It isn't? No. Tenelka took his hand. I must stay here to command the home fleet. With Aura Singh coming after Alana, however, I want her away from Hapes. Until this is over, she will be safer with you aboard the Anakin. Are you sure? Mara asked, alarmed. Jason may be going into battle. And I will be, Tenelka replied, almost sharply. Algre is not alone on this heritage council. When we move against her, the others will move against me, and Hapes will become a far more dangerous place for Alana than the Anakin. Mara nodded, a bit taken aback by Tenelka's tone. Of course, I didn't mean to question your judgment. Of course you did. Tenelka's tone softened. And I thank you. It is not something I am very accustomed to these days. Besides, Jason will not have much of a battle. He will have twice the fleet and far better weapons. So he is my best option. She paused as though an idea had just occurred to her. Unless you and Master Skywalker will be returning directly to Coruscant. Sorry, Mara said. Alana wouldn't be any safer with us. I'm afraid we have to track down Ben, Luke explained, and then take care of some unfinished business with Lumia. 
Chapter 17 It was not the dark silence of the missile hold that Alima found so troubling, nor even all those cylinders packed with detonite and beradium and propellant. It was the cold. The caves of Ryloth, where she had spent the first years of her life, had been hot and dry and dusty, and the Gorog nest in which she had lived as a Killick joiner had been warm and humid and close but the missile hold of the Anakin Solo was frigid. Even with a pair of bulky G.A.G. utilities pulled over her own customary robes. Her nose was numb, her leku were tingling, her teeth chattering, her old wounds aching, and her breath rose in curtains of steam. Alima, if you don't keep that glow rod on the cut, we're both going to be sorry. Lumia was kneeling in front of a missile rack, using her cybernetic hand to carefully run a fusion cutter down the nose cone welds of a beradium missile. This isn't something I do every day. You are not making us confident. Alima shined the light on the missile just ahead of the fusion cutter's beam. Why not tell Jason to have a trained technician remove the... whatever it is you're after... The proton detonator charge, Lumia said. She was not wearing her face scarf, so her disfigured jaw instilled in Alima a feeling of kinship and togetherness. And Jason can't know about this. We should have guessed. Actually, Alima had already guessed, and she was simply seeking confirmation. Even after she had prevented Master Lobi from exposing what Lumia was doing with Jason, Lumia remained secretive about her goals and plans, almost as though she did not truly understand the nature of her partnership with Alima. But we have told you, Jason is important to the balance. We need him alive. Lumia continued to work, moving down the side of the missile toward the point of the initial cut. Alima counted to five. Then, when she had still received no reply, she moved the light away. The fusion cutter strayed from the weld, causing a shrill hum as it sliced into the skin of the missile cylinder. Crazy bug slut! Lumia snapped off the cutting beam. You could blow the whole ship apart! Alima shrugged. What does it matter? If Jason dies, he does not become a Sith. If Jason does not become a Sith, Leia's suffering is not equal to mine. If Leia's suffering is not equal to mine, the galaxy remains out of balance. You've told me. Lumia reignited the fusion cutter, but continued to hold it away from the missile. I'm doing this to help Jason, not hurt him. Alima continued to shine the glow rod away from the missile. How? Jason asked me to rendezvous with Ben at Roku Depot, Lumia said. He's about to lead a task force to capture one of the coup leaders at the Relophon Moons, and he wants me to make certain Ben rejoins the Anakin safely. Alima frowned. But Ben is aboard a reconnaissance skiff, she said. They can find their way to the Relophon Moons. Exactly. Lumia motioned at the missile. If you don't mind, the Anakin will be making her first jump within the hour, and I need to be gone before then. Alima swung the light back toward the missile, but kept the beam focused on the floor. It sounds suspicious. Lumia sighed in exasperation. It sounds suspicious because it is suspicious. Jason came to me as soon as the Skywalkers ended their little visit. I fear I've become a liability. Alima returned the light to Lumia's work. You think Jason is sending you into a trap? I know he is. He's arranging a fight between me and Luke. Lumia returned the fusion cutter to the weld and resumed work. If I kill Luke, 
It creates an opening for Jason to take over leadership of the Jedi Order. If Luke kills me, then it will look as though I've been stalking Ben all along. Luke will assume that his original fears were correct, and the veil of suspicion will be lifted off Jason. Jason is no better than any Solo. Alima was boiling with outrage. Leia spawned a pack of lilacs. Oh, I think she did better than that, Lumia replied. I'd say Jason is more of a Thernby. Sly, ruthless, and deadly. I couldn't be more proud. She completed the cut, and the nose cone came free. Alima caught it with the force, lest it jar the impact trigger and detonate the proton charge. Proud? Alima carefully lowered the nose cone to the floor. For betraying you? Oh, very proud, Lumia said. I was growing worried that Jason lacked the strength and cunning to fulfill his destiny. His betrayal proves that I was wrong. Jason is very capable. We do not understand. Jason's destiny doesn't allow him the luxury of loyalty, Lumia explained. She deactivated the fusion cutter and set it aside. If he were unwilling to betray me, how could we expect him to betray his entire family? Alima had no answer for that. Even in the real dens of Kalaun, where a dancer's loyalty was strictly to herself, the one person she had never betrayed was her sister Numa. Lumia began to sort through the tangle of wires and filaments surrounding the missile's proton detonator charge. Master Skywalker is not someone to trifle with, Alima said. You could be killed. I'm aware of that. Lumia found a bundle of wires leading into the head of the detonator housing and began to sort through them. I have fought him before, you know. What about Jason's destiny? Alima asked. Without you to guide him, Jason has the knowledge to complete his journey. Lumia separated out an orange wire that ran from the detonator housing into a relay box on the head of the missile cylinder. All that remains for him is to make his sacrifice. Then he hasn't? Not yet. Lumia pulled a pair of wire cutters from the pocket of her utilities and slipped the jaws over the orange wire. But he will. Alima's heart leapt into her throat. Not the safety delay. Lumia looked up. Her brow furrowed in irritation. Orange isn't the safety delay. It's the proximity sensor. It was on Imperial missiles, Alima said. On Alliance missiles, it's the safety delay. There's only one wire. See? Lumia studied the bundle, then reluctantly shifted the wire cutters to the first of a handful of gray wires. Alima breathed a sigh of relief, then asked, how can you be sure? I assume you'd tell me if I was wrong again, Lumia replied sharply. We mean Jason, Alima explained. If he doesn't make his sacrifice, and you are already dead... He will make his sacrifice, Lumia snapped. Now, about these wires... Cut, Alima said. What are you waiting for? Lumia cut the first wire. Then, when the Anakin Solo did not vanish in a white flash, began to cut the other gray wires. We are not sure we like this plan, Alima said. If you are killed, his uncle will try to draw Jason back to the light side of the Force. He won't be able to, Lumia said. Because whether or not I return from this fight, Luke won't. She cut the last of the gray wires, then exchanged her wire cutters for a hydro spanner and began to unbolt the detonator housing. That is what the proton detonator is for? 
Alima asked, finally comprehending Lumia's plan. A combat failsafe? Lumia nodded. As you said, I might be killed. It seems to us you are planning on it, Alima replied. Planning for, not on. Lumia removed the last fastener from the detonator housing. But I will admit that being killed is a more likely outcome than I would prefer. Then why go? Alima asked. Although she would never admit this to Lumia, she did not like the idea of Luke dying so soon. The balance would be better served if he were forced to watch Jason's decline, if he struggled to redeem his nephew before ultimately falling on his blade. Killing Master Skywalker is no good if you don't survive to enjoy it. Lumia set the hydro spanner aside, then looked up at Alima with an expression approaching pity. I'm not doing this for me, you silly dancing girl, she said. But there's no use explaining. You wouldn't understand. She turned her attention back to the missile, grabbing the detonator housing with both hands. Alima, seizing at Lumia's put-down, deactivated the glow rod. There was a metallic click as the housing contacted the proton detonator. Are you mad? Lumia whispered. In the silence that followed her question could be heard the soft, nearly inaudible clicking of an electronic timer counting off second tenths. Turn on the glow rod! We are trying. Alima slapped the glow rod against her crippled arm a couple of times. Assuming the housing had activated one of the impact triggers, they had about five more seconds to deactivate before the safety delay expired and allowed the charge to detonate. But we aren't smart enough to understand. We're just a silly dancing girl. I apologize, Lumia snarled. Now turn on the critting light. Alima tapped the glow rod against her arm again. We're still not sure we understand. All right, Lumia said. Have you ever been part of something bigger and more important than yourself? Our nest. Alima reactivated the glow rod. Lumia quickly removed the detonator housing the rest of the way from the proton charge, then reached out with the force and pulled the trigger plunger away from its contact. Alima continued her answer. Individuals died, but Gorig lived on. Gorig was more important than we were. Exactly. Lumia exhaled slowly, then used the force to levitate the detonator casing while she retrieved the wire cutters and reached inside to snip the rest of the wires. My situation is not so different. Alima frowned. How is it not different? You are the last of... She stopped, suddenly realizing why Lumia might be willing to risk dying before Jason completed his sacrifice. Why Lumia seemed so confident he would, even without her to guide him. There are more, Sith? Lumia floated the housing down to the floor, revealing a head-sized wafer of bright metal with a small tube of liquid deuterium sunk into the center. There is a plan, a plan that will be carried out whether or not I survive. Lumia reached over and followed two wires from the top of the deuterium tube to a small circuit board, then unclipped them both. That's all you need to know. We don't believe you. Alima did not bother moving the glow rod away, since they were no longer at a crucial point in the disarming process. Aren't there only two Sith at a time? Lumia picked up her hydro spanner and began to unbolt the proton charge. Do you really want me to answer that? 
There was a cold edge in Lumia's voice that rocked Alima back on her heels, and she realized she had probably heard too much already. If there really was a secret organization of Sith, and that was the only reason she could think of for Lumia's willingness to sacrifice herself, they were obviously very serious about keeping their existence secret. No, there is no need, Alima said. We have heard enough of your lies for now. An amused twinkle came to Lumia's eyes. That is probably for the best. Lumia removed the proton charge from the missile, then pulled a black combat vest from her tool satchel and slipped the device into a chest pocket. She checked to be sure that the actuation wires would reach from the deuterium tube to a small sensor pad located about where the wearer's heart would be, but did not affix the clips. Very clever, Alima said. You win, even if you lose. It is the Sith way. Lumia scooted her tool satchel down the floor to the next missile on the rack. Bring the light. We're running out of time. We don't understand. Alima began to have a sinking feeling, but she did as Lumia asked and shined the light on the nose cone of the missile. How are you going to wear two proton charges? I'm not. Lumia reignited the fusion cutter, then looked up at Alima. This one is for you. Chapter 18 Ribbons of smoke were still seeping from the hangar mouth and rising into the downpour, but the rest of Villa Solis had obviously burned out long before the rains came. A couple of proton bombs had reduced the site to a smear of rubble and melted stone, leaving only a few ghostly foundation circles to mark where the habitation domes had once stood. To Ben's surprise, he felt only a hint of death in the force. Either the attack had occurred a very long time ago, which seemed unlikely given the fumes still rising from the hangar, or very few people had died in it. The lilting voice of the skiff's pilot and commander, a Duros junior lieutenant named Beta Ioli, came over Ben's headset, which he and the rest of the crew were wearing to muffle the roar of the oversized engines. Something bad happened here, she said. Chief, you picking up anything? Negative, ma'am, Tanogo replied. A Bith chief petty officer, who had been in the Space Navy since before Ben was born, sat three meters back in the rover's cramped cabin, operating the snoop station used to locate and evaluate enemy targets. There aren't any signals originating within three hundred kilometers, but we do have a bogey squadron headed our way from Waro Field. Mytils? Eoli asked. Negative. Looks more like headhunters. Headhunters? Eoli grunted. You're kidding! The planetary militia still uses headhunters, Ben said, quoting the intelligence file Tenel Ka had provided when Jason assigned him the mission. They're probably curious about us. Nobody sends twelve fighters on a look and report, Tanogo repeated. That's an attack squadron. Can't blame them for being cautious, Eoli replied. Somebody did just level their duchess place. Identify us and see if they know what happened. Tanogo acknowledged the order, and a moment later Ben noticed the weapon systems running through a test pattern. Either the skiff's young Twi'lek weapons tech had taken it upon himself to bring up the systems, or, more likely, the seasoned petty officer had quietly suggested it. After the rover had descended to an altitude of two hundred meters, Eoli circled around to the front of the ruins where a cluster of flooded craters sat in what had once been the villa's foreyard. Ben suddenly experienced a sensation of frustration, so faint and muted that he thought at first he might be imagining it. As they swooped over the craters, however, the feeling grew stronger, and he recognized it as a reverberation in the force. They were here, he said. Who? Tanogo demanded over the headset. 
Be precise, son. Sorry, Ben said, Jaina and Zack. Those craters were a big problem for them. I'll say. Tanogo's voice was sarcastic. Getting blasted back to your molecules is always a big problem. Chief? He only brought the skiff's nose up and wheeled around to land. That's his cousin you're talking about. It's okay. Death isn't what I'm sensing, Ben said. As they swung back toward the villa ruins, the feeling of frustration and anger began to grow weaker. Turn back to our old heading, Lieutenant. I think that's the way we need to go. Ioli started to swing the skiff back around. Ma'am, we don't have time for the kids' guessing games, Tanogo said. If we're going to look around, we need to get on the ground now. That squadron is only twenty minutes out, and it just went from bogey to bandit. Why? The squadron leader answered your inquiry about what happened here, Tanogo said. She's saying a pair of Jedi bombed the place. Ioli glanced over at Ben. Her Duro's face remained unreadable, but he could sense her uncertainty through the Force. We need to resume our previous heading, Ben said. Jaina and Zack aren't here. I'd feel them if they were. Even if they're dead? Tanogo's tone was not cruel, just pragmatic. Ma'am, if we can't locate these two Jedi, our orders are to determine what happened to them. And to use Ben as a resource, Eoli said, continuing to bring the skiff's nose around to the heading Ben had requested. Are you going to be the one who tells Colonel Solo we didn't trust his apprentice's instincts? Tanogo fell instantly silent, suddenly pouring uncertainty and worry into the Force. Ben felt both secretly thrilled and vaguely unsettled by the response, thrilled to realize that he had been invested with a certain measure of power simply by being associated with Jason, unsettled to realize that the reaction to this power was fear instead of respect. Once the rover had returned to her original heading, the sensation of frustration and anger grew more discernible in the Force. Ben twisted around in his seat, and looked back at Tanogo's age-flaked face. "'I'm not imagining this, Chief Tanogo,' he said. "'The Force is real.' Tanogo rippled his cheek flaps in what seemed to be amusement. "'It's your call, son. You don't have to explain it to an old space can like me.' "'Okay,' Ben said, still wondering whether he had smoothed things over. Thanks. He turned back around to find a rain-blurred plain of mud and grass sweeping past beneath the skiff. It was impossible to see how far the terrain extended ahead, but Ben knew from the intelligence file that the bog extended for more than three hundred kilometers in every direction, farther than even Jedi could trudge through soft mud in so short a time. He closed his eyes and pictured Jaina's face at the same time focusing his attention on the frustration he felt in the Force. The ripples grew stronger almost instantly, striking him more noticeably from a direction about twenty degrees to their starboard. Without opening his eyes, he pointed. That way. Ioli hesitated for only an instant before swinging the craft in the direction he indicated. The ripples grew even stronger, but now it seemed to Ben that they were coming from about ten degrees to port. He pointed back in that direction. More that way. Tanogo's snort came over the headset, and Ioli hesitated a little longer before correcting their course. Ben tried not to let their doubts trouble him, but the ripples began to grow weaker and more difficult to sense. Back the other way, I think. This time, Ioli did not correct the course at all. Then you're moving us back and forth, she said. If you don't know where they are, we need to go back to the villa. Ben opened his eyes and frowned at Ioli. Trust me, Lieutenant. It's not like I'm seeing a waypoint, but they are out there. Ioli stared at him for a moment, then slowly nodded. 
As you wish, Special Agent Skywalker. They made two more course corrections before the ripples strengthened again. This time Ben extended his force awareness as far as he could in that direction, picturing Jaina in his mind and trying to touch her through the force. Then suddenly she was there in his mind with him, full of surprise and joy and relief and urgency. Something was terribly wrong, and she needed Ben to help her correct it. They're straight ahead. Ben tried to open his eyes. Maybe he did, but Jaina would not release her grip on his mind. All he could see in front of him was her face, looking at once happy and worried and exhausted. I think they might be in trouble. When you say straight ahead, I mean straight ahead. Ben extended his arm toward the image of Jaina in his mind. There. The skiff banked. Hard. I said straight ahead. I see them, Eoli snapped back. But I'm not flying into a hillside, no matter who orders me to. Jaina's image vanished, and a pair of tiny colored blades appeared in the rain at about the same altitude as the rover. They were some fifty meters ahead on Ben's side of the canopy, and slowly sliding starboard as Eoli turned away. Through the heavy weather, it was impossible to see the figures holding the blades, but Ben could feel Jaina's concern as the skiff continued its turn. He reached out to her in the force, trying to reassure her that her lightsaber beacon had been noticed, and then the blades passed out of sight. Ioli's voice came over the headset. Tanogo, how long before those bandits— We've been flying toward him, Lieutenant, Tanogo reported. The interceptors will be in missile range in two minutes, and they'll be on top of us in five— then we're in trouble, Eoli said. No, we're not. Ben unbuckled his crash webbing and stood. Fortunately, the headset was wireless, so he did not have to remove it before starting aft. They're Jedi. Just get us within ten meters. Eoli brought the skiff around so hard that Ben had to force-stick himself to the deck to keep from being flung into the fuselage. She decelerated hard, and began to creep forward on the repulsor drives, at the same time issuing engagement orders to their weapons tech. By the time Ben reached the rear airlock and opened the outer hatch, Eoli had the skiff hovering alongside the hill. For a moment, nothing was visible outside but rain, fog, and mounds of mud and grass. Then one of the mounds suddenly flew off the hillside and landed inside the airlock spraying tear-shaped mud drops across the viewport of the inner hatch. A moment later, the rover rocked noticeably as a second, heavier weight landed inside. They're in, Ben reported. But take it easy. They haven't had time to— Missile range, Tanogo reported. Launch! The skiff tipped its nose up and shot skyward so fast that Ben had to catch a grab handle to keep from tumbling back into the Twi'lek weapons tech. A pair of dull thumps reverberated from inside the airlock, and for a moment he thought Ioli might have lost Jaina or Zek. A moment later, the inner hatch slid open, and the two Jedi stepped into the flight cabin, sagging in exhaustion and coated head to toe in mud. They were covering their ears against the roar of the engines, but even that did not prevent a torrent of questions that Ben could only half understand by reading Jaina's lips. What's... hurry? she asked. Nearly lost. Ben led them to the only passenger's seats available in the flight cabin, midway between Tonogo's snoop station and the weapons station at the aft bulkhead, and motioned them to sit. Zek obeyed gratefully, buckling himself in and donning a headset hanging on a hook behind his seat. Jaina took the headset hanging behind the other seat but continued to stand and fire questions at Ben. "'What are you doing here?' The skiff bucked as the weapons tech deployed chaff and decoys. Jaina's eyes went round, and before Ben could answer her first question, she demanded, "'Are we under attack?' Ben nodded. "'The Terraphonians sent some headhunters—' "'Those lungworms!' She started to step past Ben toward the snoop station. "'How many?' Are they on a chase vector or an intercept? Zek caught her arm. Jaina, you don't have rank here. 
he pulled her back to her seat. And we've just been rescued, remember? To Ben's surprise, Jaina did not jerk her arm away, or tell Zek she wasn't asking, or even flash him a dirty look. She simply sat down and reached for her crash webbing. Sorry, she said. Guess I'm not used to being a civilian. I need to return to my station, Ben said into his microphone. Lieutenant Eoli will want to jump as soon as we're clear of the gravity well, and I'm the navigator. Jaina nodded and waved Ben toward the cockpit. Go. Let us know if we can help. Ben started forward, shaking his head in amazement. Jaina was acting like she actually liked Zek. Maybe Ben's mother was right about those two after all. Clearly something had changed between them. The skiff shook as the first concussion missiles fell prey to the countermeasures and began detonating. Ben sneaked a glance at the threat display as he passed to Nogo Station, then slipped into his own seat feeling immensely relieved. The wily chief had been exaggerating their danger just enough to assure a safe escape. The Terraphonian missiles had begun to burn out and drop away almost as soon as they had reached the chaff wall, while the old headhunters would not even leave the atmosphere until long after the rover had entered space and hit maximum acceleration. After strapping himself in, Ben activated the Navi computer display and brought up a schematic of the route they had taken to Terraphon. Retrace our inbound jumps, Lieutenant? Do we have a choice? Eoli asked. Ben studied a maze of narrow, twisting hyperspace lanes that disappeared into the transitory mists with no indication of where they led. We've got a gazillion choices, he said. There's just no way to tell where any of the others lead. Eoli nodded. That's what I thought, she said. Ben plotted a bearing to their first jump and transferred it to Eoli's display, then set up a course retracing their route out of the transitory mists. By the time he finished, the rover had entered space and escaped Terraphon's gravity well. Eoli sounded the jump alarm, then a faint shudder ran through the skiff, and the stars stretched into lines. I can handle it from here, Ben, Eoli said. Why don't you get our passengers cleaned up and debriefed? Colonel Solo will expect a full report as soon as we can make contact again. Ben removed his headset. The rover's engines had fallen silent the moment they left Terraphon's atmosphere and collected Jaina and Zek, leading them through a bulkhead into the crew quarters. This cabin was as cramped as everything else aboard the little skiff, with a small galley and a sanistim unit tucked into the two front corners and four bunks stacked behind a sleeping partition in back. Ben motioned Jaina and Zek to the small table in the center of the cabin. You must be hungry, he said, turning to the galley. What do you want? Jaina raised her brow, dislodging several flakes of mud, then looked down at her filthy jumpsuit and snorted. I'm glad to see Jason hasn't trained the teenage boy out of you completely, she chuckled. Until I have a chance to clean up, a cup of calf will be fine. Then you can have first sand esteem, Zek said, rising, because I'm starved. I'll have anything, as long as it's hot and there's plenty of it. He stepped into the sand esteemer to clean his hands and face, squeezing Jaina's shoulder as he slipped past behind her. She did not wince or roll her eyes or anything, until she caught Ben staring at her shoulder. What? she asked. Uh, nothing. Ben turned to the calf dispenser. We're just friends, Jaina said. Ben shrugged. It doesn't matter to me. He's not even in love with me anymore. Sure, Ben said, filling her cup. Whatever you say. He turned to give Jaina her calf and found her staring at the Santa Steamer's closed door. Wishing the cup had taken a little longer to fill, he turned back around and reached for one of the sipper lids the crew used at their duty stations. Ben, I don't need a lid. Jaina's tone suggested she knew exactly why he had turned away. 
What are you doing out here anyway? Ben put the calf on the table. Jason sent us. No kidding, Jaina deadpanned. Why? Because you disappeared after you went to Terrafon, Ben said. And then Tenel Ka started to feel like she couldn't trust anyone, so she asked Jason to send us out to see what happened. Then at least we gave her some warning, Zek said, emerging from the Sanistine unit. His face and hands were clean, but he smelled more than ever like a bog. Good. Warning about what? Ben asked. He punched an order for a Nerf loaf sandwich into the multiprocessor, then remembered how low Zek had needed to duck when he stepped out of the Sanistine unit. He added a bowl of brogy stew to the order and turned back around. Terrafon's not exactly on Tenelka's side, is it? Jaina shook her head. The Dutcha was already mustering her fleet when we arrived, she explained, and when we asked to see her, she tried to have us killed. She must have thought we were coming to arrest her, Zek added, keeping a watchful eye on the multiprocessor. And that's why you bombed her villa? Ben asked. Jaina frowned. We didn't bomb anything. Her mytils did that after the battle droids didn't work. The Dutcha bombed her own villa? Ben asked. She really must have wanted you dead. It was the only way to protect the sister she has spying on Tenelka, Jaina said. She could strand us here by destroying our stealth exes, but now that Tenelka is the Queen Mother, I'm sure the Dutcha has done enough research on Jedi abilities to realize we can touch each other through the Force across great distances. The multiprocessor dinged, but Ben barely heard it. He was too confused by what Jaina had said. If he understood the Hapen kinship system correctly, and he kind of doubted he did, the Dutcha Galni's sister was Tenelka's chamberlain, Lady Galni. Ben? Zek asked, studying the multiprocessor with a worried expression. Doesn't that chime mean my snack is ready? Uh, sorry. Ben placed the snack, it was two standard ration packs, on a tray and set it in front of Zek. But that doesn't make any sense. Tenel Kai used to be a Jedi Knight, right? A very good one, Jaina said. Then wouldn't she be able to tell when someone was lying to her? Ben asked. She'd know if Lady Galni was spying on her. Are you saying she doesn't? Zek asked. Without rising, he leaned toward Ben and began opening drawers beneath the counter. Where are the spoons? Ben retrieved a set of silverware from the sterilizing bin and handed it to Zek. Lady Galni was still with Tenel Ka when Jason sent me on this mission. Jaina's expression grew alarmed. Then Tenel Ka doesn't know the Dutcha is a traitor? Ben shook his head. I don't think so, he said. The last I heard she was counting on the Galni fleet to bolster her defenses. Blast it! Jaina pounded the table so hard a gob of purple stew slopped out of Zek's bowl. That's why the Dutcha didn't want to talk to us. She's pretending to be on Tenelka's side, and she knew two Jedi would sense the lie. So Tenelka will think she's rushing to the defense, and then the Dutcha can attack from inside. That makes sense. Zek nodded, then frowned. What I don't get is why Tenelka can't sense that her chamberlain is a spy. Maybe Lady Galni can hide it when she's lying, Ben said. If Jedi can do it, most can't, Jaina said, frowning at Ben. At least not from each other. Ben cringed inwardly, realizing too late that hiding lies was one of those special techniques that Jason probably did not want him talking about. Well, maybe Lady Galni can, he countered. She wouldn't need to be a Jedi. All she has to do is make herself believe she's telling the truth when she isn't. Or not know she's lying at all, Zek added between mouthfuls. Jaina turned to Zek and asked, You think Lady Galni's not in on it? Zek shrugged. You don't have to be a spy to be a security leak, he said. 
Carelessness is all it takes. Yeah, Ben said, growing excited. Sort of like the blind Willamander, only in reverse. The blind Willamander? Jaina asked. You know, when you use someone innocent to put out false intelligence, Ben explained. Only this way, you're collecting the information from someone innocent. And since she doesn't know what's happening, she's her own cutout, too. It's a perfect setup against someone like Tenel Ka. Jaina looked vaguely worried. Where are you learning all this stuff? Again, Ben winced inwardly. Weren't other apprentices learning anything Jason was teaching him? It's part of my GAG training. Ben drew a veneer of calm over his force presence so Jaina and Zek would not sense his lie. We need to know all that spy stuff. Well, you must be studying hard, Zek said, because I think you're right. Jaina nodded. It makes sense. The real spy is probably one of Galni's consorts. Tenelka would have no reason to talk to them anyway. She glanced back to Ben. And heap and noble women have a bad habit of underestimating male duplicity. The comment sent a bolt of alarm shooting through Ben, but he did his best to stay calm, reminding himself that during their practice sessions, not even Jason could always tell when he was lying. I'm glad that stuff finally came in useful. To tell the truth, I was beginning to wonder if those instructors were making it up. He turned his attention to Zek, who had already devoured most of his snack and was using the bread to wipe the stew bowl clean. You know how to use the multiprocessor if you're still hungry? Zek studied the unit with a ravenous gleam in his eye. Oh, yeah. Good. Ben pointed to the locker beneath his bunk. My spare flight utilities might fit you, Jaina. But Zek, don't worry, Jaina said. I'll stick Zek's in the cleaner while he's Santa steaming. Then I'd better go talk to Lieutenant Ioli, Ben said. Ioli had not told him to report, but the last thing he wanted to do was say anything else to arouse Jaina's scrutiny. She'll want to send a report to Jason as soon as we're out of the dead zone. Ask her to send one to Tenel Ka as well, Jaina requested. I don't know if that's a good idea, Zek said. We know she's surrounded by spies, even if Lady Galni isn't one of them. We're just going to have to take that chance, Jaina said. Tenel Ka needs to know about this as soon— The Queen Mother will know about it as soon as Jason does. Ben said. She's aboard the Anakin with him. Jaina frowned. The Anakin? The Anakin Solo, our new Star Destroyer, Ben said proudly. She's in orbit above Hapes, and Queen Mother Tenel Ka is hiding— Our new Star Destroyer? Jaina echoed. She stood and leaned across the table toward Ben. Jason named a G.A.G. ship for Anakin? Yeah. He thought, what did he think? Jaina demanded. That he would drag our little brother's name into the Pudu pit with him? Uh, you'll have to ask him, Ben said, realizing there was nothing he could say to calm Jaina down. I gotta go. He retreated through the bulkhead and escaped forward. He was aware of the bad feelings between Jaina and Jason, of course, but he had not understood the reason until now. Jaina was just as volatile and unreasonable as Jason claimed. It was a wonder she had lasted in the military even as long as she had. But then the standards of the old New Republic forces had not been nearly as high as they were now that Jason and Admiral Neothel had reorganized the military. These days, someone as hot-headed as Jaina would never even make it into flight school. And he couldn't imagine how she had ever become a Jedi Knight. Jason was always telling him that a good Jedi used his anger, not the other way around. Ben returned to his duty station and reported to Eoli, then coded a burst message to be sent over the holonet as soon as they left the transitory mists. After a few minutes of thought, he also included a warning about Jaina's reaction to the Anakin's name. With a little forewarning, 
maybe Jason would be able to avoid another blow-up like the one that had opened the rift between them in the first place. After Ben finished the message, he remained in his seat, afraid to go back and give Jaina something else to be angry about. He really did not want to cause any more tension between her and Jason. But his motives were also selfish. With his father already threatening to end his apprenticeship with Jason, the last thing he wanted to do was give Jaina any reason to suggest to his parents there might be reason for concern. Fortunately, avoiding Jaina and Zek turned out to be easy. Their long trudge across the bogs had left them so exhausted that as soon as they had cleaned up and eaten, they climbed into bunks and fell asleep. The pair still had not stirred nearly a standard day later when the rover finally emerged from hyperspace in the star-spangled vastness outside the transitory mists. Tonogo quickly brought up the holocom and sent Ben's message. To their astonishment, they received a response almost immediately, even before Ben had finished plotting their course back to Hapes. That was fast, he said. Too fast, Tonogo answered. He set to work decoding it. It's a see you message. Has to be. This drew a groan from the usually silent Twi'lek weapons officer. See you message? Ben asked. See you later, Eoli explained. When a Star Destroyer has to change posts while her scouts are out, she drops a message beacon with rendezvous coordinates. Okay, Ben said, not seeing the problem. So I don't plot a course until we have the new coordinates. That'd be too easy, son, Tonogo said. It's pretty rare that a Star Destroyer moves toward the scout ship, Eoli said. And since reconnaissance skiffs don't carry a lot of fuel or provisions, and since we have half again our normal complement, Ben added, beginning to understand. Right, Eoli said. It can be a problem. They waited in silence while Tonogo finished decoding the message. Then Ben felt a ripple of relief in the force. It's not so bad, Tonogo announced. We might even get in a little R&R, &R, if the lieutenant is feeling generous. That depends on how long you intend to keep me waiting, Eoli said. The message appeared on the cockpit display almost immediately. Recon Skiff Rover proceed to Roku Depot for refueling and resupply. Await rendezvous or orders. What about our message? Ben asked. The Anakin is probably in hyperspace herself, Tonogo said. We'll have to keep trying and hope we catch her between jumps. That's not good enough, Jaina said from the back of the cabin. Ben turned in his seat and saw her and Zek emerging from crew quarters. Their faces still had pillow lines, and their hair was still sleep-tousled, but they appeared completely rested, as Jedi usually did after a recovery trance. We have to go to Hapes, she said, continuing forward. Those aren't our orders, Tanogo objected. When Colonel Solo tells us to go somewhere... Colonel Solo doesn't know about our message, Zek interrupted, or the importance of getting it there now. Jaina slipped past Tonogo's station and stopped behind Eoli's seat. You know how important it is to deliver our intelligence to the Queen Mother in time, and you have the authority to act on your initiative. Eoli nodded. Of course, but the Queen Mother is aboard the Anakin... Not if the Anakin left hates, she isn't, Jaina said. A leader of Tenel Ka's courage and integrity is not going to leave her capital world while it's under threat of attack, Zek added. Wherever the Anakin went, the Queen Mother will be staying behind to oversee Hapes's defense. So I suggest you act on your own initiative, Jaina said, or we'll act on ours. Eoli's small jaw clacked shut. Then she let out a snort of irritation and turned to Ben. What do you think Colonel Solo would want? 
Ben glanced over his shoulder at the uncompromising faces of Jaina and Zack. Well, that message is pretty important, he said. And I don't think Jason would want you to get your crew killed by the two Jedi Knights he just sent you to rescue. Jaina smiled at Ben, then winked. Good answer, she said. Maybe Jason's teaching you something after all. Chapter 19 The task force had emerged from hyperspace in perfect crescent formation, and the luminous green disk of the planet Relophon was already swelling in the Anakin's Bridge viewport. The world was one of those truly massive gas giants on the verge of becoming a star itself, the tremendous pressures in its core releasing enough energy to bathe its horde of moons in a life-sustaining blanket of heat and light. Jason did not notice the tiny saucers of any battle dragons silhouetted against the pale glow, nor see the blue slivers of even one efflux tail streaking in to intercept the task force Tenelka had sent to arrest Algre. Still, he had a cold prickle along his spine and an uneasy emptiness in his stomach. The minutes after a fleet emerged from hyperspace were always its most hectic and vulnerable with the sensor officers struggling to calibrate their instruments and the hangar chiefs rushing to launch a fighter screen. It was the ideal time for an attack, and Jason could feel one coming. Unfortunately, he had no idea from where. The advance scouts had reported only an alarming inability to locate the enemy fleet, and Algre's commander was certainly in no rush to reveal her position. Major Aspara, I find this odd. Jason was addressing Major Maureen Aspara of the Hapen Royal Guard, whom Tenel Ka had assigned to serve as his advisor and command liaison. Along with a handful of aides, they were standing together on the observation balcony overlooking the Anakin's busy bridge. Wouldn't Dutcha Al Grey be deploying her fleet by now? She would if it were here. A tall woman with silky black hair and alabaster skin, Espara was dressed in a pale blue uniform that managed to look both military and stylish. Even if she were innocent, she'd be troubled enough by our arrival to make a show of force. Jason remained silent, concentrating on what he was feeling through the force. He could not sense the source of the danger— but the prickle along his spine felt as if it was about to erupt into hives. "'We're too late,' Espara continued, as though Jason were not astute enough to understand what she had said. "'The coup must be moving faster than the Queen Mother realized. The usurpers are going into open revolt.' Jason began to expand his force awareness rapidly, but the population of the Relophon moons was too scattered to glean anything useful. The planet was ringed by at least thirty major population centers and hundreds of smaller concentrations, and none of them felt particularly hostile. "'Colonel Solo,' Aspara asked, "'did you hear what I just said? "'The Algray fleet is probably on its way to Hapes.' "'Your aides.' Jason asked, still troubled by his premonitions. How many did you bring? You think someone betrayed our mission? Espara glanced toward the two female officers behind her. I assure you, Bayel and Roe are above suspicion. How many? This time Jason put the power of the Force behind his words. Espara shrank back. Just Bayel and Roe. What about your pilots? Jason demanded. Were they personal staff? Espara shook her head. They were from the Royal Transportation Pool. The empty feeling in Jason's stomach turned to a cold void. Whatever had gone wrong, it had started with the pilots. But I don't see how they could have betrayed us, Espara continued. Even if they were traitors, all they did was ferry me into orbit. They might have noticed the Anakin making preparations to get underway, 
but they wouldn't have known to wear. That might have been enough, Jason said. He turned to his aide, a genet named Orlop. Ask Commander Twizzle for a threat report. I've been monitoring that continuously. With a pink snout, wet nostrils, and smirking upper lip that did not quite cover his yellow fangs, Orlop cut a menacing figure in his black G.A.G. uniform. There don't seem to be any threats. A junior garrison commander is demanding to know our intentions, though she hasn't deployed her defenses yet. She wants to avoid giving us an excuse to attack, Espara surmised. That confirms the main fleet has departed. Colonel Solo, we must return to Hapes at once. If the Queen Mother is not under attack already... Jason did not hear the rest of Aspara's complaint, for he had turned away and was rushing off the observation balcony. The threat seemed more immediate than ever, and if it was not coming from outside the Anakin, then it had to be coming from inside. Colonel Solo, Aspara called, following behind. We're in the middle of an action here. Aspara's confusion was understandable. Even she did not know that Tenel Ka had left Alana aboard the Anakin, and she certainly didn't know that Jason's parents had provided intelligence suggesting that Aura Singh's primary target would be the child. As he raced for the lift tube, Jason's comlink chimed for attention. He pulled it off his belt and opened the channel. You know who this is? asked a wispy voice. Double X, Jason replied. What is it? He ordered me to report if anyone attempted to enter the girl's cabin, the security droid replied. I'm reporting. Jason's stomach sank. I was afraid of that. What are my orders? SDXX asked. Evaporate them? No, Jason said. His briefing on Aura Singh had suggested that evaporating her would be beyond the security droid's capabilities. Stay out of sight and frustrate her attempts to enter. I'm on my way. Jason opened a channel to bridge security. Execute a level one lockdown. He did not bother identifying himself, as his name would already be displayed on the duty officer's data screen. This is not a drill. Level one, Colonel? Affirmative. Jason reached the lift tube and stepped inside not bothering to acknowledge the crisp salutes from the two G.A.G. sentries stationed there. Now! I'm sorry, sir, the officer replied. We can't lock down while we're at battle stations. The crew needs to move freely. Then go to level two, Jason ordered. He would have canceled battle stations, except the order would have to go through Commander Twizzle, who would demand a confirmation and an explanation Jason had no time to provide. The assassin, assuming Singh was the danger he had been sensing, had chosen her moment well, when the priorities of a Star Destroyer ready to enter battle took precedence over the safety of even her most important passenger. Alarm horns began to beep over the Anakin's intercom, indicating that the Level 2 security protocols Jason had ordered were now in effect— Armed guards would be posted at every lift tube and bulkhead hatch with orders to detain anyone lacking proper identification. Anyone who resisted would be blasted. Jason did not think those precautions would make the slightest difference to Aura Singh. When he arrived at the commander's deck, he found the lift sentries lying on the floor with smoke rising from their blaster-scorched faces. A dozen paces down the corridor, Two more guards were down outside the Sav stateroom, the quarters assigned to visiting dignitaries, and there was smoke pouring from the cabin. He unclipped his lightsaber and rushed forward. Jason's mind was whirling with dark fears and black furies. For the first time since his imprisonment by the Yuzhan Vong, he truly wanted to hurt someone to make them pay in agony and anguish for their vile actions. And if Alana were to die, he did not see where he would find the strength to carry on with his mission. Who would want to save a galaxy 
that could abide the murder of his own innocent daughter. As Jason approached the Sav stateroom, one of the guards began to moan for help. The fellow's torso had been cleaved at an upward angle by something hot and long, and his fading force presence suggested he would die if he did not receive help soon. An abandoned lock slicer hung on the keypad above his head, and a still crackling arc had been cut through the double doors. Leaving the stateroom uninspected, and the guard to die where he lay, Jason continued down the long corridor. The low hum of a lightsaber cutting metal was droning around the corner ahead, where the entrance to his own stateroom was located. He extended his force awareness into his own quarters, and was relieved to feel the presence of his daughter somewhere near the back of the cabin, approximately where the refresher was located. She seemed curious and not at all frightened. Suddenly, Alana responded to Jason's contact, filling the force with surprise and delight. She seemed to recognize his touch and be happy about it, and that filled him with pride and joy, and an even greater determination to catch Singh before she found his daughter. But their contact was shattered by the intrusion of a cold presence, gleefully pouring its murderous intent into the force. Alana reeled back in shock and vanished, leaving Jason alone with the assassin's presence. Then the humming of the lightsaber suddenly assumed a higher pitch, and a loud clang sounded as a freshly cut panel of security door fell to the floor. In the next instant, a brilliant orange flash lit the corridor ahead, accompanied by the crashing whoomph of a concussion grenade, launched, no doubt, by Alana's defender droid, Didi. Jason paused a moment to be sure there would not be another grenade, then rounded the corner when he began to hear the shrieking of Didi's blaster cannon. The corridor ahead was so filled with smoke and blaster fire that it looked like the inside of a thunderstorm. Singh was a pale ghost in a red bodysuit, battling through the hole she had cut in Jason's door, surrounding herself in crimson snakes of light as she used her lightsaber to bat aside Didi's attacks. Jason drew his sidearm and fired on the run, hoping to blast the assassin in the back while she was too overwhelmed to defend herself. Singh dropped into a forward roll and vanished through the door. An instant later, her lightsaber whined half a dozen times, and Didi's blaster cannon fell silent. Aura Singh was alone in Jason's stateroom, and with her force abilities, it would take her only a second to find his daughter. He stopped a few paces from the door and reached out to the assassin in the force. Wait. Jason spoke the word with his mind instead of his mouth. At the same time, he was expanding his force presence into Singh's mind, opening himself fully to the force and using its power to push himself deeper into her mind, to crush her own presence and force it deep down into the bottom of her being. Wait, he repeated. Singh fought back, trying to push him from her mind, but Jason had taken her by surprise. He had the power of his anger and his fear and his hatred behind him, and she simply was not strong enough. Jason started forward again then dropped his blaster pistol and retrieved his comlink. Double X, open! The doors to his stateroom slid open, grating loudly as the damaged area scraped past the jams. Jason stepped into the foyer of his suite, where beads of molten durasteel were still popping and hissing on the stone decking. To his right, the walls above the galley and dining area were pocked with scorch marks, Alana's defender droid lay to his left, a heap of severed limbs and smoking circuits scattered along the edge of a sunken conversation area. Singh stood with her back to Jason, about five paces beyond the droid on the other side of a smoldering couch. In one hand she held her still-ignited lightsaber. In the other was a Class C thermal detonator with a disintegration radius large enough to kill herself, Jason, Alana— and probably half the personnel on the decks directly above and below. As Jason started toward her, 
she looked over her shoulder with an expression in her pale eyes that seemed equal parts hatred and awe. Don't ever touch me like that again. Jason did not reply. Singh was still struggling to free herself of his domination, and all his concentration was focused on keeping the pressure on until he drew close enough to strike. Singh flashed him a cold smile. But then, I don't think you'll have the chance. Her thumb twitched. The activation light on the thermal detonator began to blink, and that was enough to shatter Jason's concentration. He felt Singh slip free, and suddenly he was completely outside her mind, watching in horror as she pitched the detonator toward the refresher where Alana was hiding. Jason's heart dropped through the bottom of his stomach, his arms shot out without conscious thought, and the detonator floated into his hand almost before he realized he had summoned it. Singh was already whirling, leaping toward him with her crimson blade coming around at neck height. Jason brought his lightsaber up automatically and blocked, then pulled the detonator's thumbslide back. He never saw whether the activation light darkened. Suddenly Singh's knee was sinking into his stomach, driving the breath from his lungs and sending him tumbling over a couch. The detonator clattered to the floor somewhere in the galley. He came down on a beverage table, smashing it apart. Then Singh was over him, her crimson blade arcing down. Jason whipped his lightsaber around to block, catching her blade about halfway up the shaft and filling the air with a sizzling shower of sparks. Singh grabbed her hilt with both hands and began to push, slowly driving the tip of her lightsaber down toward his eye. The glow was as blinding as the heat was searing, and Jason's vision blossomed into a fiery red blur. He brought his free hand up to brace his weapon arm and tried not to worry about whether his eyeball would melt, not daring to turn his head or even look away for fear that he would slip. Singh kicked him in the side. The tip of a small, wedge-shaped blade scraped across his ribs and sent a blazing bolt of pain shooting into his body. Never! She kicked him again sending another bolt of pain deep into his stomach. Violet! She kicked again. My! Another kick. More pain. Mind! Singh kicked again, this time catching him near a kidney. A wave of fiery anguish rolled through his body, stealing his breath, so hot he could not even scream. The pain would have paralyzed anyone else left him on the floor praying to die before he drew his next breath. But pain was an old friend of Jason's. He had learned to embrace it during his imprisonment among the Yuzhan Vong, and now it no longer troubled him. Now it served him. He turned the palm of his bracing hand toward Singh and pushed with the force. The move did not surprise her as much as he had hoped. As she flew away, Singh rolled the tip of her blade over his, and his lightsaber went flying. He held his force shove until he heard her thud into the wall opposite, then sprang to his feet. A fiery blur continued to blind one eye, and his sight in the other was still splashed with crimson blotches. But he could see clearly enough to be worried. Singh had landed near the refresher where Alana was hiding, close enough to fulfill her contract if she was willing to risk Jason attacking her from behind. Jason did not give her that chance. He opened himself fully to his fear and anger, using the power of his emotions to bring the force flooding into him, and his body began to crackle and burn with dark energy. He raised his arms in Singh's direction, hands held level and fingers splayed wide. That was when the door to the refresher hissed open and a pair of small gray eyes peered out. They were wide open and locked on Jason with an expression that might have been awe or fear or both. No, Alana! Jason could not bring himself to release the Force Lightning while she was watching. Even if Tenel Ka had not yet taught her that the dark side was evil, his own childhood training remained strongly enough ingrained that he did not want his daughter to see him using it. Close the— Jason had to let the order trail off, 
when Singh took advantage of his hesitation to leap at him. Alana screamed from inside the refresher. Then Singh was three paces away, lightsaber coming in for a mid-body strike. Jason lifted one foot as though to pivot away, and Singh took the bait and stopped, dropping one leg back as she continued her swing. Instead of spinning past as he fainted, Jason cartwheeled over her blade and came down on the other side. Singh reversed her attack so fast he barely had time to grab her wrist, much less turn her own weapon against her as he had intended. So Jason kicked her in the knee as hard as he could. The joint dislocated with a sickening pop, and Singh collapsed to the floor, shrieking. But she did not release her lightsaber. She did not even stop fighting, rolling into him in an effort to break his grasp and slash him open. Jason started to pivot out of the way, intending to bring her arm around for a clean break behind her back. But Alana suddenly appeared on the other side of Singh, charging forward with her dark brows lowered and what looked like a small recording rod clutched in her hands. Alana, no! Alana kept coming. Determined to keep Singh from striking out at his daughter with any of her weapons, Jason force leapt backward, dragging the assassin away from his daughter. Alana took two more steps and raised the silver rod over her head, then dived. Singh raised her uninjured leg, cocking her foot to kick Alana with the stubby knife in the toe of her boot. Jason screamed and whipped Singh's arm around, twisting her away from his daughter. Her lightsaber flashed by so close he nearly lost an ear, but the assassin's legs spun around with her body, and the kick knife flashed past half a meter above Alana's head. Alana landed on Singh's other leg and jammed the silver rod into her injured knee. The hiss of an auto-injector sounded from its tip, and Singh cried out in astonishment. You little shrew! Singh drew her leg back again to kick, then let it drop to the floor. Her eyes widened in anger, or perhaps it was fear. She craned her neck around, staring at Alana, and began to convulse. Jason quickly pulled Singh's lightsaber from her unresisting hand, then held the still-ignited tip to the assassin's neck. Alana, what— She'll be all right, Jason. Alana sat up and straddled the assassin's leg, no longer afraid, if she ever had been. It was just my safety stick. Okay. Jason was too numb and relieved to ask more or to chastise Alana for not staying in the refresher. He simply waved her off Singh's legs. Get off. She could still be dangerous. That's not what Dr. Miala says. Despite her protest, Alana climbed off Singh's legs. She says the bad person won't be dangerous again until someone gives her the antidote. Alana came to Jason's side then squatted and looked into Singh's hate-maddened eyes. But don't be scared, she said. Yet I never kill helpless people, even bad ones like you. That's right. Jason took Alana's hand, and, surprised by how right her words felt, pulled her up to stand at his side. We just put them in a confinement facility for a very, very long time. Chapter 20 Outside the falcon's canopy hung a streaming veil of blue and white brilliance, so intense that it made Han's eyes hurt like a fog blaster hangover. He hesitated at the back of the flight deck, trying to make some sense of what he was seeing, half convinced that it was the efflux tail of some Death Star-type megaship. And if it was some big new superweapon, Han knew he and Leia would end up trying to destroy the thing before it blew up Tenelka's throne world or something. And he had no doubts about how that would turn out. Han was already older than Obi-Wan Kenobi had been when he'd died aboard the original Death Star. And on crazy missions like that, 
Wasn't it always the wise old man who got killed first? If it happened, Han only hoped his kids would figure out he and Leia had been no part of the assassination attempt on Tenel Ka. Dying he could take. He just didn't want to go out with people thinking he was some kind of terrorist. But the longer Han studied the blazing sheet ahead, the more he realized he could not be looking at any kind of efflux tail. There were actually two bright streams, one broad and curving and fan-shaped, the other thin and straight and braided. He finally realized what he was seeing. Scowling toward the pilot seat, which had become Leia's until his shoulder was healed enough to fly, Han stepped onto the flight deck. Are you flying my ship into a comet? Yes, dear. Leia met his gaze in the canopy reflection, then shot him a brief frown. One he knew was meant to remind him that they still had a lot to learn about Morwan and the usurpers. We agreed to return Lady Morwan to her dacha, remember? Of course I remember. Han glanced at Morwan, who was in the co-pilot's chair, then dropped into the navigator's seat behind Leia. But no one lives on a comet. Actually, a surprising number of beings inhabit comets, C-3PO offered from the communications station. Hermits, pirates, fugitives, political exiles. I'll graze no hermit, Han grumbled. And even if she was, she must own a dozen empty moons already. Actually, all of the Relifon moons are inhabited. Morwan said, but we're not meeting Dutcha Algre at her residence. Han glanced down at the navigation display and saw that they weren't anywhere near Relifon. Far from it, in fact. The Hapen system? he asked. What are we doing here? The answer to that is obvious, Morwan replied, and you shouldn't be out of Medbay. You need that hydration drip to keep your electrolytes in balance. Blaster burns remove a lot of fluids from your system. My fluids are just fine. Han had the sinking feeling that he knew exactly why they were in the Hapen system, and he was fairly sure that Tenel Ka could not be ready. With so much of her royal navy assigned to the Galactic Alliance, she would need support from the nobles still loyal to her. Support that would take time to arrive. And stop changing the subject. Fine, Morwan replied. Your health is no concern of mine. If you're truly having trouble figuring out the situation, just look through the viewport. Hans squinted out at the comet. Once his eyes had grown accustomed to the glow, he saw a dark crescent of empty space at the starboard edge of the canopy, just in front of the boiling brilliance of the comet's head. Clustered close behind the head were about seventy tiny black ovals, arranged in a three-dimensional diamond commonly used to attack planetary defenses. Oh, that, Han said, trying to conceal the alarm he felt, at how fast the usurpers were moving. I meant, what are we doing here? You can't intend to be a part of this fight. Morwan scowled over her shoulder at him. You doubt my devotion? That's not what I said. Han raised his hands defensively. But the Falcon ain't much of a warship. I won't be aboard the Falcon after we rendezvous. Morwan replied, and I suspect you won't be either. Is that a threat? Han demanded, starting to worry that she'd discovered he and Leia were spies. Because if it isn't, you'd better clear things up real fast. Even if it were a threat, you're hardly in any condition to do anything about it, Morwan replied. But all I mean is I'll be aboard the Kendall— and you'll most likely be with your friends from Corellia. Corellia? Han glanced back toward the battle formation, 
and realized that the three silhouettes in front were several times the size of the others. I was wondering if those were our dreadnoughts. As Han said this, he tried to catch Leia's gaze in the canopy reflection. But her eyes had that distant, unfocused look they got when she was caught up with something in the Force. With any luck, she was reaching out to Tenel Ka, trying to warn the Queen Mother about the trouble coming her way. Dreadnoughts? Morwan repeated. I really don't know what they are. Only that Corellia promised to send a fleet that could defeat Hapes's defenses. They did, Han assured her. Those dreadnoughts will punch through in no time. By this time tomorrow, Algre will be the new Queen Mother. That's not the reason she organized the overthrow, Morwan said. Her only concern is for the Consortium's independence. Whatever you say, Han said, it doesn't matter to me. He switched the navigator's display to tactical. None of the vessels in the usurper's fleet was broadcasting a transponder code, but the Falcon's threat computer had used a combination of mass and energy bleed-off patterns to classify the contacts as battle dragons. The three egg-shaped vessels at the head of the fleet, the Corellian dreadnoughts, it had designated unknown, assigning them an estimated threat level approximately twice that of Imperial-class star destroyers. The dreadnoughts were surrounded by a screen of light frigates configured for fighter defense, and the battle dragons had a number of Nova battle cruisers interspersed among them. After a moment of study, Han noticed that the battle dragons were grouped in clusters with nearly identical masses and energy bleed-off signatures. It only made sense. The noble houses would be operating as subunits within the larger formation, and their vessels would tend to have standard configurations. Han stored a screenshot of the tactical display, then noticed that one of the Nova cruisers had dropped out of formation and was turning to intercept them. Anyone in that fleet know we're coming? he asked. They're sending out a welcoming party. Dutcha Algre won't be expecting me to arrive in... Morwan paused to glance around the flight deck. A common freighter, she finished. Then maybe we'd better turn this freighter around, Han said, bristling at the disdain in her voice. Because they're not going to look in the windows before they open fire. That won't be necessary, Captain Solo, Morwan replied. Open a ship-to-ship -ship channel. I'm sure the Dutcher will understand if I break calm silence to avoid being fired upon. Yeah, I suppose so, Han said, reasoning that a calm wave was a lot less noticeable than a turbo-laser volley. Go ahead, 3PO. C-3PO opened the channel. Just activate your microphone, Lady Morwan. Morwan checked the comm status panel. No doubt to make sure the channel was on a tight beam, then activated her microphone. Heritage Fleet Nova, this is Lalu Morwan, a true guardian of Hapen Independence, arriving aboard alternate transport... She glanced down to see what transponder code the Falcon was using. Long shot. Request clearance to join formation and rendezvous with the Kendall. Long shot acknowledged as our fellow guardian, came the cruiser's reply. Continue approach. Stand by for instructions. Han studied Morwan with a raised brow. Don't say it, Morwan warned. I've heard all the Lulu jokes I care to. Han dated a lot of Lulus before he met me, Leia said, finally returning from wherever her attention had been. I think he's just surprised you gave us your real name earlier. Morwan shrugged. I didn't have much choice. Aura Singh found me, remember? Pardon me, C-3PO said. But we're being hailed by the Kendall. Shall I put it on? Of course, Morwan replied. 
C-3PO tapped a key, and a crisp, middle-aged voice came over the cockpit speakers. You're late. I apologize, Morwan replied. It's Lalu, your fellow guardian. Yes, yes, we're both true guardians of Hapen Independence, Algray said, clearly irritated at having to use the recognition phrase. Now tell me why you're late, and why you're arriving in that wreck. Han scowled and would have objected, except that he was busy with his tactical display, attaching the designator Kendall to the battle dragon from which the comm signal was coming. Actually, this is the Millennium Falcon, Morwan explained. I was forced to turn my yacht over to our agent, and Princess Leia was kind enough to offer me a ride. Algray paused before answering. Han stored another screenshot of his tactical display, this one detailing the Kendall's location and designating her the flagship. He could almost hear Algray wondering whether her plot had been exposed. But the sad truth was that so far, he and Leia had managed to warn Tenelka of precious little. Algray finally seemed to reach the same conclusion. How did that come about? It's a long story, given our calm restrictions, Morwan replied carefully. Perhaps I could fill you in once I'm aboard. You won't be aboard, Algre replied. The Heritage Fleet is preparing to make the attack jump. Fall in at the back of the formation. You can explain after the battle. After? Morwan asked clearly not happy about the prospect of riding out a major space battle aboard the Falcon. Dutcha? I'm afraid the Kendall has closed the channel, C-3PO said. Shall I attempt to re-establish contact? Absolutely not. Morwan turned to Leia. Princess Leia, I truly hate to ask this, but the Dutch's orders were clear. Of course, we'll obey. Leia was already pushing the throttles forward. We're old hands at staying out of trouble in big battles like this. As Leia spoke, the nav computer beeped to announce that it had received jump coordinates. A moment later, the usurper fleet, Han refused to think of it as the heritage fleet, began to accelerate under the head of the comet. While Leia chased after the fleet, Han performed the jump calculations, taking the time to look up Hapes's rotation cycle so he could plot exactly where the fleet would revert to real space relative to the planet. After double-checking his answers, he copied the information to a data file, then attached the two screenshots he had captured, identifying the fleet's flagship and composition. As field intelligence dossiers went, it was neither very thorough nor very timely, but it was the best he could do under the circumstances. The Falcon passed under the comet and pulled ahead. A moment later, the canopy blast tinting paled, revealing the blue circles of hundreds of ion engines spread across the darkness in front of them. The circles were accelerating toward the tiny white ball of the Hapen Sun, but still growing rapidly larger as the Falcon overtook the fleet. Blast! Han said. He needed an excuse to make Leia delay a few seconds when the usurper fleet jumped into hyperspace. And he had to keep Morwan distracted at the same time. The sensor dish is sticking again. Lady Morwan, can you shut down the sensor suite just before we jump? Won't that be dangerous when we revert? She asked. We won't be able to tell where the rest of the fleet is. Not if Leia waits a bit after everyone else jumps, Han replied. And if you bring the sensors up again right after we jump, we won't be blind for more than fifteen or twenty seconds. Twenty seconds? C-3PO squawked. Eighty-seven percent of all fleet maneuver accidents occur within the first ten seconds of exiting hyperspace. Better that than being blind for the rest of the battle, Leia said, following Han's lead. I can handle it, 3PO. 
I have the force, remember? Of course. Pardon me for doubting you, C-3PO said. It's impossible to assign a safety coefficient to the force, but I'm quite sure we're as safe with you flying blind as we are even when Captain Solo has all his instruments. Han would have reminded the droid that he had not gotten them killed yet, except that the blue circles ahead had begun to swell more slowly as Leia matched the fleet's velocity. He quickly formatted his intelligence dossier for transmission, then watched in silence as the Falcon slid into position at the rear of the formation. Finally, the voice of a female maneuvering chief came over the cockpit speakers. Jump in three. Leia put her hand on the hyperdrive actuator, and Lady Morwan reached for the sensor controls. Two. Han turned to C-3PO and held his finger to his lips, then cranked their S-thread unit to maximum transmission power and switched to a general hailing channel. Mark. Space ahead flared blue as the usurper fleet accelerated to jump speed. Deactivate sensors, Leia ordered. Morwan used both hands to pull the sensor sweep glide switches to their off positions, and space went dark again as the usurper fleet entered hyperspace. Han hit the transmit key. Leia waited another second, then shoved the throttles to maximum and activated the hyperdrive. The stars stretched into a pearlescent blur. Han returned the comm unit to its previous settings, then caught C-3PO looking at him with a cocked head. It was hardly necessary to do that yourself, the droid said. I'm perfectly capable of— Your timing's no good, Han interrupted, worried the droid was about to mention the S-thread message. And that's the last I want to hear about it. But my timing is excellent, C-3PO protested. My reaction speed is less than two one-thousandths of a second, which is two magnitudes better than yours. Han means that it's a matter of judgment, Leia said. There were too many variables to define in the time available. Oh, I see, C-3PO replied, sounding calmer. Captain Solar is having trouble expressing himself again. I'm going to trip your primary circuit breaker, Han said. Is that clear enough? That's hardly necessary. C-3PO retreated toward the far side of the flight deck. If you want me to keep quiet, all you have to do is say so. Morwan turned around in her seat. Keep you quiet about what, 3PO? C-3PO glanced briefly in Han's direction. I'm really not at liberty to say, Lady Morwan. 3PO isn't allowed to divulge anything concerning the Falcon's operation, Leia lied. She kept her gaze fixed on the control panel chrono, counting down the seconds until they reverted to real space. It's a standard security protocol. But there's no big secret, Han added quickly. The comm antenna retracts when the sensor dish reverses for the jump, and since the dish was stuck... You had to lower it manually, Morwan finished. She glanced at C-3PO, as though she could read the truth in the droid's expressionless face, then nodded. Of course. Morwan turned back to the sensor glides, leaving Han to wonder how high her suspicions had been raised. Even had she not believed before that he and Leia were spies, C-3PO's gaff had clearly planted the seed. The reversion alarm chimed, and an instant later the gray veil of hyperspace erupted into a wall of crimson energy. The cockpit speakers began to crackle with alarmed voices and shipboard explosions. Then the invisible fist of a turbolaser strike glanced off the Falcon's top shields, pounding her so hard that C-3PO clanged to the deck on his back. We've been hit, the droid cried. Shall I activate the abandoned ship siren? No, Han said. That was just a graze. We're fine. He peered over Leia's shoulder at the damage control board and saw that he was only partially right. 
The forward cargo hold had sealed itself off because of a pressure leak, and a coolant line had burst somewhere in the aft engineering tunnel. But Han thought they would probably last out the battle as long as they didn't take another big hit. Let's not do that again, he said, speaking into Leia's ear. We don't want to scare the droid. A turbo-laser strike blossomed a hundred meters beneath the falcon's belly, bucking Han against his crash webbing and setting off a new round of alarms. C-3PO emitted a surprised squeal and wrapped his arms around the comm officer's chair, then Leia flipped them into a tight spiral, and even Han gasped in alarm. He ached to take the pilot's yoke, but with only one hand to hold it, that would have been foolish even for him. The crimson fury of a rolling barrage erupted ahead and began to advance toward the Falcon. Dive! Han was straining against his crash webbing, yelling over Leia's shoulder. Go below! Leia had pushed the yoke as far forward as it would go. Trying! The barrage passed over their stern, bucking the ship hard enough to bang C-3PO against the floor and to send a bolt of pain shooting through Han's wounded shoulder. A glowing red disc appeared ahead, then quickly expanded into a sheet of half-molten metal that had once been the upper saucer of a hapen battle dragon. Escape pods were spraying from the vessel like shooting stars, and momentary fists of flame kept punching out through breaches in the hull. Pull up! Han cried. Leia was already bringing their nose up, and the battle dragon began to swing out from beneath the falcon. Trying! They leveled off just above the battle dragon, so close to the half-melted hull that the temperature inside the falcon began to climb. Give her some throttle! Han ordered. Get us out of this! Leia already had the throttles pushed past the overload stops. The Falcon leapt away from the Battle Dragon, only to find a slender Nova cruiser dead ahead, breaking apart midway down her long spine, pouring dark clouds of vapor and flotsam into space. Go left! Han yelled half a second before the Nova's bridge exploded into a spray of superheated shrapnel. Wait! Go down! The Nova's stern weapons arrays began to fire at random, lacing space below with stabbing shafts of color and flame. No, go— Captain Solo! Morwan cried. She was clenching the arms of her chair with both hands. Will you please shut up and let her fly? You're going to get us killed! Han bristled at Morwan's tone, then realized how right she was and began to feel a little ashamed. With Leia holding the yoke, he said. No way. I'm a better teacher than that. Don't brag, Leia spoke through clenched teeth. You'll jinx us. She flipped the falcon on her side and continued in the only direction she could, straight between the two halves of the Nova's broken spine. The gap vanished behind a cloud of frozen atmosphere. Dark blurs began to flash past too quickly to identify, and the impact alarm sounded continuously as they plowed their way through the flotsam. I certainly hope the particle shields don't fail us now, C-3PO said, clanking to his knees. One of those frozen bodies could cause a catastrophic hull breach. They emerged from the vapor cloud into a pocket of relative calm behind two wrecked battle dragons. The main part of the fleet was barely visible ahead, a field of blue efflux circles exchanging dashes of color with an enemy fleet too distant to spot visually. Han let out a sigh of relief. You see, nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about? Morwan released her chair arms and turned to Han with a half-accusatory glare. We were ambushed! The Royal Navy was waiting for us. Han met her gaze with his best sabac face. Yeah, it's almost like they knew the reversion coordinates. Wonder how that happened. Morwan's eyes narrowed. So do I, Captain Solo. They passed the wrecked battle dragons, and the falcon's canopy darkened against fresh blossoms of nearby turbolaser strikes.
I hate to interrupt, Leia said with her usual perfect timing. But I need that tactical display backup. Even Jedi can't see through this much battle fire. The suspicion in Morwan's eyes changed to fear, and her attention returned to the sensor panel. I've been trying. All I get is one long burst of screen snow. It's all this turbo laser fire, C-3PO said from behind her. You need to bring up the filters. Filters? Morwan sounded confused. How do I do that? You call yourself a pilot? Han grumbled. How did you ever find Telker Station? I was flying a Batog skiff, Morwan answered, as though the name explained everything. The sensors have automatic filters. Automatic filters? Han shook his head. What will they put in spacecraft next? Heated seats and cockpit calf dispensers? He unbuckled and stepped into the gap between the pilot's and co-pilot seats, then leaned in front of Morwan to activate the electromagnetic discharge filters. They're on glide switches, starting with radio waves and going all the way up to gamma rays. As Han explained this, he pushed the glides up, reducing the amount of static. Gradually, a clear image appeared on the tactical display. The usurper fleet was in even worse shape than he had imagined, with large gaps in the assault formation and a quarter of the Hapen Royal Navy pouring fire into the Kendall. "'Looks like you lucked out staying with us,' Han said, removing his hand from the filter glides. "'All Gray's flagship is taking quite a pounding.' "'Yes,' Morwan caught Han's arm and held him in front of her. I think we both know why that is. Something small jabbed Han in the side, and he looked down to find a small holdout blaster pressed to his ribs. You think I had something to do with it? The anger in Han's voice was genuine, and mostly with himself for letting Morwan get the drop on him. Of all the ungrateful she-huts, save it, Solo, Morwan ordered. You really don't want to heat my jets more than you have. I'm already furious with myself for not seeing through you two from the start. Seeing through us how? Leia asked. The falcon decelerated and banked as she turned away from the battle. And I'd be very careful with that blaster— I've been known to lose my temper with people who shoot my husband. And you really don't want to see Leia lose her temper, Han said, doing his best to keep his body in front of Morwan's face. As soon as Leia had said, shoot, C-3PO had started to creep toward the back of the flight deck, probably intending to sneak down the access corridor to fetch Cockmaim and Miwal. Ever since she became a Jedi, when she gets mad, things just start flying at you from all directions. That shouldn't be a problem, Captain Solo. Your fate rests entirely in the princess's hands. Morwan was speaking from under Han's arm, since she continued to hold him in front of her. I won't blast you if she turns back toward the battle. Leia continued to bank away. What for? Because she doesn't want it to look suspicious when we send Tenel Ka another message, Han said, glancing down at the tactical display. Protected by their powerful shields and multi-layered hulls, two Corellian dreadnoughts were continuing to press the attack, with what remained of the usurper fleet close behind. She wants to tell Tenel Ka to tighten up and hold her position. Leia was quiet for a moment, probably studying her own display, and the anger that Han had felt over being taken hostage began to give way to other emotions. Knowing that Leia would be sensing the change through the Force, he only hoped she realized that the fear he was feeling was only for Tenel Ka. The last thing he wanted was for Leia to think a little thing like having a blaster stuck in his ribs was starting to bother him. After a moment, Leia asked Han, 
You think the dreadnoughts can actually break through? Han nodded. That's what they were designed for, to penetrate an enemy fleet and tear it apart from the inside. And if that strategy works... They'll go after Tenelka, Leia finished. And it won't matter whether they win the ship-to-ship -ship melee that follows. If they kill Tenelka, the monarchy will be shattered. And the Heritage Council will still be in position to put the Consortium back together again. Morwan said, Very astute, princess. C-3PO reached the back of the flight deck and began to clank down the access corridor. Morwan didn't even turn to look. It sounds as though we're running out of time, princess. Will you turn back now, or do I blast your man? Hmm, Leia said. That's a tough decision. On one hand, I would inherit this old transport. That's classic transport, Han corrected. The YT-1300 is one of the most valuable— Stop stalling, Morwan ordered. Turn back now, or I pull the trigger. Leia sighed, and the falcon's nose started to drift back toward the battle. Leia! Han's fear had turned to embarrassment. Could she really believe he would want her to risk Tenel Ka's life to save him? The traitors have a spy. It's okay, Han, Leia said. I have a feeling it won't matter. Of course it'll matter, Han objected. They'll know what ship Tenel Ka is. That's enough, Captain Solo. Morwan jammed the blaster harder into his ribs. With a Jedi and two Nogri aboard... I don't expect to survive this anyway. On my way out, I won't hesitate to rid the galaxy of one more Alliance brain tick. Alliance brain tick? Han pushed his wounded arm forward in the sling. There's no call for insults. He clamped his hand over Morwan's holdout blaster. As he pushed the tiny weapon away from his body, she squeezed the trigger sending a flurry of bolts burning across his palm and ricocheting off the control board. Han, no! Leia screamed, but Han was already slamming the elbow of his good arm into Morwan's nose. He felt cartilage crumble and heard her scream, but the blaster bolts continued to come. He brought his elbow back again. Morwan released the holdout blaster and reached up to protect her nose. Han stepped away moving the weapon to his good hand and letting out a roar of pain as he finally realized just how much his scorched palm hurt. Han! Leia reached out and gently pushed Han back so the lightsaber in her hand would have a clear path to Morwan's head. What are you doing? Taking my ship back. Han pointed the weapon at Morwan, who was now holding her face in both hands, bleeding between her fingers and groaning in pain. What do you think? I think you're getting yourself shot up again for no reason. Leia laid her lightsaber in her lap, then ordered, Sit down and keep her covered until the Nogri get here. Han dropped into the navigator's seat. What do you mean, no reason? A cloud of gray smoke was hanging over the control board, rising from a half dozen holes that Morwan had shot through the Durasteel. She was going to kill me. I don't think so, Leia said. She wouldn't have had any reason. Han noticed they were still headed toward the battle. Don't tell me you were going to send that message. Actually, I still am, Leia said. Even Morwan was surprised. You are? Her voice was muffled and nasal. Why? Never mind, Leia said. She cocked her head looking into the canopy reflection, then raised her voice so it projected down the access corridor. It's okay, Cockmane. We have things under control. She had barely spoken before Cockmane and Miwal rushed onto the flight deck, Cockmane holding a deadly fighting sickle and Miwal a capture net. When they saw Han sitting in the navigator's seat with the blaster 
and Morwan hunched over with her head in her hands, their saurian faces looked almost disappointed. It's okay, guys. You get to lock her up. Han motioned for them to take her away. And use the stun cuffs. After you see to her nose, Leia added. We don't want her choking to death on her own blood. Han looked down at the furrows charred across his wounded palm. Speak for yourself. Han. Han shrugged. You're the one who's always telling me to be honest about my feelings. He waited until the Nogri had taken Morwan away, then asked, You're not serious about that message, are you? I am, and we need to do it now. Leia nodded at the tactical display, which showed Tenel Ka's formations starting to fall back in preparation for a ship-to-ship free-for-all. Open a channel. Han studied his display, trying to see what Leia was talking about. Unfortunately, he was distracted by an irregular pattern of flickering and blinking. Blasted woman, he said. She hit something in the control panel. Which is all the more reason to send the message now, Han, Leia said. Tenel Ka can't let this battle degenerate into a ship melee, or the Alliance won't be able to spring its trap. Trap? Something popped in the control panel, and smoke began to pour out of a hole in front of the co-pilot station. Han cursed, and ignoring all the blood Morwan's broken nose had sprayed everywhere, slipped into the co-pilot seat. The tactical display there was no better than the one at the navigator's station, but he could see clearly enough to tell it did not show any Alliance fleets. I don't see a trap. Leia fell silent for a time, then said, Listen, Han, if you can't do this, just say so. Now Han was growing really confused. Do what? It's okay, Leia said. I'll understand. Good, Han answered. That makes one of us. Leia dropped her chin and glanced over, giving him one of her patented I-know-you're-lying looks. Leia, what are you talking about? Once you sent the message, we both know our names will be Hut Slime in Corellia, Leia said. Gedjin will know we were working against them here, and you'll be branded a traitor. Leia's words hit Han hard, up near the heart, and he realized she was right. If they helped Tenel Khan now, it could only be in the open and the Corellian High Command, Wedge, Gedjin, all of them, would know he had chosen Hapes over his homeworld. But how could Han not choose Tenelka? Corellia was in the wrong here, trying to assassinate a sovereign leader and expand the war just to win a more favorable negotiating position, trying to plunge sixty-three worlds into a civil war that would make the Corellian conflict with the Alliance look like a spitball fight. Leia, my reputation doesn't matter, he said. My conscience does. Leia smiled in relief. I'm so glad, she said. That's what I thought. But I didn't want to make the decision for you. Great. I appreciate that, Han said. But I still don't have any idea what you're talking about. I told you I had a feeling, Leia said. And then you made a grab for Morwan's blaster. Han frowned, remembering that Leia had said something about a feeling. Oh, that kind of feeling. Why didn't you tell me that's what you meant? Leia rolled her eyes. What could I say? Trust me? I guess not, Han admitted. He felt a little foolish for missing the hint, but he couldn't be expected to read Leia's mind all the time. After all, he wasn't the Jedi. But look, I can't just open a channel to Tenel Ka and say, Hang tight, kid, the Solos are on their way. What kind of trap did you sense? Leia shook her head. I don't know exactly. Back at the comet, I sensed someone watching us. Han remembered Leia's distant expression when he thought she was trying to warn Tenel Ka. A Jedi? 
Leia nodded. I think it was Tisar, but he wasn't sure about me and closed down pretty fast. Han frowned in concentration. And since you felt Jaina watching us back at the Kiris's— Exactly, Leia said. Chances are that whoever was watching the Kiris fleet there followed it here. Han switched the comm unit to the hailing channel, which they would need to use since they didn't have the codes or frequencies for Tenelka's fleet. Another streamer of smoke began to rise from the shield array panel, and when he tried to adjust the glides, the readout did not change. Uh, before I send this message, maybe you'd better put yourself into a Jedi flying trance or something. Han, I'll be open to the Force, Leia said. But there really is no such thing as a Jedi flying trance. Too bad, because I think our shields are stuck. Han looked over at Leia and blew her a kiss, then activated his microphone and began to broadcast on the general hailing channel. This is a message for Queen Mother Tenel Ka from Han Solo. Listen up, kid. I've got something important to tell you. Chapter 21 Outside the viewport of the Depot Cantina hung a glorious aurora, a luminous explosion of green and violet and scarlet fanning across the face of the transitory mists from the direction of the star Roku. The spectacle was a testament to the vast sweep of the mists and the ferocious power of a blue giant's solar wind. But today Mara found it more eerie than awe-inspiring. Today its dancing beauty was only the barrier that prevented her and Luke from making calm contact with their son. Mara turned away from the viewport and looked across the table, where Luke sat nursing his third hot chocolate of the afternoon. We might as well face it. Ben's not coming. Luke continued to gaze out at the shimmering curtain of light. He's way overdue, Mara continued. And when I reach out to him in the forest, he doesn't feel anywhere near here. Either Jason didn't send the rendezvous message, or Ben didn't get it. But something went wrong. Luke nodded and took another sip from his mug. And something wrong is coming, he added. Don't you feel it? Now that Luke had mentioned it, Mara could feel something. It wasn't much, just a faint prickle easily mistaken for a chill, but it was there. Mara turned back to the viewport, but this time she studied the reflections in its corners instead of the aurora outside. Most of the customers she could see in the murky cantina were good-looking humans, typical hapens, and without exception they seemed more interested in their meals or the Faline Glimmick singer on stage than in the Skywalkers. The non-humans, a dozen blue-skinned Duros, some anvil-headed Arcona, and a couple of Moan Calamari, seemed transfixed by the Aurora beyond the viewport. And the Twi'lek family who ran the place was being kept far too busy to pay attention to anyone not ordering something. Mara looked back to Luke. You think Jason set us up? I do. Luke's voice was steady, but their force bond was permeated by sadness, and by a sense of bewilderment and failure. If Tenel Ka hadn't verified it, I wouldn't even believe he had sent Ben to find Jaina and Zek. Mara sighed. I have to admit, I'm beginning to feel a bit like a fool for placing my faith in Jason. Don't, Luke said. We both trusted him. And I'm still not sure we were wrong. Jason helped Ben overcome his fear of the Force. We can't forget that. How could I? Mara asked. But if he has set us up, if he's leading Ben into the dark side, now who's leaping to conclusions? Luke leaned across the table and took her hands. In a low voice, he added, Look, even if Jason is working with Lumia, I don't think it's been for long, and it doesn't mean he's becoming a Sith. It doesn't mean he isn't, Mara countered. We can't know what's going on between him and Lumia. 
I know Jason, Luke said quickly. Whatever he's doing, it's because he thinks it's right for the galaxy. Once he realizes he's mistaken, he'll be easy to bring back. Mara considered this, trying to recall when she had ever seen Jason do anything selfish, trying to think of anything, even after assuming command of G.A.G., that Jason had done out of self-interest rather than for the good of the state. After a few moments, she nodded. Her fear for Ben, and her anger at feeling deceived by Jason, were beginning to affect her judgment. You're right, she said, but we'd better work fast. Jason is too powerful already, and if Lumia has her hooks in him, it won't be long before he reaches the point of no return. We can't let that happen, Luke. We can't let him drag the galaxy down with him. We won't, Luke assured her. We stopped Raynar, didn't we? You're not inspiring much confidence, Mara said. After crash landing near a nest of Killix, Raynar Thule had joined their culture, eventually rising to become the leader of a powerful insect civilization. Under his guidance, the colony had expanded to the edges of the Chiss Ascendancy, provoking a border war that Luke had averted only by capturing Raynar in personal combat. Look how well that worked out. He's been locked in the temple basement for how long? Raynar is making progress, Luke said defensively. He's accepted a prosthetic arm and is considering cosmetic surgery to repair the burn scars. That should come in handy when he escapes, Mara said. He won't scare so many little children on the way to the Ender City. Luke frowned at her sarcasm. The surgery will help Raynar see himself differently, he said. Silgal says that will be a big step in his recovery. Okay, so maybe he'll be cured in another two or three years. Mara rose and hiked up her equipment belt, which tended to slip down on her hips now that she was carrying the extra weight of the shoto she had built in anticipation of meeting Lumia. Let's catch up with the Anakin and stick close to Jason. Ben will show up there sooner or later, if he hasn't already. Luke rose and started toward the door, and suddenly the uneasy prickle he had been feeling blossomed into full-blown danger sense. He glanced around the room, trying to locate the source of the threat. He felt nothing menacing from the other patrons, but that didn't stop him from pulling his lightsaber off his belt as casually as possible. Mara already had her weapon in her hand, though, like Luke, she held it down at her side to avoid sparking a panic. You feel it, too? Let's go, Luke said. He weaved through the crowd toward the nearest exit hatch, and Mara stayed close on his heels. If they allowed a fight to start in here, a lot of innocent beings would suffer. They were a few paces from the exit, when a hunched figure appeared in the bare durasteel corridor outside the cantina, hobbling out of an intersection about six meters up the way. She was wearing a bulky black cloak with the hood pulled up and she was being careful to keep her face turned away from the ceiling lights. Luke had just enough time to realize that he did not feel her presence in the Force before she brought her arm forward and sent a silver tube tumbling down the gray corridor toward him. A set of flashing diodes midway down its length confirmed the cylinder's nature. He raised his arm and used the Force to hurl the tube back up the corridor. Grenade! he yelled. The grenade was almost back to the intersection when the corridor erupted into silver brilliance. A tremendous bang shook the cantina, and Luke found himself tumbling backward over a table, ears ringing and spots dancing before his eyes. He hit the floor amid a torrent of spilling drinks and flailing customers. His eardrums popped painfully as the air pressure dropped, and the exit hatch fell with a deafening clang. An instant later, Half the cantina's lights flickered out, leaving the stunned crowd bathed in shadows. A hull breach alarm began to whistle overhead. Luke reached out in the force and sensed Mara lying about three meters away, surprised but unharmed and already recovering her wits. He sprang to his feet 
and saw that the area closest to the exit had taken the brunt of the explosion, with perhaps two dozen beings lying on the debris-strewn floor in various states of injury. Most of the yelling seemed to be coming from deeper in the cantina behind him, where the patrons had been far enough from the blast to become panicked instead of stunned. Mara stepped to Luke's side. Nice save. She nodded out the viewport, where a cloud of flotsam from the damaged corridor was already drifting past. Fortunately, there seemed to be only a few bodies, but none was dressed in a black cloak. That was just the opening salvo. As Luke spoke, the first frightened patrons began to crowd toward the cantina's other exit, their cries turning impatient and angry when everyone could not squeeze through the hatch at once. There's a reason she attacked before we were— A long hissing crackle sounded from the second exit, drawing a frenzy of screams from fleeing patrons. Luke had not heard the sizzle of a striking light whip in decades, and the sound sent a hot prickle up his spine. He reached inside his robe and withdrew the shoto he had been carrying in anticipation of just this moment. Well, I'd say this proves it. Luke's heart ached with disappointment. Ben's not here. Lumia is. Yeah. Mara's voice was angry. Jason set us up. She snapped the shoto off her own equipment belt and started for the cantina's inner wall, moving into position to flank their attacker. Luke started toward the hatch and saw snakes of light crackling into the crowd ahead. A leathery, anvil-shaped head went flying, and two human arms dropped to the floor. A dozen voices cried out in pain as ribbons of bloody cloth flew from their tunics. Back, you cretals! The icy voice belonged to Lumia. Get back! Only one man can save you now! The whip struck again, and the confused patrons began to fall back. A dark-cloaked figure appeared in the hatchway. Her hood had been pushed back off her head, but her face was swaddled in black cloth. Her light whip trailed at her side, its half a dozen strands divided evenly among energy, leather, and crystal-studded metal. Luke started to push toward her, using the force to subtly move people aside as he fought against the retreating crowd. You! Lumia pointed a long finger in Luke's direction. Lay down your blades and kneel. Not a chance. Luke ignited his blades, one short and one long, to counter the dual nature of her weapon, and watched the crowd part before him. It would have been quicker and safer to launch himself at Lumia in a long arc of force tumbling, but she did not seem to be aware of Mara sneaking up on her flank, and Luke wanted to keep her attention fixed on him until Mara was in position to strike. Lumia was in no mood to be patient. Her light whip crackled out again and shredded a duros down one whole flank. Her victim fell, warbling in pain, and the blaster he had been trying to pull clattered to the floor in front of him. The crowd froze in terror staring gate-mouthed at the still-writhing victim. "'The Jedi has decided your fate!' Lumia yelled over the screeching Duros. Her whip lashed out again, this time wrapping its tendrils around the waist of the live hapen beauty and cutting her nearly in half. "'Because of him, you all die!' Cantina patrons began to whirl on Luke, many pulling blasters or vibroblades. Their eyes were distant, and their mouths uniformly twisted into the same angry snarl, and Luke realized that Lumia was using the Force to redirect their fear and anger toward him. Clearly she did not intend this to be a fair fight, any more than he and Mara did. Luke danced forward shoving patrons out of his way with the force and using his light blades to return the bolts of those who made the mistake of firing on him. He hated to wound Lumia's unwitting minions and did his best to avoid injuring them seriously, but he had to defend himself. 
If he allowed the situation to get out of hand and they tried to mob him, a lot of people were going to lose arms, legs, and maybe worse. Luke had closed to within striking range of the light whip when a Twilak male in a clean kitchen apron stepped out to block his way. You're a Jedi! The Twilak's headtails were twitching in anger, and if he was troubled by the two blades hissing in front of him, his lumpy face showed no sign of it. You can't let my customers die just to save yourself. Luke used the force to shove the Twilak aside. Though Mara was no longer in his line of sight, he could sense through their force bond that she was in position and ready to strike. And Lumia continued to seem unaware of her. The Twi'lek stepped out behind Luke. Coward! His voice grew a little muted as he turned toward the crowd. Let's get— Luke silenced the Twi'lek with a bone-crunching back kick, then hurled himself at Lumia— both blades striking for the kill. He knew better than to think victory would come so easily, but he had to keep her attention riveted on him until Mara struck. Lumia's counter was, of course, masterful. She flicked her whip at Luke's legs, forcing him into a high somersault that bought her half a second to spin away. He came down a couple of paces inside the cantina, framed in the hatchway, and facing the murky corridor where Alima crouched, hidden inside her force shadow. Then Lumia's light whip crackled in at Luke's flank, striking high, low, and in between all at once. He pivoted around to defend himself, filling the air with sparks and ozone and flying shards of kyber crystal as he blocked with the short blade and used the long to cut away one of the strands. Alima could have taken him at that moment. She had the cone dart in the blowgun, and the blowgun pressed to her lips, and Skywalker was so focused on Lumia that he would never have sensed the dart coming. That was what Lumia would want, what she expected. But where was the balance in that? Luke Skywalker had taken so much from her. The use of her arm, her nest, her identity— and it would not be right for Alima to simply kill him. She had to destroy him, to let him watch Mara die first, so that when he died, he would know that there was no hope, so he would know that Lumia had won, that the Sith would have his nephew and his son, and that the Jedi Order would die with him. So Alima held her dart waiting motionless, while Lumia's light whip flashed again and again, keeping Skywalker framed in the hatchway for her, striking at his flanks and head to keep him from pivoting or somersaulting or simply advancing out of her line of sight. Finally, Skywalker fainted a leap for the hatchway, when Lumia made the mistake of trying only half-heartedly to block his escape— he made an unbelievable parry across his body with his short blade, then spun into a slashing, whirling advance with his long blade. Lumia had no choice except to retreat. Skywalker vanished from the hatchway and out of Alima's sight. Then the last of the light whip's metallic strands whirled past the hatchway. A fresh chorus of screams arose, and a jet of blood arced out of the cantina to splat down in a line of elongated red beads. When Alima looked back into the cantina, it was to find Mara crouching opposite her, just inside the hatchway and facing away. Half a dozen meters beyond her, Skywalker and Lumia were fighting a frantic battle in the midst of the crowd, Skywalker trying to remain in clear areas so no bystanders would be injured, Lumia working to keep those same bystanders in front of her so Skywalker could not attack without cutting his way through them first— now was Alima's chance. But it would not be enough to simply kill Mara. Alima was a Jedi, and Jedi served the balance. As she filled her lungs, Alima was also reaching out to Skywalker, sharing with him all the sorrow and loneliness and despair he had caused her, the shame and hopelessness and unending anguish. A bolt of surprise shot through the force. 
Skywalker's eyes widened and slid toward the hatchway. And that was all the opening Lumia needed. The light whip cracked again, wrapping Skywalker in a fiery cage of light and leather. The short blade went flying, taking along the hand that had been holding it, and Skywalker's robe fell away below the armpits in ribbons, leaving the air pink and smoky with blood and charred flesh. Alima emptied her lungs, and the dart shot from the blowgun. Mara heard Luke screaming, and thought it was only because he had been so badly hurt. But then he touched her through their force bond, and she realized he was frightened for her, that something was coming at her only slightly under the velocity of a blaster bolt. She dived away, and felt her skin prickle as something tiny and dark shot past her shoulder. A female Twi'lek cried out in astonishment, and when Mara rolled back to her feet, it was to find one of the cantina owner's wives standing a couple of meters in front of her, staring back through the hatchway as she plucked a tiny cone-shaped dart from her thigh. Clearly, Lumia had brought her back up. But Mara had no time to think of likely candidates. The Twi'lek suddenly began to tremble and gasp for breath. Then her leg buckled, and she collapsed in convulsions. Poison. Mara whirled around to charge through the hatchway, only to find it blocked by a swarm of terrified hapens trying to flee. She deactivated her weapons and rushed into their midst, force-shoving the leaders into the dark corridor ahead of her. Luke was badly wounded, and she knew it, but she was not going to save him by giving the dart blower another shot. As soon as she was through the hatchway, she reignited her blades and spun toward the dark corner from which the dart had come. There was nothing but shadow. Fleeing patrons continued to jostle past behind Mara, cursing her for blocking their escape. Thinking the attacker had already fled up the corridor, she turned to follow, then wondered why the corner had still been in shadow, with the glow of two light blades shining into it. Mara pivoted around to face the corner, but had to deactivate her lightsaber when a salt-drunk Arcona nearly impaled himself on her blade whistling in panic and slamming into her so hard she had to use the force to avoid being bowled over. Get off, she ordered. Instead of force-shoving the Arcona back through the hatchway, she stepped back to let him continue up the corridor. And that was what saved her life when a deep blue, almost black lightsaber blade came shooting out of his chest, so close to her throat she was afraid to drop her chin. Reacting even before she understood what was happening, Mara whipped her left hand around behind the shrieking Arcona and felt her Shoto's blade rub across something. A female voice cried out in surprise. Then the dark blade vanished from the Arcona's chest, and he dropped to the floor, gurgling and wailing. Standing behind him was a twisted figure in a black Jedi robe. She held herself slightly hunched, as though it would pain her to stand upright and one arm hung atrophied and limp beneath a sagging shoulder. The far leku had been seared off just above the shoulder, while the near one had a smoking wound across the back where it had been grazed by Mara's blade. Alima? Mara was not so astonished that she forgot to defend herself when the Twi'lek reignited her lightsaber. She caught Alima's attack on her shoto, then swept the Twi'lek's blade aside and brought her long lightsaber around in a killing slash. Alima used the force to hurl herself into a backward somersault, crashing upside down through the line of still-fleeing cantina customers. She alit on both feet on the other side of the corridor. An angry din began to build in the cantina as fleeing patrons stopped in the hatchway rather than run through the middle of a lightsaber fight. There were a dozen questions Mara would have liked to ask Alima. Was she Lumia's apprentice? How had she escaped to Noop? How long had she been back? But Mara could feel through her force bond that Luke was fading fast. His energy was dwindling, and his concentration slipping, and he was drawing heavily on the force just to keep his pain in check and his body moving. Mara stepped into the middle of the corridor, bringing herself within striking range of Alima. The Twi'lek stepped away from the wall buying herself room to maneuver 
and betraying the limp caused by her half-foot. And Mara added one more question to her list. Why had Alima helped kill Trisina Lobi? Mara leveled her long blade at the Twi'lek's throat. I don't have much time, so I'll give you one chance to surrender, she said. After that, this is to the death, and it doesn't look like you're in condition to last long. Alima glanced toward the cantina, where the crackle of Lumia's light whip was growing both louder and more frequent, and the sneer that came to her lip was surprisingly confident. You could let us limp away, she said. We promise to go. Mara grew cold and angry inside. That was your chance. She leapt in, attacking with both hands, beating Alima's defense down with her lightsaber and thrusting for the torso with her shoto. Normally she would never have risked such an all-out attack, but Alima was not much of a challenge, and Luke was running out of— As overconfidence always does, Mara's proved costly. Alima dropped her lightsaber and stretched out her arm, driving her sharp Twi'lek finger talons into Mara's throat and twisting aside so that the short lightsaber slipped past without hitting anything. Mara's breath stopped instantly, and she felt herself choking on something wet and warm. She started to bring her arms together, intending to cross her blades through Alima's body, then realized they had dropped to her sides. She started to bring them up, but Alima's eyes had grown dark, and tiny forks of energy were crackling across her blue face. Mara did not have the half-second it would take to raise her arms again, so she simply threw herself backward, pulling her throat off the talons and bringing her legs up to either side of Alima's. A bolt of blue lightning crackled past above her face, so close she saw it even through closed eyes. Mara was already scissoring her feet, catching the Twi'lek below the knees with one leg and above the knees with the other. The two foes hit the floor in the same instant, Alima coming down hard on the back of her head. The Twi'lek went instantly limp, her arms and body flopping to the floor as though her robe were filled with warm gel meat. Mara sat up, already bringing her lightsaber around to lop off Alima's head, then stopped the blade just centimeters above the Twi'lek's throat. She could not kill an unconscious foe, even one who had betrayed the Jedi Order, even when she was in a hurry to help Luke. Having knocked out enough beings to be certain Alima was not faking her unconsciousness, Mara put away her weapons and spun to her knees. She could sense that Luke's strength was continuing to fade, and that he was starting to doubt his ability to prevail. But leaving the Twi'lek armed and free even when she was unconscious, was not an option. As the exodus of patrons resumed through the hatchway, Mara bound Alima's hands behind her back and collected her lightsaber and blowgun from where they had been dropped. Then she opened the Twi'lek's robe to check for concealed weapons and was suddenly very glad she had stopped short of killing an unconscious enemy. Under the robe, Alima wore a black combat vest with a sensor pad blinking over the heart. A bundle of thin wires ran from the pad down into a chest pocket bulging with something shaped like a thick wafer. Very carefully, Mara opened the pocket and followed the wires to what she had feared she would find. A dead man relay connected to the proton detonator from a beradium missile. There was no question of returning to the cantina without disconnecting the relay. Head injuries were too unpredictable. The Twi'lek could die at any moment, and even if she lived, one of the fleeing patrons might trigger the device accidentally. Unfortunately, the wires had to be disconnected in a specific sequence to keep from triggering the detonator. Mara only hoped that Luke could hold Lumia off until she finished. Even with the Force to guide her, this was going to take time. And time was something Luke did not have. He could feel that in the fire eating his lungs— in the raw nettling of his flesh, his breath came in inadequate gasps, and his blood was bubbling from his side in a pink froth. He was calling on the Force to keep fighting, drawing it through himself faster than his body could endure, 
literally boiling his own cells. At most, he had another minute of fight in him. Maybe less. Luke had to end this now. He blocked a pair of crackling energy strands with his lightsaber and flung them aside, then launched himself across a clackball table toward Lumia. She countered by pivoting away, bringing between them a Twi'lek serving girl. He could have continued the attack, slicing through the chests of both shield and captor, but even desperate, he could not kill a hostage. He threw himself into an aerial cartwheel and came down on a slick, utensil-strewn floor squarely facing Lumia. Her hand flicked, and the light whip came arcing toward his head. Luke dropped to his haunches and let it crackle past overhead. Then, when Lumia started to back away from the expected lunge at her midsection, he hit her hard with a force shove and spun her half around. She crashed into a drink table and nearly fell, but quickly brought her hostage around to protect her from an attack. Luke smiled and raised his arm, pointing his lightsaber toward the serving girl. Then, using the force to wrench her free of Lumia's grasp, he sent her flying across the clackball table. She crashed down on the other side in a heap, screaming in terror, but far safer than she had been a moment earlier. By then, Lumia had recovered from her stumble, and the light whip was snaking back toward Luke. He sprang into a round-off, wrapping the tip of his blade into the crackling strands as he passed over upside down. He landed on the clackball table's squishy surface and jerked backward with all his might. And that was when his mangled body failed him. Instead of yanking the weapon from Lumia's hand, his lightsaber slipped out of his own grasp and went flying into the shadows. Luke cursed in disbelief, then rolled off the table in a backward somersault. Even that turned into a disaster. He landed on the body of one of Lumia's original victims and, too weak to steady himself, hit the floor with an audible thump. He could sense Mara out in the corridor, concentrating intently on something, very frightened, and urging him to wait for her, not to press the attack until she was there. There was no chance of that. Luke's strength was failing so fast that he feared Jason's betrayal would cost him his life. And when Lumia was done with him, she would be free to go attack Mara as well. His chest tightened with an emotion that might have been anger or sorrow or fear, and was probably all those things at once. Jason had betrayed them, which could only mean that somewhere along the line, Luke had failed Jason. Lumia must have suspected a trap, because when Luke failed to rise immediately, she did not rush to attack. Instead, she called, It's not too late, Skywalker. Let me kill you now, and everyone else survives. Even Mara. Very generous. As Luke replied, he was inspecting the cantina floor, searching for the Shoto he had lost when Lumia took his cybernetic hand. But I don't think so. You can't have... Jason. Jason? Lumia let out a cold laugh. What makes you think this is about him? Your involvement with G.A.G.? He wasn't having much success looking for his lightsabers. The blades had deactivated as soon as they left his grasp, and the cantina floor was too littered in debris and shadow for him to find anything. Who else could give you... An apartment. Who else could give you access to... their files? Again, that cruel laugh. Indeed. The light whip's crackling grew deeper as Lumia shortened the strands for easier control. Who else has access to Jason's codes? Who else could give orders to GAG officers in Jason's name? The questions caught Luke like a kick in the stomach. He knew that Lumia was only trying to hurt him, that her implications were likely more false than true. But the possibility explained too much. And now that he thought back on Ben's behavior over the last several months, he had to admit 
that he had seen too much of that possibility himself. Something crunched on the floor as Lumia circled the base of the clackball table. Luke gave up his search for his Shodo and began to look for another weapon. He had not brought his own blaster into the cantina, preferring light blades instead, but the body he had fallen on was almost certainly a spacer, and spacers always carried blasters. You're lying! Luke found the spacer's belt and followed it to a holster. Just saying that to hurt me. Does that make it a lie? Lumia asked. You've caused me a lot of pain over the years, Skywalker. What better way to repay it than bringing your family legacy full circle? Luke knew she was only trying to twist the vibroblade, to hurt him as much as she could before she killed him. But he stuck his head up anyway. Stop it! he yelled with real anger. You'll never make a Sith of my— Luke never had a chance to say son. All he saw was the bright glow of Lumia's light whip snaking across the clackball table barely centimeters above the surface, and he knew that his reflexes were just too slow right now, that he could not duck quickly enough to keep the whip from slicing into his brain. So Luke simply fell backward, closing his eyes against the crackling glow as the strands swept past a finger's width above his nose, bringing up the blaster he had taken from the dead spacer's holster, allowing the force to guide his hand, squeezing the trigger three times before he felt Lumia's shock in the force, then squeezing it twice more before he heard her body hit the floor and suddenly Mara was screaming at him from across the cantina, flooding the force with alarm. Stop firing! Luke sat up and glanced over long enough to see her in the hatchway, pushing past the last handful of stragglers, mostly wounded, who were still struggling to leave the cantina. You can't kill her! Mara yelled. Luke looked back to Lumia and thought he had done a pretty good job of it. She was lying at the foot of the clackball table with three different columns of blaster smoke rising from her chest, her cybernetic life support girdle sparking and sizzling with short circuits. Her light whip lay on the floor nearby, where she had dropped it when he blasted her. His own lightsaber lay a few meters beyond, where it had landed when she used the whip to disarm him. Luke used the force to summon both weapons to him, then stood and went to check on her. To his surprise, Lumia's eyes were focused and alert, and horribly bugged out with pain. As soon as she saw him, they crinkled at the corners as though she were smiling. That tiny act made his spine ache with danger sense. But he tried not to let that show when he spoke. Mara's coming, he gasped. She'll try to save you. Maybe not. Mara came up behind him and took one look at Lumia, then said, In fact, not a chance. She grabbed Luke and tried to pull him away, but still fighting his pain, he pulled back and remained where he was. Mara, we can't leave her. Yes, Luke, we can. Mara leaned down and pulled open Lumia's robe, revealing, aside from the blaster wounds and life support girdle, a black combat vest with a sensor pad over the heart. The diodes were blinking weakly and erratically. In fact, I think we'd better run. Chapter 22 With a swarm of pincer-winged mitils nibbling at the forward shields and a Nova-class battlecruiser chewing on the stern, Leia was jerking the pilot's yoke around at random just trusting to the force and blind luck to get the Falcon through the storm of enemy fire. How Han had done this for forty years without getting them blasted to atoms, or at least developing a nervous stomach, was beyond her imagining. She only hoped she was a good enough pilot to see them through until the Alliance's rescue fleet arrived, and that she had not been wrong about it coming. 
golden shimmers of dispersal energy began to appear a few meters ahead, a sign that the falcon's shields were overloading. Leia ignored the flashing maelstrom long enough to glance at the co-pilot seat, where Han sat hunched over a disassembled shield adjustment panel. C-3PO stood next to him, trying to hold the panel steady against the control board while Han worked. How are those shield repairs coming? Even I can't splice a moving target, Han complained. Hold still, 3PO. It's not my fault, C-3PO replied. Holding still is quite impossible, while Princess Leia continues to evade enemy fire. The Falcon's inertial compensators are simply inadequate for this kind of maneuvering. The Falcon lurched forward as a turbo laser struck the rear shields, and then an alarm chime sounded from the control board, announcing a desperate need to redistribute the shield power. I'm trying, Han muttered to the chime. I'm trying. Leia swung wide to avoid a flight of concussion missiles. The Falcon shuddered as the Nogri, operating the cannon turrets, cut loose with the quad cannons. The Mytel that had launched the attack erupted in a boiling sphere of flame. C-3PO squawked in alarm. That's my hand, Captain Solo. Stop whining, Han ordered. It didn't even burn through. I'm still going to require a new metacarpal covering, the droid complained. Perhaps we wouldn't need to evade so wildly if Princess Leia were to travel in a direction opposite the enemy. I can't, 3PO, Leia said. At the moment, she was flying away from the usurpers at a right angle, doing her best to keep the falcon pointed toward the glowing yellow crescent of Hapes's third moon, Migos. We'll get caught in the crossfire. Crossfire? C-3PO asked. Between whom? I didn't see a friendly fleet exit hyperspace behind us. It will be here, Leia said. Sure, any day now, Han added. Leia could hardly blame Han for his skepticism. The Alliance rescue fleet should already be attacking, and the brief brush of force contact she had felt earlier was hardly confirmation of its existence but nothing else made sense. She had sensed Jaina and Zek watching as the Falcon departed the Kyrus asteroid cluster, which could only mean that the Galactic Alliance had been waiting for the right opportunity to pounce on Corellia's secret assault fleet. So why weren't they pouncing? A turbo-laser strike erupted close to port, throwing the Falcon sideways and slamming C-3PO into the back of Leia's seat. The droid bounced off and crashed to the deck leaving a tangle of broken wires sparking in an empty control board socket. Oh, dear, C-3PO said from behind Leia. I seem to have pulled the shield adjustment panel away from the control board. Now it's going to take Captain Solo twice as long to make repairs. Forget it, 3PO. The fusing pen gave a soft snap as Han deactivated it. We never had a chance. The resignation in Han's voice worried Leia more than any amount of yelling or cursing would have. It almost seemed as though he did not believe they would get out of this, as though he did not think she was a good enough pilot to save them. Sorry I missed your signal about the message thing, Han said to Leia. Getting the control board shot up is going to cost us. No, Han, I'm sorry, Leia replied. With the tactical display still showing no sign of the Alliance fleet, she was beginning to wonder if she had been right to urge Tenelcott to stand firm in the first place. But I'm not giving up. She put one hand on the throttles. Do you see any reason I shouldn't push the engines hard? You mean aside from the leaking coolant line and the number four vector plate getting sticky? Yeah. Leia almost took her hand off the throttles. She hadn't noticed the sticky vector plate. I mean, aside from those two problems. Well, then, no. I don't. Han sounded a little more hopeful, as though taking a desperate gamble with their lives on the line was all he ever needed to cheer him up. Let her rip, sweetheart. Leia pointed the falcon's nose straight toward the dark interior of the crescent moon, then pushed the throttles past the overload stops and kept pushing until they would go no farther.
She felt herself sink in her seat as the vessel's acceleration tested the already overburdened inertial compensators, and they shot forward into the swarm of mytils that had been harassing them. As the falcon careened through their midst, the starfighters took close-range snapshots, and space exploded into a wall of energy blossoms. The Nogri answered with the quad cannons, taking out four starfighters in half as many seconds. Then the falcon was through the formation, with nothing but the crater-pocked sickle of Migos swelling rapidly in the forward canopy. The Mytils launched a desperate volley of concussion missiles and turned to give chase, placing themselves between the Falcon and the Nova Cruiser, exactly as Leia had hoped they would. Han activated the decoy launchers, and the Nogri kept the quad cannons chugging, and the missiles started to vanish from the tactical display two and three at a time. Fearful of hitting her own starfighters, the Nova quieted her turbo lasers, and there was a moment of relative peace as the Mytils struggled to bring themselves back into cannon range and reacquire target locks. Leia kept their nose pointed straight ahead, adding gravitational pull to the ship's acceleration, and the gap between the Falcon and Migos began to close more quickly than the one between the Falcon and the Mytils. Trying the old solo slingshot? Han asked. A partial, anyway, Leia said. Seems like a good time to learn it. Sure, why not? Han replied. You do know that it's a pretty tricky maneuver at full acceleration, right? Leia nodded. I thought it might be. And if that vector plate sticks at the wrong time, you know the crater we drill is going to be about three kilometers deep? I hadn't actually done the calculations, Leia admitted. I don't think Captain Solo has either. C-3PO said from the deck behind her. At our current acceleration and mass, the crater will be closer to five kilometers deep, assuming our nacelles don't overheat and vaporize us first, of course. Leia was still digesting that cheery thought when a cold prickle ran down her spine. She glanced at the tactical display and saw that the mytels were swinging hard to port, trying to open a clear firing lane for the Nova. She swung the yoke in the same direction, trying to keep the starfighters behind them and banking toward the center of the moon, in the wrong direction for the slingshot maneuver. Ah, uh, honey? Han's voice was nervous and high. That's a boiling cloud of brilliance erupted to starboard, engulfing the position they had just abandoned. A nice save, Han admitted. Probably would have done the same thing myself. If you say so, dear. Leia glanced at the tactical display and saw that the Nova had raised a wall of turbolaser fire alongside the Falcon, cutting off the route she needed to follow to complete her maneuver. The Mytils were still close behind, steadily closing the gap. Leia cursed the competence of the enemy commander and pulled back the yoke. The number four vector plate did not respond putting the entire ship into a dangerous, weld-cracking oscillation. Leia reached over to back the throttles off. Too late, Han warned. Can't let them close the distance. We'll have to do a partial reverse slingshot. A partial reverse slingshot? Leia asked. The bright side of the moon was slipping out of view, and now there was nothing but the pitch blackness of Migos's dark side ahead. Never heard of it. Course not. Han answered. It's new. New? Leia had a sinking feeling. Han, that vector plate is sticking again. Can't you feel the vibration? Just keep the nose up, Han said. You're doing great. Doing great was no guarantee of survival, Leia knew. But hearing Han say it made her feel better about their odds. She continued to hold the yoke back vibrating in her seat so hard she couldn't even read the nacelle temperature gauge, which was probably just as well, given the coolant leak and how long they'd been flying at maximum acceleration. Too large and cumbersome to follow the Falcon, the Nova had to break off and turn in the opposite direction. But the Mytels continued to close the distance, and soon they began to pound the rear shields again. Leia could do little to stop them, with the falcon shaking like a Nemoidian under interrogation, and the moon's dark surface coming up rapidly, 
she had to concentrate all her efforts on simply retaining control of the ship. Finally, a sliver of star-dappled velvet appeared along the top of the falcon's canopy. Leia continued to hold the oak back, her relief growing as the sliver slowly became a twenty-centimeter band of open space hanging above a dark and undulating horizon. "'Couldn't have done it better myself,' Han exclaimed, even more relieved than Leia. "'Okay, now you can level off.' A staccato rumbling sounded from deep in the ship as the Mitel laser cannons finally broke through the shields and began to hammer at the hull armor. Then Migos's horizon suddenly grew jagged and stretched toward the top of the falcon's canopy again. A mountain range, C-3PO cried. That will certainly complicate our escape. Complicate? Han turned to glare at the droid. If it were me flying, you'd be back there yelling, We're doomed, we're doomed. Quite likely, C-3PO admitted. But Princess Leia is a Jedi. Leia would have thanked the droid for his vote of confidence, except she was pretty sure it would seem misplaced in about three seconds. She continued to hold the yoke back, trying to will the falcon to pull up faster, then noticed a jagged notch of starlight showing through the mountains ahead. She pushed the yoke to center position. The vector plate came unstuck, and the ship finally stopped vibrating. Ah, uh, Leia, Han said, that part about leveling off, you can forget. Too late, Leia swung the falcon toward the notch, coming in at an angle so the nose pointed at the mountain on the far side. Launch missiles. Missiles? Han looked forward and saw the gap opening before them, then reached out and flipped an arming switch. Why not? He depressed a pair of launch buttons, and two blue circles appeared in front of the cockpit then rapidly shrank as the missiles raced away. Leia rolled the falcon up and banked into the notch, with their pursuers still close behind. She was too busy flying to see what happened next, but by the time the falcon reached the star-filled wedge at the other end of the gorge, the hammering on her stern had stopped. As they shot out of the canyon, the moon's surface fell away, and Leia finally had time to risk a glance at the tactical display. The Mytils were gone, either destroyed when the missiles filled the gorge mouth with debris or momentarily outmaneuvered. Leia stayed within a kilometer of the surface for a few seconds to be certain no Mytil survivors were going to pop up from behind the mountain range, then pulled the yoke back and pointed their nose away from the moon. They had just started to climb when space ahead broke into crooked snakes of iridescence. The proximity alarm blared to life, and the viewport was suddenly packed with blue halos, all growing steadily larger. What the blazes? Leia gasped. I think your fleet showed up, Han said, and in the wrong place. Leia glanced down and found her tactical display growing more crowded by the moment. Frigates, cruisers, and star destroyers were reverting from hyperspace at the rate of two or three per second, all pouring starfighters into space and accelerating toward Migos at full power. The name Admiral Akbar appeared under a star destroyer at the rear of the formation, and suddenly Leia understood why it had taken the Alliance so long to attack. That's Boatu. Figures, Han grumbled. What Bothan makes a straightforward attack when he can try something tricky, like coming out from behind a moon instead? Well, at least they cared enough to send the best. Leia pushed the falcon's nose down and started back toward the moon. Continuing to approach a reverting fleet at this velocity was not an option. Even if Boatu realized they were not on an attack run, the chance of a head-on collision with one of his capital ships would still force him to blast them to atoms. What do you think? Find a crater to hide in? At this velocity we'd make a crater, Han said. No time to decelerate. You mean... Yeah, Han said. We have to do the whole slingshot. Back through the battle? Leia asked. With no rear shields? Relax, Han said. 
At this speed, we'll be on the other side of the fighting before the gunners get a lock on us. Which means they'll be firing at our stern, Leia pointed out, where we don't have any shields. Well, yeah, Han said. Got any better ideas? Leia had to admit she did not. They were in a bad spot. Of course, they had been in bad spots a hundred times before, but this time she was sitting behind the pilot's yoke instead of Han, and he had never let her down. Leia looked out the viewport and saw that they were already coming up on Migos's light side. How are our nacelle temperatures doing? she asked. Not bad, Han said. We're only thirty-seven percent over spec. And you're sure we can go to forty? Sure, Han said. I just don't know how long we can stay there. Leia considered reducing the throttles, but by then they were already crossing between Migos and Hapes, and a full view of the battle convinced her they would want all the velocity they could achieve. Space ahead was one big sheet of turbolaser fire dotted by crimson knots of energy and the tiny slivers of distant ships jetting flame, vapor, and lives. As the falcon left the moon behind, a tightly packed screen of battle dragons, looking like stacked dashes at this distance, began to appear inside the conflagration. They were clustered in front of two thumb-sized eggs, slowly falling back toward Hapes and putting up such a wall of fire that the Corellian dreadnoughts had been forced to abandon their penetration tactic and simply try to punch it out from short range. Looks like Tenel Ka trusted us. Yeah, I just hope it didn't get her killed, Han said. Boatu took too much time getting here. There are a lot of broken ships floating around out there. Leia was too busy flying to check the display, but she felt certain the Bothan would disagree with Han's assessment. From a strategic viewpoint, saving Tenel Ka would be a secondary goal to destroying the Corellian fleet, since the latter would be such a crippling blow that it might well end the revolt. But Leia did not point this out to Han. It would only make him feel angry and betrayed. And the truth was, she already felt angry enough for both of them. Seeing that it would be impossible to slip past the battle outside turbo-laser range, Leia swung the Falcon around behind the usurper fleet and watched in horror and fascination as the combat grew larger and brighter. Within seconds, the inferno filled Han's side of the canopy entirely, flashing and boiling so brilliantly that it was impossible to see the planet behind it. The brilliance began to slip toward the back of the canopy, and still no one fired on the falcon. Leia began to hope the usurpers were simply too busy to notice one little transport zipping past behind them, until her entire spine began to prickle with danger sense, and she knew they weren't that lucky. Seal the hatches, she ordered. Leia rolled them up on their side, and the ship began to vibrate violently as the sticky vector plate caught again. A meter-wide shaft of blue fire stabbed past beneath the falcon's belly. Then another shot by just an arm's length above the canopy. She pushed the yoke forward and felt it catch about halfway. The falcon began to buck. Then abruptly stopped when a turbo-laser bolt hit the stern with a deafening clang. Leia drew what she feared might be her last breath and turned to say goodbye to Han. Then felt the yoke obey and saw stars whirling in front of them. A flurry of turbo-laser bolts stabbed past harmlessly, growing thinner and more distant, until they ceased altogether, and the sound of damage alarms filled the cockpit, which meant they still had air. Leia drew back the yoke again. It was a bit sluggish, but the Falcon had stopped vibrating, and she quickly brought the ship under control. Discovering that she was still looking at Han, she asked, "'What happened?' Looks like a glancing strike to the starboard aft. His voice was steady but determined, and his gaze was fixed on the control board. I don't think we even have the number three and four vector plates anymore, and maybe you'd better back off those throttles. We lost another coolant line. Leia dutifully throttled back, then realized the turbolaser attacks had stopped. Han, that's not what I mean. We're still alive. Han finally looked up, 
smirking at the surprise in her voice. Sure we are, he said. You're a Jedi, remember? Very funny, Leia replied. She checked the tactical display and saw the reason no one was shooting at them. Boatu's fleet had finally rounded Migos and opened fire, ripping a hole in the flank of the usurper fleet that left no doubt about the final outcome of the battle. But true, we just might survive this thing. Of course, that was when the proximity alarm blared to life again. Ribbons of color danced across space ahead, then blue halos began to wink into existence and swell into the backlit forms of an oncoming fleet. Another one? Han gasped. What is this, a war? On the journey back from Terrafon, the rover had managed to beat the Duchess to hapes by shaving safety margins and pushing hard between jumps. But Ben was still bringing up the comm systems when the Galni fleet slid out of hyperspace beside them and began to accelerate toward the battle. At this distance, the conflict was little more than a smudge of radiance flickering against the planet's jewel-colored face. But Ben could feel it tearing at him inside, could feel all those lives fluttering out. It reminded him of why he had tried to hide from the Force when he was younger— of the constant sensation of anguish that was all he remembered about the war with the Yuzhan Vong. Except now Ben was older. He knew it was not the Force causing all that pain. It was people. He knew that people could be selfish and frightened and noble and brave. And when all those things got mixed up together, wars got started. That was why the galaxy needed someone like Jason, to straighten things out so there wouldn't be so much suffering. The comm system finally completed its post-jump diagnostics, and Ben started to set it to Tenel Ka's command channel. Jedi Skywalker! Eoli snapped. She turned her noseless face toward Ben. What are you doing? His hand hovered above the input pad. If Tenel Ka lets the Dutcha come in behind her— The lieutenant knows what will happen, son, said Tenogo the chief petty officer who operated the snoop station behind Ben. She asked what you were doing. Ben glanced over his shoulder at the huge-headed Beth. Opening a comm channel? With the enemy so close we can read the names on the sides of their ships? Tanogo riffled his cheek folds. We wouldn't last ten seconds. But we've got to warn Tenel Ka. Ben turned back to Eoli and we're not going to reach her before the Dutcha does. Can't you do something with the Force? Eoli asked. Ben shook his head. It wouldn't be specific enough. She'd know there was danger, and she might even sense I meant there was treachery, but it's still just a feeling, and in the middle of a battle, she'll be feeling those concerns anyway. Eoli let her breath buzz out, then said, Very well, but we'll do this with a voice recording— and bear in mind we'll be sending it over the hailing channel. Ben frowned. I don't understand. We have to be sure it gets to her, Tonogo said from behind Ben. And since the traitors may still have someone close to the Queen Mother intercepting messages, we want everyone to hear the warning, Ben said, nodding. It's the recording part I don't get. Why can't I just... Jedi Skywalker? Do you really expect me to explain my orders? Eoli demanded. Tenel Ka is running out of time, so make your report brief and to the point. Ben cringed, more from the anger in her presence than the sharpness in her voice. Okay. Sorry. He opened a recording file, then spoke into the calm microphone. This is Jedi Ben Skywalker, with an urgent warning for the Hapen Royal Navy. Dutch Agalni is a verified traitor, coming to launch a sneak attack on the Queen Mother. Repeat, urgent warning. Dutch Agalni is a traitor. Take all precautions. Ben finished and looked over for Eoli's approval, but found her returning the intercom microphone to its cradle. She hooked a thumb toward the rear of the skiff. The others are getting ready to go EV. Join them. Copy. Still stinging from the last time he had questioned Eoli's orders, 
Ben unbuckled his crash webbing and rose, then realized what she intended to do, and stopped between their seats. Wait a minute. We have six people and only four suits. You think I don't know that? she asked. Yes, I mean, no, he said, I know you do, but there has to be another way. She looked at him with an expression that seemed more impatient than hopeful. You have one? Unable to think while he was looking into her eyes, Ben let his gaze drop to the deck. Both she and the chief seemed so calm and focused, but he could feel their fear in his own stomach, a fluttering ball of force energy that made him want to throw up. When Ben did not answer quickly, Ioli said, I didn't think so. She checked the chrono on the control panel. The chief says I need to send your message in two minutes and twelve seconds to give the Queen Mother a fighting chance. It's going to take you three to put on that suit. What about a message beacon? Great idea, Tanogo said. If recon skiffs carried message beacons... Go, then, Ioli pointed aft. And that's an order. I can't just leave you to die, Ben said, remaining where he was. I'm a Jedi. You're going to be a dead Jedi, because I am going to send this report in exactly— Ioli checked the chrono again. One minute and fifty-two seconds. Tanogo grabbed Ben's arm. We're scouts, son. This sort of thing goes with the shoulder patch. He pulled Ben out of the cockpit and pushed him aft. Go on now. We'll swing back and pick you up if we don't get vaped. Ben stumbled aft, feeling guilty and confused, thinking it should be him and Jaina staying behind while the rest of the crew went EV. But after so many days sitting beside Eoli in the cockpit, he knew without asking that she would view any such offer as an insult to both her and her crew. Even with the Force, he and Jaina would not be able to handle the unfamiliar skiff as well as Tanogo and Ioli could. Besides, the rover was their ship, so it was their duty to send the report. And in Admiral Neofel's new military, an officer simply did not hand off her duty to someone else. Ben reached the back of the cabin, where Gim Sorzo, the rover's Twi'lek gunner, was just sealing his neck ring. Jaina and Zek, who had already been force-hibernating inside evac suits to avoid straining the rover's limited life-support systems, were buttoned up and waiting outside the evacuation cabinet, where the last suit hung open and ready. Ben stepped into the legs and shoved his arms down the sleeves, and Jaina depressed the emergency tab on the shoulder. As the suit sealed itself, Zek slipped the helmet over Ben's head and closed the neck ring. Less than a minute later, the helmet speaker chirped to confirm the suit's spaceworthiness, and the three Jedi crowded into the airlock with Sorzo. Ben had just closed the inner hatch when his own voice began to come over the helmet speaker. This is Jedi Ben Skywalker with an urgent warning. Line up, Jaina's voice cut in, blowing the hatch in three, two. As she counted, they hooked their tether lines to one another and arranged themselves for an emergency exit, with Jaina in front of the hatch and Sorzo behind her, wrapping his arms around her waist. Ben stood beside the Twi'lek, holding onto a grab bar with one hand. Zek stood in the corner beside him, clutching the bar with both hands. One! Jaina hit the emergency release, and the outer hatch tumbled away in a cloud of smoke and escaping atmosphere. Jaina and Sorzo were drawn out of the lock directly behind it. Ben's hold on the grab bar delayed him for the half second it took Jaina and Sorzo to clear the exit. Then his hand came free, and he was sucked out the hatchway. His visor fogged instantly, and he felt the tether jerk as Zek was pulled into the void behind him. His stomach began to turn somersaults as they left the rover's artificial gravity behind, but all sensation of motion ceased. Ben listened as his own voice continued to come over his helmet speaker, urging Tenel Ka to take all precautions. Then a soft click sounded as the suit's comm receiver automatically switched to the rover's intercom channel. Watch your eyes, 
Eoli's voice warned. Rover moving off. Thanks, Jaina said. And may the force be with you. Same to you, Eoli replied. Rover out. The skiff's ion engines flared to life, brightening space so intensely that Ben's eyes hurt even through a darkened visor and closed lids. The glow diminished a couple of seconds later, and Ben opened his eyes to find the fog cleared from his visor. The star-dappled void was whirling by at dizzying speed, and every once in a while he caught a glimpse of battle flash, or of his companions twirling around on their tether pivots. Ben activated his suit thrusters and brought his own tumble under control, then spun himself toward Hapes. The Dutch's fleet had already opened fire on Eoli and Tanogo, concealing the planet behind a wall of streaking energy. He could barely make out the rover, a finger-length sliver of darkness trailing an efflux helix as Eoli tried to spiral her way to salvation. A stripe of turbolaser fire touched the head of the spiral and blossomed into a boiling ball of flame. Ben could not tell whether the anguish he felt was in the Force or in him. Chapter 23 In the Command Salon holodisplay, display, it all looked so neat and orderly. The planet Hapes loomed at the back of the projection, a bulging wall of light with dull green islands scattered across basic blue ocean. The battle itself was an arrow-headed column of blue, friendly symbols driving through a block of red hostiles. The friendlies were trying to reach an amorphous mass, identified in blue as the Hapen Royal Navy, that was swarming a pair of ovoid symbols designated unknown. A reinforcing fleet labeled Galni was racing in from the periphery of the Hapen Gravity Well, its designator colors changing from friendly blue to hostile red as it traveled. But Jason knew what the battle was really like. He could feel it in the hundreds of life presences winking out every second, in the waves of anguish rolling through the Force ever more powerfully. Most of all, he could sense it in Tenel Ka, in the carefully controlled anger he perceived when he reached out to her in the fear and sadness she felt over the outcome. Was this what he had been fighting to protect all his life? A civilization that devoured itself? Was this the higher purpose Verger had shaped him to serve? A society that sent assassins to murder children? A subtle pressure in the Force drew Jason's attention to his aide, Orlop. He turned to find the genet just looking up from the data pad in his hands. Yes? Jason asked. Orlop's big snout twitched uneasily. It always disconcerted him to be anticipated. But Jason didn't care. Orlop was monitoring two crucial situations on his data pad, and he had orders to interrupt immediately if the status of either changed. When Orlop took too long to compose his thoughts, Jason snatched the data pad from his hands. I can't wait all day, Lieutenant. Jason's eyes went first to the left corner of the display, which showed an image of his cabin, where Alana sat on the floor playing with a pair of simple rag dolls. Scattered around her was a GAG special assault squad with orders to kill anyone attempting to enter the room. The other corner of the display showed Aura Singh lying unconscious on the floor of a durasteel cell, secured at the wrist and ankle by stun cuffs and fastened to the wall at three points by heavy chains. Only then, once he was sure that his daughter was safe and her attacker was still incapacitated, did Jason read the message on the lower part of the display. What's this about Alliance Rescue Beacons, Lieutenant? The signals deck started to pick them up as soon as we reverted, sir. They're about... here. Orlop extended a finger into the hollow display, indicating a position on the far side of Galni's reinforcement fleet. But Jason's mind had wandered again, his gaze drifting back to the fight above Hapes. After the attack on his daughter, and with her mother in danger now, 
he was finding it hard to concentrate on his command duties. He wanted to be in a starfighter whisking Alana to safety on some anonymous world where this kind of danger could never find her. But that would not save Tenoka. She was down there in battle, probably aboard one of the five battle dragons fighting from a standoff position at the rear of the Royal Navy. Colonel! Orlop flicked his finger, drawing Jason's attention back to the question of the rescue beacons, which were located squarely on the opposite side of the Galni reinforcement fleet from the Anakin Solo. I was debating whether to bother you with this at all, since any rescue vessel we dispatch will probably be destroyed. To retrieve the stranded personnel, we'd have to divert the entire fleet. Obviously. Jason continued to study the hologram, wondering what could have caused an Alliance crew to go EV so far from the main battle. Any idea who... Colonel Solo? The interruption came from Major Aspara, the pale-skinned woman Tenelka had sent along to serve as a liaison officer to the Royal Battle Dragons in his task force. I hope you're not even going to consider diverting this fleet to rescue a handful of your people. The Queen Mother is already in danger, and if you allow Dutch Agalni's reinforcements, I assure you, my understanding of the Queen Mother's danger is far clearer than yours, Jason replied rather sharply. He returned his attention to Orlop. Have the signals deck place a tracking lock on the beacons. We'll attend to them after the Queen Mother is safe. Orlop punched a button on his datapad, sending an order that he had obviously prepared in anticipation of Jason's decision. When the genet did not look away, Jason asked, Is there something else, Lieutenant? There is, Orlop replied. The message dinghy you dispatched to Roku Depot was waiting to be taken aboard when we reverted from hyperspace. Jason frowned. And? And the hangar chief is suspicious, Colonel, Orlop said. The pilot is requesting an immediate audience with you, and there's some question as to how she could have known our reversion coordinates. Commend the chief on his caution, Jason said, and tell him to get that pilot up here now. For someone like Lumia, foreseeing the Anakin's reversion coordinates would have required only a little guesswork and some force meditation. Jason was far more surprised that she had returned at all, since he had felt nothing in the force to suggest that either Luke or Mara had been killed. It occurred to him that Lumia might have foreseen his trap and avoided the confrontation entirely. He wondered briefly if her return ought to worry him, but— Despite the reservations she had expressed recently about his ability to make the necessary sacrifices to bring order to the galaxy, he was well aware that Lumia needed him more than he needed her. In the hollow display, the Galni fleet began to glow more brightly as the Anakin Solo closed to within range of its new long-distance turbo lasers. The usurper reinforcements continued toward Hapes at maximum acceleration— clearly convinced they could reach the battle and kill Tenel Ka before Jason's task force caught up to them. Jason used the force to depress a button on the wall, activating an intercom microphone. Commander Twizzle, time to grab their attention. Attack at your discretion. Twizzle's voice came over the speaker. Very good, Colonel. A few moments later, the Anakin's long-range turbolaser batteries unleashed a salvo, causing the lights to flicker and the ventilation fans to slow. In less critical parts of the ship, the effects would be even worse, plunging corridors into temporary darkness and forcing electronic systems to switch to battery power. The new turbolasers were cutting-edge technology, but they required so much power that they were unlikely to become standard armament any time soon. A moment after the first volley, one of the Galni battle dragons started to flash with damage. The lights in the command salon flickered again, and then the vessel vanished from the hollow display. Apparently, the Anakin had caught the target with her shields still balanced forward. Well done, Jason said. He turned to Aspara. 
Would you give the Queen Mother's Battle Dragons clearance to open fire as soon as they're within range? Of course, Colonel. As Aspara spoke into her comlink, Jason took the opportunity to glance over Orlop's shoulder and confirm that Singh was still in her cell. Her door had been welded shut, she had not been given the antidote to Alana's paralyzing drug, and a constant stream of sleep-inducing coma gas was being piped into her cell. But Jason had to be sure. She had already demonstrated that she understood the value of timing an attack, so if she was going to attempt an escape, it would be soon. Sir? Orlop asked. Just checking. Jason glanced at the image of his cabin and found Alana still playing on the floor. You can't be too careful. No, sir, you can't. Orlop's tone was routine, but he was pouring concern into the force. I'm keeping a very close eye on the situation, Colonel. You don't have to worry about that. Good, Jason said realizing that he was drawing concern from more people in the cabin than just Orlop. Thank you. He returned his gaze to the holo display. Several Galni battle dragons were flashing with damage, and there were holes in the formation where two more had already been destroyed. It was far more damage than the Anakin could do with three long-range turbolaser batteries. Jason turned to Aspara. I didn't know the Queen Mother's battle dragons had been equipped with long-range turbo lasers. Aspara granted him a rare smile. I'm sorry, Colonel. Admiral Pelion was kind enough to share the technology after the Queen Mother assigned two fleets to the Galactic Alliance. The Royal High Commander instructed me to reveal the upgrade only on a need-to-know basis. I see. Jason was irritated, but not surprised. Even among allies, secrets were not shared easily. And how widespread is this technology in the Consortium? It's not. So far, the only battle dragons carrying the new turbo lasers are in our task force. Aspara turned back to the holo display, where several more of the usurper's vessels were blinking. Perhaps that will change after the Queen Mother sees how effective they are. Don't count on it. Jason nodded toward the holo display. The rear elements of Galni's reinforcement fleet were splitting off to meet the Anakin and her task force. Now that the element of surprise is gone, the new turbo lasers will lose effectiveness fast. Galni's ships were already pouring clouds of starfighters into space, trying to set up a defensive screen so the leading elements of the traitor fleet could continue the attack on Tenel Ka. Jason's task force began to decelerate and spread out, preparing to launch its own starfighters and take advantage of their long-range turbo lasers to soften up the enemy before fully engaging. Colonel Solo, we can't stop to fight, Aspara said. She pointed at Tenel Ka's small flotilla. The Queen Mother will be pinned against the planetary shields. I see that, Major. Jason knew better than to suggest Tenel Ka could retreat planetside. There were too many enemy vessels nearby. If she had the planetary shields lowered, they would simply follow her through and take out the generator stations. Are you suggesting a breakthrough attempt? Aspara nodded. We have no choice. If we slow down to fight here, by the time we reach the Queen Mother she'll be in an escape pod trying to dodge my tills. Aspara was right, and Jason knew it. Even with half the Galni fleet hanging back to fight his task force, the Queen Mother's flotilla would still be outnumbered nearly three to one. What Aspara did not know was that any breakthrough attempt would also put at risk the life of the consortium's Chumda, Alana. And Jason felt certain Tenel Ka would not want that any more than he did. Aspara frowned. Colonel Solo, you are wasting valuable— Jason silenced her with a raised hand. Thinking is not a waste of time. He activated the intercom microphone again. Commander Twizzle, how many battle dragons would be required to have a reasonable chance of breaking through that screen? And bear in mind they'll need to have enough strength left to continue pursuit. 
Twizzle's answer came immediately. It would be better to send us all. That's our best chance. I didn't ask for our best chance, Jason countered. I need a reasonable chance. Twizzle was silent for an instant, then said, Eighteen, sir. Berta believes that strength would give the task force a sixty-three percent chance of disrupting the Galni attack on the Queen Mother. Then that's what we'll do, Captain, Jason said. Berta was the Anakin's tactical computer, a powerful mainframe operated by a squad of Bith programmers. Have the other two battle dragons stand off with the Anakin. Stand off? Aspara echoed. Colonel Solo, a sixty-three percent chance of saving the Queen Mother's life is not good enough. You may be too much of a coward to send in the Anakin, but I assure you every hapen— That's quite enough, Major. Jason made a pinching motion with his fingers, and Aspara was suddenly too busy gasping for breath to continue speaking. Her accusation stung more than he cared to admit, in part because it was so true at least when it came to Alana. He was too afraid of losing his daughter to risk her life in the middle of a pitched starship battle, and it really didn't matter that Tenelka would want him to make this decision. The simple fact was that there were some things he would never sacrifice, not even if it meant saving the galaxy. When Jason continued to hold his force choke, as far as gasping changed to a desperate gurgling, and her hands rose to her throat. Her two aides scowled in alarm, and they stepped forward to shield her. Automatically reaching for sidearms, they were not permitted to carry aboard the Anakin. Jason froze them with a glance, then turned back to Aspara. Your dedication is commendable, Major, but there are facets of the situation that you're unaware of, and I am doing exactly as the Mother Queen would wish. Is that clear? Aspara nodded and braced her hand on the arm of one of her aides. I'm glad we understand each other. Jason released his force choke and allowed her to gulp down a long breath, then held out his hand. I doubt it will be necessary for you to communicate with Her Majesty's battle dragons until after the battle. I'll take your comlinks now. Aspara reluctantly passed over her own comlink and nodded to her aides to do the same. Thank you. Jason slipped the devices into his uniform pocket, then turned back to the hollow display, feeling worried and useless. The eighteen battle dragons he had dispatched to save Tenel Ka were already closing on Galni's defensive screen. Clouds of starfighters were pouring into space between them and vessels on both sides were already blinking and starting to fall out of formation. Jason could not help thinking that the intelligence provided by his parents had so far been more of a curse than a blessing. It had not prevented Aura Singh's attack on Alana, but it had sent him to Relophon with a sizable piece of the Royal Navy at exactly the wrong time, a blunder that might well end up costing Hapes her queen and Alana, her mother. The Anakin and its two escorts were concentrating their fire along one flank, trying to help open a hole through the screen. But the usurpers adjusted quickly, sliding a fresh vessel into place each time an old one was destroyed, compressing their formation as their attackers drew closer. The pursuit detail was already down to fourteen battle dragons, and a third of those were blinking with various degrees of damage, Jason felt Orlop's attention. He looked over and waited until the genet was actually looking at him, then cast a meaningful glance at the data pad. Everything all right there? Nothing has changed. Orlop's voice held a note of distress over Jason's apparent obsession with monitoring the assassin and the girl in his cabin. The pilot you asked to see has arrived. Good, Jason said. We'll need a few moments of privacy. Happy to escape Jason's presence, Espara and her aides left immediately, followed closely by his own staff. Only Orlop lingered. Is there something else, Lieutenant? 
There is, Orloff said. You probably don't need to be concerned, but we may not need to send anyone after those rescue beacons we detected. The signals deck reports a private transport headed their way. Good. Have signals track the vessel, and we'll make contact after the battle. Very good, sir. Orlop flipped the data pad up under his wrist and turned toward the exit. I'll send the pilot in now. Thank you. Jason extended his hand. But leave the data pad. Orlop wrinkled his snout in concern, but passed over the data pad and departed. Jason checked the display to make certain his daughter was indeed okay, as Orlop had reported, then set the unit on a table and blanked the screen. His conversation with Lumia was going to be difficult enough without having to explain his obsession with safeguarding Alana. A moment later, a slender woman in a black flight suit appeared in the doorway, her face concealed behind a closed helmet visor. Jason immediately had the sense that something was wrong. Not dangerous, but not what he had expected either. For a moment he thought the cause might be his own feelings. Perhaps he was merely nervous about meeting Lumia after he had tried to set her up at Roku Depot. Or perhaps his real fear was that she had prevailed after all, that Luke and Mara were dead. Then Jason noticed how much taller and more slender this pilot was than Lumia, how bulky her helmet was in back, how one shoulder sagged. He let his hand drop to his lightsaber. That's far enough until I see your face. The pilot stopped, and a dark flutter of amusement rippled unevenly through the force. Leaving one hand to hang useless at her side, she reached up with the other and released the neck ring. You mustn't kill us. Even modulated through a helmet speaker, her voice sounded silky and half-familiar, and it definitely did not belong to Lumia. We have news of your master. My master? Your Sith master. Lumia. The helmet rose, revealing a once beguiling face that had gone hard and sharp. Surely you're curious about what became of her at Roku Depot. A pillar of fire rose inside Jason. Alima Rar had been a Gorig joiner, a member of the Killick nest that had tried to kill his daughter as a newborn. And now here she was aboard the same ship as Alana. Before he knew it, Jason had ignited his lightsaber and grabbed her in the force. Alima allowed him to draw her closer, her eyes gleaming with unbalanced delight. You would do it, she snickered. You would kill us without a thought. Startled by the truth in her words, Jason released her. Without hesitation, he corrected. How many times had Lumia told him he could not be a servant to his emotions? If he wanted to restore order, his emotions had to serve him. But I have been thinking about it. I've thought about it a lot. That is nice to know, Jason. Alima's lip curled into an odd sneer, what she probably intended to be a coy smile that her haggard face could no longer muster. We have been thinking about you, too. And that still sends a creep down my back, Jason replied. Now... Since I really doubt you came here to fulfill a death wish, why don't you tell me about Lumia? Alima raised one thin eyebrow. You don't deny that she is your master? Jason shrugged. I doubt there would be much use in it. He glanced at the holo display, where his pursuit detail was just crashing into the screen of Galni ships, then added, And I'm kind of in the middle of something. As you can see, Alima's gaze went from the holo display to his lightsaber, and she retreated a step. Go ahead and kill us, then. 
You should. Despite the Twi'lek's words, she seemed clearly less confident about her chances of leaving the Salon alive than she had been a few minutes earlier. We are the only ones who know Alana's heritage, aside from you and Tenelka, of course. Jason's hatred welled up inside him again. Or perhaps this time it was alarm. He had always worried that the Gorig had been told the secret of his daughter's heritage when they were engaged to assassinate her. Now Alima had confirmed his fears, and he ached to do exactly as she suggested and snuff the life from her twisted body. But it had to be a trap. The Twi'lek would never have tempted him if protecting his secret were as simple as killing her. I've never liked threats, Jason warned. These days I don't tolerate them at all. Then it is a good thing we were not making a threat, Alima replied coolly. We were making a suggestion. Gorig tried to kill your daughter. We are all that remains of Gorig. You should kill us. And have gossip vids claiming that I'm Alana's father start popping up all over the consortium? Did we say that would happen? Alima asked innocently. We are concerned with higher purposes, Jason. We serve the balance. Jason knew better than to believe her. Alima Rar would never have come within a light year of him without some means of assuring her safety and the most likely form of that assurance was the very threat she had so skillfully avoided making directly. Were Alima to fail to leave the Anakin alive, he had no doubt that the secret of his daughter's heritage would quickly become public knowledge. Jason considered killing the Twi'lek anyway, thinking it might be better for the secret of Alana's paternity to come out now while the consortium was already in such disarray. But that decision was not his to make, at least not while Tenel Ka was still alive. He glanced at the holo display and saw that the issue of the Queen Mother's survival remained undecided. Though the flotilla he had sent to save her was down to ten vessels, three battle dragons had penetrated deep into the defensive screen and were close to breaking through, provided they did not take much more damage. Their designators were already blinking rapidly. Jason deactivated his lightsaber and turned back to Alima. As tempting as I find your invitation, I prefer to let you live for now. Tell me what happened at Roku. Alima's face relaxed, and she said simply, We failed. We? Jason asked. Who is we? You? You and the Killix? You and... Lumia, Alima said. We have been working with her for some time. The Twi'lek risked taking one step closer, then went on to explain how she had stumbled across Tracina Lobi spying on Ben in Fellowship Plaza, and how she had helped Lumia kill her. After that, Lumia had agreed they should work together. Alima had gone on to assassinate several members of the Bothan True Victory Party, then boarded the Anakin Solo with Lumia, and accompanied her to Roku Depot to attack the Skywalkers. Wait, Jason said. Lumia knew they would be there? Of course. She knew the best way for you to deal with their suspicions was to betray her and send her to fight them. Alima reached for his forearm. Then, when he jerked it away pretended not to be bothered. Your master was very proud of you, Jason. By betraying her, you proved that you have the strength to fulfill your destiny. I don't know which I find harder to believe, Jason scoffed, that Lumia would work with you, or that she would be proud of me for setting her up. Believe both, Alima retorted. We both worried that you were more committed to your family than to your mission. But your answer to Luke's suspicion convinced us we were wrong. 
You used everyone brilliantly. Lumia and your aunt and uncle. It proved you are capable of anything. Thanks, Jason said, more surprised than sincere. He was finding it hard to ignore the details Alima knew about his relationship with Lumia. But something still wasn't adding up. You said Lumia knew she was being set up to fight the Skywalkers? Of course, Alima said. Lumia was a Sith, after all. And she went? And still got killed? Alima nodded. She knew that killing your uncle was the best way to ensure your success. But she couldn't be certain of her victory. So she wore a proton detonator on her chest. When her heartbeat stopped, the detonator exploded. We are sorry. You saw her die? Alima shook her head. We're still here, are we not? But Lumia couldn't have survived. The entire cantina was destroyed. Even your aunt and uncle escaped by only two minutes. The Twi'lek paused for a moment, then added, That's why we came back. To warn you that they'll be returning to Hapes as soon as they make repairs. Repairs? Alima's eyes twinkled mischievously. The Jade Shadow suffered a mysterious rupture of a containment line, she said. The repairs won't be simple. And you arranged this because... Because you needed time to prepare, Alima said. The Skywalkers know that you set them up, too. Jason frowned. He was growing increasingly troubled by Alima's story, though only because he sensed that she was telling the truth, at least as she knew it. His plan had been to use the Skywalkers' own fears against them by making it appear that Lumia had been following Ben. Clearly something had gone wrong. What about Ben? Jason asked. For the first time, Alima looked confused. Ben? Did he survive the explosion? Alima frowned. Ben was never there, she said. That's how the Skywalkers know you betrayed them. Jason's stomach sank. If Ben had never made the rendezvous... Naturally, the Skywalkers would have believed Roku Depot was a trap. But then where had Ben gone? The sinking feeling in Jason's stomach grew cold, and he turned back to the holo display. The rescue flotilla, or rather the eight Battle Dragon designators still blinking on the holo display, had finally broken through. They would soon be in full pursuit of the Galni force moving against Tenel Ka. But Jason's gaze went to a position on the far side of the battered defensive screen, where a blinking transport symbol, labeled Longshot, was gliding toward the tiny blue blips of four Alliance rescue beacons. What is so interesting there? Alima asked, following his gaze. Instead of answering, Jason oriented himself toward the real physical rescue beacons, then reached out in the force and sensed four presences, three of them familiar. They seemed healthy, though perhaps a little impatient, frightened, and, at least in Jaina's case, angry. Jason didn't bother even trying to guess why the three Jedi had returned the rover to Hapes instead of obeying their orders to rendezvous at Roku Depot, or how they had gotten themselves blasted out of their skiff. He simply flooded his presence with reassurance and tried to project that to them, so they would know help was on the way. Zek and Ben responded by projecting feelings of gratitude toward him. Jaina simply shut down. Isn't the long shot one of the Falcon's false transponder codes? Alima asked. Jason turned and found her frowning at the long shot's designator symbol. It might be. If Alima noticed the suspicion and hostility in his tone, she ignored it. Do you think that is a good idea? Do I think what is a good idea? Jason asked. Allowing your parents to take your apprentice hostage, 
she said. Don't try that on me, Alima, Jason said, scowling. I know how the dark nest worked. Remember? How could we forget? Alima turned to him, the hatred in her eyes now open and honest. We would never try to use our powers on you, Jason. You have already proved that you are too powerful and smart for us. Just so we understand each other. Jason waved her toward the door. My parents are going to help Ben and the others, not take them hostage. If that's what you believe, then we're sure we are wrong, Alima said. We are hardly as well informed as you are. Wrong about what? Jason asked. He knew this was how the dark nest had worked, by using a victim's own doubts against him. But Jason would have known if Alima was using the Force. You don't expect me to believe my parents would harm Jaina or Ben. They would never do that, Alima agreed. Only we thought they had taken Corellia's side in this war. They have, Jason admitted. That doesn't mean they're terrorists. Then we must have heard wrong, Alima said. We thought they had been involved in the assassination attempt on your daughter. They weren't, Jason said tersely. That was a misunderstanding. No doubt, Alima said. After Roku Depot, we know you would never let a personal attachment prevent you from making a necessary sacrifice. I wouldn't, Jason said. We believe you. Alima used the force to retrieve her helmet, then turned toward the door. Perhaps we should be going, if you are going to permit us to leave. Jason nodded. Lieutenant Orlop will arrange an escort for you. His hands ached to kill the Twi'lek, but he did not dare. Not while he suspected it would expose the secret of Alana's paternity. You may consider the message, Dingy, a gift from the Galactic Alliance. Alima lifted her brow in surprise. Thank you. But if my relationship to Alana is ever exposed, I'll hunt you down myself. Have no fear, Colonel Solo, Alima said. Your secret is safe with us. We know it is the only reason we are leaving here alive. Jason nodded. I'm glad we understand each other. He waited until she reached the door, then added, There's just one more thing, Alima. If you ever come within a light year of my family again, I won't be so forgiving. Alima smiled and nodded. Of course. We understand. She used one hand and the force to lift the helmet onto her head. The balance must be served. The Twi'lek lowered the visor and went out the door. Jason activated the intercom and asked Orlop to arrange an escort for her, then retrieved his data pad and checked to see that his daughter was still safe and her assassin still locked away. Orlop's voice sounded from the door. I've arranged the escort, Colonel. Would you like us to return now? In a minute, Lieutenant. I need to think. Jason went to the hollow display, where the six surviving battle dragons of his rescue flotilla were in full pursuit of the Galni attackers. The remains of the defensive screen, seven rapidly blinking battle dragons, and a like number of Nova cruisers were gathering to give chase. But Jason had anticipated that possibility, and had a plan to stop them. Tenel Ka's small force was already laying fire on the leading elements of the Galni fleet, and he thought it more likely than not that the Queen Mother would survive. Jason's gaze shifted to the tiny blue blips that represented Ben's and Jaina's and Zack's rescue beacons. The Longshot's designator was only a couple of centimeters away from them now. He knew. Alima had been trying to make him doubt his parents' intentions. But she was gone, and those doubts remained. 
there were too many unanswered questions about his parents' role in the attempt on Tenelka's life, and the intelligence they had provided had been more harmful than useful. The fact was, Jason had begun to question his parents' motives before Alima ever boarded the Anakin, when he returned from Relophon to find Tenelka already under attack. Of course, he knew that the great Han and Leia Solo were capable of playing double agents. He had simply refused to believe they would participate in a cold-blooded assassination attempt against a friend. Lumia had been right. Jason had put loyalty to family above his mission. He had balked at the necessary sacrifices. And that hesitation had nearly cost Alana her mother and Hapes a queen mother, had come close to costing the Alliance one of her most important member states, and maybe even the war. Jason motioned Orlop and the others back into the salon, then activated the intercom. Commander Twizzle, the time has come to smash the usurpers. Order the Anakin and her escorts to advance and engage. We need to wipe those Galni battle dragons off the tail of our rescue flotilla. Very good, sir. Twizzle's voice was happy. And nicely done, if I may say so. You may, Commander, Jason said. And I have one other order. Have one of our long-range batteries target the long shot. There was a moment of silence. Then Twizzle said, But, Colonel, the long shot is a false transponder code. That transport is really— Stop wasting time, Jason said. I'd like the vessel destroyed before it reaches those rescue beacons. There was a moment of stunned silence. Then Twizzle said, Colonel Solo, the long shot is almost on them now. I understand the risks, Commander. Jason checked the datapad one more time and found Alana smiling up into the cam. Her eyes were sparkling with confidence and trust, and he knew he was doing the right thing for her and for all the children of the galaxy. Assign our best gunnery team and fire away. Chapter 24 The airlock had almost finished equalizing when a boom like a meteor strike resonated through the Falcon's hull. The corridor dropped away, and Han hit the ceiling, or rather, it hit him. An instant later he found himself plastered to the deck with no memory of leaving the ceiling. His head was aching, and his shoulder was throbbing, and his ears weren't ringing, they were blaring. Han rolled to his side and lay there suffering, trying to sort out what had happened, trying to sort out the whole last couple of months, as a matter of fact, how he and Leia had gotten themselves involved in another war, and what made this one worse than the others, so much more painful and confusing. Then a scrap of flimsoplast tumbled past, bouncing along the deck past Han's nose, and suddenly it didn't matter what had happened. The blaring was not in his ears at all. It was coming from the intercom speakers, and it was slowly, though steadily, rising in pitch. The cabin pressure was dropping. Han scrambled to his feet, then stepped over to the control panel next to the airlock and silenced the emergency alarm. Leia's voice came over the ship intercom instantly, backed by a chorus of chimes and buzzers that suggested the Falcon systems were sinking faster than a comet down a black hole. Han, you okay? Yeah, so far. Realizing he would need both hands to make repairs, Han tried to pull his arm out of the sling and nearly collapsed with pain. He was going to need help. But I can't waste time talking about it. We've got a pressure leak somewhere. A leak? C-3PO asked, also speaking over the intercom from the cockpit. Captain Solo, you have only one functional arm— You'll never be able to— I'll handle it. Han peeked through the hatch viewport and was relieved to see that Jaina and her companions were all on their feet and steady. I've got help in the airlock. Just watch yourselves, Leia warned. 
the deck continued to tilt and buck as Leia put the Falcon through a series of evasive maneuvers. Some laser brain in a Star Destroyer is taking pot shots at us. Is that all? Han asked. Seeing that the airlock pressure was almost within normal safety margins, he hit the safety override. I thought you'd hit an asteroid or something. A warning light flashed inside the airlock chamber, and the hatch hissed open a moment later. Jaina and the others, Zek, Ben, and a Twi'lek stranger, emerged in the typical post-EV rush to free themselves of their claustrophobia-inducing emergency suits, pulling off gloves and opening closure rings. Han's heart soared at seeing Jaina, and his gut clenched, because now she was in just as much danger as he and Leia were. Once Jaina's visor was raised, she turned to Han and opened the bulky arms of her evac suit to embrace him. I don't know what you're doing here, but whatever it is, I love you too, kid, Han said, raising a hand to stop her. But the hugs will have to wait. We've got a pressure leak. Jaina's eyes dropped to the sling hanging in front of Han's chest, and her expression switched from relief to understanding. How bad have we been hit? Don't know yet, Han said. He turned back to the control panel and tapped the keypad, calling up a ship-wide damage report. But it can't be that bad. We've still got— Han was interrupted when a hand appeared between him and the display panel. It took his eyes a second to focus, but when they did, he saw that the hand was holding a pair of Jedi wrist restraints. What the frizz? Han turned, running his gaze up an evac-suited arm to his nephew's face. I'm really sorry, Uncle Han, Ben said. But you're under arrest. Arrest? Han frowned at the boy, trying to decide whether he should explode in laughter or anger. Kid, you've got one lousy sense of timing. It goes with the company he keeps, Jaina said. She turned on Ben with fire in her eyes. Put those away before I— It's okay, Jaina. Zek reached over Ben's shoulder and gently pushed the boy's hand down. I've got this. To Han's amazement, Jaina merely nodded and turned back to the control panel, perfectly content to let Zek take charge of Ben while she focused on the pressure leak. Clearly something had changed between the two of them. She was acting like she actually respected him. But there's a search and detain warrant out on them, Ben protested. We've got to arrest them. You're training to become a Jedi, Ben, Zek said. That means you're supposed to use your own best judgment in these situations. I am, Ben insisted. I hope you don't really believe that. Zek pulled his hand back, then said, Put those away. We'll talk about this later. Finding himself in no position to argue, Ben obediently returned the restraints to a utility pocket inside his evac suit, then scowled up at Han. Nothing personal, Uncle Han— but I'm still bringing you in. Whatever you say, kid, Han answered. Let's just get through this first. Han turned away from Ben. I don't know, Dad, Jaina said. This leak might be more than we can handle. You're kidding, right? Han said. Back in the corporate sector, Chewbacca and I used to get banged up this bad every week. Not this bad. Jaina pointed to the damage schematic she had brought up on the control panel display screen, and Han's heart dropped into his gut. The upper cannon turret was gone, along with a substantial portion of the surrounding hull armor, and the lower turret was spread open like a flower blossom, clearly blown apart from the inside. The access tunnel that connected them was red, indicating a total pressure loss, and the surrounding compartments were quickly shading to pink. Jaina must have sensed Han's shock, because she asked, Cockmame and Miwal were in the turrets? Yeah. Firing the laser cannons. Han's insides were knotting with sorrow. Given the damage he had seen in the schematic, the only thing left of the two Nogri were the places they would always hold in the Solo's hearts. I owe whoever's commanding that Star Destroyer a detonite sandwich. A Star Destroyer fired on you? 
Ben asked. His lightsaber was hanging from a utility loop on his evac suit, but Zek was being careful to remain at his side anyway. What did you do to deserve that? Saved you, Han said sourly. We can always throw you back if you think it was a bad idea. We'll take care of Ben later. Jaina took Han's arm and started forward. Right now we need to get you and Mom into evac suits. Evac suits? No way. Han started aft. By then the Falcon won't have any cabin pressure left. Dad, you took a turbo laser strike straight down your access core. Jaina waddled up beside him in her suit. We might not be able to patch things up. Sure we will, Han replied. This is a YT-1300. The access core isn't that important. He continued aft, bouncing off the walls as the corridor tipped and tilted around him. A deepening shudder in the deck hinted at a broken engine mount, while a steady serenade of muffled groans suggested how fiercely the Falcon's damaged frame was straining under Leia's evasive maneuvers, and made Han wonder how long they had before a metallic bang deep inside the ship somewhere brought that final ear-pop of decompression. He rounded the corner to find the bulkhead hatch sealed and a stream of air whistling out through a tiny hole in the wall. The edges of the hole were smooth and puffy, as though the durasteel had been melted instead of punctured. "'That's bad news,' Ben commented from a couple of meters behind Han. "'It's a spatter breach.' "'No big deal,' Han said. Spatter breaches happened when a metal mass erupted in a molten spray, usually after being hit by a turbolaser strike. They were notoriously dangerous and difficult to repair because they caused so much damage in so many different places. It didn't hit anything important or we'd be dead already. Han activated the control panel, then checked the pressure on the other side of the bulkhead and entered a safety override code. His ears popped painfully as the hatch retracted, and the whistle of escaping atmosphere became a scream. He stepped into the rear hold and turned toward the sound, and the first problem became instantly apparent. The spatter had perforated a meter-wide circle of durasteel with literally hundreds of tiny melt holes. The metal was so weak that the air pressure was bowing the wall outward and Han knew it wouldn't be long before the area simply tore free and sucked the atmosphere from the hold in a deadly whoosh. Okay, so it's kind of a big deal, he said. Jaina, you and Zek go to the repair locker and break out the patches and reinforcement strips. Ben, take your Twi'lek friend and— We're not really friends, Ben interrupted, sounding as petulant as only young teenagers could at a time like this and his name is Spacer First Class Sorzo. Fine. Han looked over Ben to the Twi'lek. Just take a look around the access core and see if there are any other spots this bad. The Twi'lek, Sorzo, acknowledged the order with a salute and started off with Ben in tow. Han spent the next twenty seconds searching the immediate area for less obvious punctures and finding plenty. Even if they did manage to patch this cluster— they would still have to track down dozens of tiny melt holes concealed behind places like the engineering station and medbay. It was going to mean sealing off the cockpit and spending hours in evac suits. But what else could he do? Abandon the Falcon? A tremendous bang rumbled up from somewhere below decks, and an odd chugging sensation began to accompany the ship's shuddering and bucking. Leia's voice came over the intercom barely audible above the screech of escaping air. Han, what was that? How should I know? Han was actually beginning to feel overwhelmed by the Falcon's problems. And that never happened. Can't see 3 po tell you? There's no indication of a new problem on the damage reports, the droid reported, but we do seem to be losing power in our sublight drives. Blast! Han started to bang a fist against the wall, then took another look at the circle of spatter perforations and decided not to risk it. Something must be pinching a feed line. Perhaps you could free it, C-3PO suggested. I'm kind of busy patching pressure leaks back here, Han responded. 
That won't matter if we take another hit, Leia said. And if we can't maneuver... We're going to take another hit, Han finished. I know. Okay, let me get a flow report and see if I can locate the problem. He stepped around the corner and found Ben already standing in front of the aft engineering station, eyes glued to the display and fingers on the keypad. Thinking the boy had done something to cause the power loss, Han rushed to his side. The screen had nothing on it but a tactical display feed, which showed a confused but improving situation near the planet Hapes. Admiral Boatu's fleet was already starting to hammer the Corellian dreadnoughts, and a task force of royal battle dragons was tearing through the second usurper fleet from behind. With the royal battle dragons was an imperial-class star destroyer with a designator symbol reading unknown. While the vessel was directing most of her fire toward the usurpers, she had dedicated a single long-range turbolaser battery to attacking the Falcon. I thought I told you to look for pressure leaks, Han said, relieved he hadn't caught Ben actually trying to sabotage the Falcon. I'm still captain of this tub, and that means you do what I say. I'm using my own best judgment, Ben retorted. He put a finger on the display, indicating the mysterious Star Destroyer and it tells me we're in big trouble. Our only chance of surviving is to make for that Star Destroyer. Are you crazy? Han asked. She's already firing on us. Only because you're trying to escape, Ben countered. She'll stop firing if you surrender. That's the Anakin Solo. Han's jaw dropped. The Anakin what? The Anakin Solo, Ben said proudly. Jason's ship. Jason's ship? Han actually stumbled back, and not just because the deck had tipped again. He felt like a bantha had kicked him in the gut. They named a G.A.G. Star Destroyer for my dead boy? Well, yeah, Ben said, clearly confused. Anakin was a really great Jedi. I can't believe it! Afraid he would lash out at Ben in his fury... Han turned and kicked the wall so hard he felt his toes pop. The criffing rotters! Ben cringed and began to back away. It's an honor. Jason said— Forget what Jason said, Jaina interrupted, returning with Zek and the patching supplies. He's living in his own galaxy these days. Ben frowned. But Admiral Neothel thought it was a good idea, too. Then Admiral Neothel is one dumb fish. Han snatched the reinforcement strips from Zek's arms and nodded him toward the engineering station. I think we've got a pinched fuel feed. See if you can clear it before the engines shut down and we turn into a target barge. Without waiting for a reply, Han stepped around the corner. The pressure had fallen far enough now that the air was beginning to cool as it expanded. They had less than three minutes until the atmosphere grew so thin that breathing would become difficult. He dropped the strips on the floor in front of the spatter perforations, then turned one over and tried in vain to scratch off the flimsoplast backing. It was not something that could be done one-handed, at least not when your only working hand was shaking in fear. Uncle Han, surrendering is our best chance of surviving, Ben said, following. All I have to do is calm Jason and tell him I'm bringing you in. So he can torture his parents like his other Corellian prisoners? Jaina demanded. She knelt at Han's side and took the metal strip from his hand. They're better off taking their chances in the Falcon. But we're not, Ben countered. We're not traitors to the Alliance. At least I'm not. I'll forget you said that because if I don't, we're both going to regret it. Jaina removed the strip's backing in one smooth pull. Be careful how you apply this, or you'll just create more suction. Dad will show you. She held the strip up for Ben and reached for another, but he was shaking his head and ignoring her. No, not until Uncle Han promises to— The strip fluttered past Ben and plastered itself into the middle of the spatter perforations. The scream of escaping atmosphere grew shrill and urgent, and a crease shot across the damaged area. Han's heart climbed into his throat. Ah, uh, Jaina? Oh, Criff! She jumped up, 
already peeling the backing off another reinforcement strip. Ben, what's wrong with you? Nothing. I'm just doing my duty. Ben snapped his lightsaber off his evac suit's utility loop. If we help make repairs, they're just going to escape. And if we don't, we're all going to be sucking a vacuum in about thirty seconds. Holding the reinforcement strip in two hands, Jaina stepped toward the wall. Then suddenly stopped when Ben ignited his lightsaber. Her jaw dropped, and she looked up and said, Please tell me you didn't just pull your lightsaber on me. I'm sorry, Jaina, Ben said, but you don't have any discipline. Like Jason says, you're always making up your own orders instead of following the ones you're given. Jaina glared at Ben for an instant, then thrust the reinforcement strip at Han. Hold this. Ben retreated a step, bringing his blade up behind his rear shoulder. Jaina, don't make me warg! Ben's threat came to a surprised end as Zek slipped around the corner and caught hold of his hands from behind, twisting his wrists forward and forcing the lightsaber blade down toward the deck. And that was when the shock wave of a nearby turbolaser strike slammed the Falcon. The deck jumped so hard that Han's knees buckled, and he came down on his wounded shoulder again. Cries of astonishment rang out all around, and his body exploded into pain. How's that feed line repair coming? Leia asked over the intercom. The air was so thin now that her voice was starting to sound tinny and faint. If I can't accelerate, the flight is only going to get bumpier. Just keep us pointed out of here. As Han spoke, he realized that someone nearby was groaning in terrible pain. We'll pass out of range sometime. He rolled to his knees and saw Zek curled on the deck his hands clutched to a blackened slash in the side of his evac suit. Ben was kneeling next to him with a look of horror on his face, still holding an ignited lightsaber and shaking his head in despair. "'You shouldn't have grabbed me,' he said. "'Why do you have to grab me, Zek?' "'Because you were acting like a Jedi wannabe,' Jaina said, coming up behind him. "'Give me that.' She snatched the lightsaber from Ben's hand. He looked up at her. It wasn't my fault. Then whose fault was it, laser brain? She switched the lightsaber off. I just hope you haven't killed us all. Now grow up, go help your uncle, and I'll— No, Jaina. Han stuck a handful of reinforcement strips into his sling and turned to the damaged area. You've got to get Zek and Ben out of here. Out of here? Jaina asked. Get into the escape pods. Without removing the strip's packing, he held it up to the edge of the perforation circle and allowed the vacuum to suck it into place. Zek needs medical help, and I really don't want you sticking us with the brat. But what about— The Falcon's only carrying a four-person pod capacity right now, Han interrupted, and even if we had more, Leia and I are not surrendering. He shot a look at Ben that could have melted Frasium, then added— not to Jason, or anyone else. He held another strip to the edge of the circle and let the vacuum suck it into place. It would be a temporary patch at best, but it might hold long enough to save them. He placed another strip, then looked back to find Jaina kneeling beside Zek. She had the fingers of one hand pressed to his throat, taking his pulse, but her eyes were fixed on Han, and there were tears running down her cheeks. She nodded, then chinned a toggle switch in her collar and spoke into the microphone of her suit's comm unit. Sorzo, get back here. We're abandoning ship again. Good. Han had never been more proud of his daughter. He could see in Jaina's face how much she wanted to stay aboard the Falcon with him and Leia, but she was a seasoned spacer who knew better than to question a captain's orders aboard his own ship. Don't worry about your mother and me. Until we get the Falcon patched up, it'll be good not to have so many noses breathing the air. But we'll be okay. We've been in a lot of fixes tougher than this one. Jaina managed to smile, though her fear for her parents remained obvious. I know, Dad. I've seen the Holovids. She motioned Ben toward the rear hatch and used the force to lift Zek off the deck. 
then stepped to Han's side and gave him a little kiss on the cheek. Let me know how it goes, and may the Force be with you. Yeah. Not wanting her to see the tears welling in his eyes, and to realize that he was afraid this might be their final goodbye, Han didn't look as she started after Ben. You too, kid. He turned back to the damaged area and started to lay the rest of the reinforcing strips in place. By the time he had finished, Jaina had everyone loaded into the escape pods and was sounding the departure alarm. The turbo laser strikes just kept coming. The Falcon was bucking and leaping like a wild ronto, and the cabin pressure had fallen to the point that Han was shivering and starting to lose his breath. He didn't feel the escape pods go. The launch alarm simply fell silent, and he had a feeling like something had torn loose inside him. Han? Even over the intercom, Leia's voice sounded as though it was cracking. You still there? Course I am. He started forward, sealing the bulkhead behind him. You're not getting rid of me that easy. Nothing's easy with you, flyboy. Leia's tone was joking, but a little forced and frightened. I just wanted to let you know we're ready to jump. Another shockwave slammed into the Falcon, bouncing Han off the wall and eliciting a metallic screech of pain from the old ship. He gulped down a deep breath, thinking it might be his last, then was amazed to still be in one piece when he reached the corridor's forward bulkhead. What are you waiting for? He punched a safety override code into the control panel, then felt a blast of pressure as the hatch irised open. The sooner we jump, the better. What about poor Lady Morwan? C-3PO asked. She's still locked in the forward hold. And safer than we are, Han replied, stepping through the bulkhead. He closed the hatch behind him and hurried across the main cabin into the flight deck access corridor. The jump alarm chimed, sounding higher pitched than usual in the thin air, then the lights dimmed, and an alarming purr rose from the engine compartments in the back of the ship. The Falcon began to chug and slow, and Leia's voice rolled down the corridor, cursing and yelling like an Aqualish spice smuggler on a bad day. Han leaned close to the wall. "'Come on, old girl,' he whispered. "'You're not ready for the scrap heap yet, are you?' The purring intensified into a high-pitched whine. Then the lights came back up, and Han was nearly knocked off his feet again as the Falcon leapt into a hard acceleration. He smiled and gave the bulkhead an affectionate pat. Me neither. He sealed the bulkhead, then made his way to the flight deck, where the engine whine had grown so high that it was no longer audible to human ears. The Falcon's shuddering had settled into a teeth-tickling vibration, and C-3PO was at the navigator station checking their jump coordinates. Leia was in the pilot seat, with nothing ahead but dark, empty freedom. Han went to her side and saw by her glassy eyes that there was no need to tell her about events in back. She had probably sensed Miwal and Cockname's deaths through the Force, and Jaina would have calmed her to clear the escape pod launches. As for Ben and Jason and the Anakin Solo— there would be time enough to tell her about that later. And if there wasn't, it would be just as well if she never knew. Han leaned down. It'll be okay. He kissed her cheek, then slipped into the co-pilot seat. You've still got me. Leia let out a shocked snort, then smiled and looked over. I guess so. She reached across and squeezed his arm. You'll do. The hyperdrive finally kicked in, and the stars stretched to lines one more time. Epilogue A lively murmur rose near the mouth of the Dragon Queen's royal hangar, then built to a rousing cheer. Tenel Ka, Queen Mother of the Hapes Consortium, and uncontested monarch of sixty-three worlds, turned from the newly arrived jade shadow toward the sound. 
Dozens of crew persons in fireproof refueling suits and tool draped utilities were looking out through the containment field, pumping their arms and shouting in joy. But all Tenel Ka saw beyond the hangar mouth was the star flecked darkness of the realm she ruled. It was strewn with the hulks of wrecked warships and laced with the ion trails of hundreds of rescue vessels, and she saw nothing joyful in that. She had retained her throne, but too many hapens had died on both sides, and too much of the consortium's strength had been squandered on someone else's fight. And the ordeal was far from over. Soon Tenelka's intelligence service would start bringing her names and prisoners, and she would be forced to deal the Queen's justice. Her advisers would recommend that it be brutal and swift and her remaining nobles would expect their loyalty to be rewarded with a redistribution of the usurper's holdings. Tenel Ka would consider all their suggestions carefully, of course, but in the end she would keep her own counsel, and that was bound to disappoint everyone. After a moment, a G.A.G. -G black shuttle slid into view and began to nose through the containment field. The cheering grew even louder and a marshalling officer stepped forward with a pair of signal batons to direct the pilot to a nearby berth. Tenel Ka reached out in the force and was alarmed to feel the familiar presence of her daughter. Jason was returning Alana, and his timing could not have been worse. Tenel Ka turned back to the Jade Shadow and saw Mara and Jaina already carrying a stretcher down the boarding ramp toward her. It was too late to calm Jason and warn him. Instead, Tenel Ka reached out in the force, counting on him to sense her anxiety and figure out the reason. She felt a brief touch of warmth, then had to break off contact as Mara and Jaina reached the bottom of the ramp with their burden. Lying on the stretcher was Zek, pale, unconscious, and heavily bandaged around the middle. Tenel Ka's heart ached to see her old comrade-in-arms wounded so severely, but she forced herself to keep a blank face. It would not do for her ever-present retinue of loyal nobles to notice an arched brow or a quivering lip when she had just watched so many hapens perish in stoic composure. Master Skywalker, Jedi Solo, welcome aboard. Tenel Ka stepped forward to greet them, followed closely by the medical team she had brought to meet the Shadow. My surgeon is waiting in an operating theater. If you would entrust Zek to the transport team, they will take him up immediately. That's very kind, Mara said. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Jaina added. It means a lot. They passed the stretcher to a pair of red-uniformed medics, who quickly placed Zek aboard a small hover sled, then zipped away toward the back of the hangar. Noticing how Jaina's gaze followed the sled all the way to the lift tubes, Tenel Ka stepped to her side. They'll take good care of him, Jaina. Tenel Ka could sense that Jaina was a little irritated by all the cheering going on behind them, but there was nothing to be done about it. Even if the Queen Mother called for silence, she doubted the order could be carried out any time soon. Once they have prepared Zek for the operation, we can go up to wait in the infirmary. That'd be great, Jaina said. But don't worry. Zek's as strong as a bantha these days. Tenel Ka smiled. I'm glad to hear that. But I am a little confused— my surgeon said he had been told it was a lightsaber injury. Jaina glanced at Mara, then said, It's a long story. Ben made a mistake, Mara said. Ben? Tenel Ka gasped. It wasn't an attack. Mara's tone suggested she did not want to discuss Ben's mistake any further. There was some confusion aboard the Falcon— the Falcon? Growing more confused herself by the moment, Tenelka turned to Jaina. But I thought the Master Skywalker 
found you in escape pods. The Falcon's pods, Luke answered from the top of the boarding ramp. His cybernetic hand was missing, and his robes looked bulky around the middle, as though he too had a bandage wrapped around his chest. We're still trying to figure that out ourselves. Master Skywalker, you're hurt too, Tenelka cried. If you had told us, I'm fine. I've just come out of a healing trance. Luke sounded as haggard as he looked. He glanced toward the GAG shuttle, which was now surrounded by jubilant hapens, and asked, Is that Jason everyone is cheering for? Yes, it is. Tenel Ka turned toward the shuttle, where Jason had descended the boarding ramp and was beginning to make his way toward them through the cheering throng. Major Aspara was with him, but Alana had apparently been left aboard with Aspara's aides. After destroying the Galni fleet and saving me, Jason has become quite the hero of loyal Hapens. A hero? Jaina asked. You've got to be kidding. Not at all, Tenelka said sternly. Given the warm reception Jason was receiving from her subjects, she was considering whether it might be possible to reveal Alana's paternity. Not having the secret to keep would certainly simplify her life, and her nobles, at least the loyal ones, would never be more receptive to the truth than they were right now. Jason saved my life, and with it the Hapen monarchy. Jaina's face hardened, as only Jaina's face could. Does that give him an excuse to fire on his own parents? Tenelka frowned. I'm not sure I heard you correctly. Did you really say that Jason had fired on Han and Leia? I'm afraid she did, Luke said grimly. He started down the ramp, followed by Ben and a Twi'lek in Alliance military utilities. The Falcon had already jumped by the time we arrived from Roku, but it sounds like the Anakin hit her pretty hard. You're sure? Tenel Ka could not believe what she was hearing. It doesn't make sense. We're having trouble understanding a lot of what Jason has been doing, Mara said. As Luke reached the bottom of the ramp, she stepped to his side. Now that matters are settling down in the consortium, we're hoping to have a chance to work some of those things out. The disapproving undertone in Mara's voice and the bitterness in Luke's made Tenel Ka's heart fall. After their meeting aboard the Anakin Solo, Jason had told her that the Skywalkers were losing faith in him, that they even suspected him of working with Lumia, and now she could see how right he was. Tenel Ka turned to Ben. What do you know about this? I find it difficult to believe Jason would open fire on his own parents. He didn't have a choice, Ben said. They're terrorists, and they were trying to escape. Terrorists? Tenel Ka was crushed to hear the boy say such a thing. Ben, that's just not true. I'm afraid it is. Jason said, emerging from his throng of admirers. The suspicions Aunt Mara voiced during our meeting aboard the Anakin were right after all. Mara scowled. They were? Yes, and I apologize for not considering your point more carefully, Jason said. But events have certainly proven you correct. The intelligence my parents provided regarding Dutcha Algre did us more harm than good, and they were certainly involved in the attack on Her Majesty. The cold anger in Jason's voice made Tenelka even sadder, but she was beginning to understand what had happened, to see how he had misinterpreted events to reach a terrible conclusion. Jason, you can't believe your parents would do such a thing— Tenelka realized the crowd had quieted around them, straining to hear, and she knew that whatever she said next 
might determine how the solos would be viewed in galactic histories, whether they would be remembered as idealistic heroes or amoral terrorists. Han and Leia Solo had as much to do with saving the crown as you did, she said, speaking evenly and clearly. They risked their lives to provide me with the reversion coordinates of the Algray fleet. Jason's eyes widened. They did? Yes, Tenelka said. Furthermore, the Solos placed themselves at even greater risk to make sure the Royal Navy stood firm until Admiral Boatu attacked. Jason's expression changed from shock to shame, and Tenelka's sadness began to lift. Clearly, the attack on the Falcon had been the result of a terrible misunderstanding. Jason had made a grave mistake, but only because he was overcompensating, trying too hard to avoid letting his personal feelings influence his judgment. That was certainly what Tenelka hoped, and what she chose to believe. I am sure your parents will be fine. Tenelka addressed this to both Jason and Jaina, but in her heart she was speaking more to Jason. He was the one who had made the mistake, and she knew how he would blame himself if any harm came to them because of it. No one is more capable of taking care of themselves under difficult circumstances, and I'll issue orders for all Hapen vessels to aid them in every way possible. That can't hurt, Mara said. But nobody's going to see them until they're a long way from here. They'll go stealth until they find some place safe to land. Luke nodded. That's right. I'll reach out to Leia in the Force. Try to let her know that help is available if they need it. He turned to Jason, his brow lowered in disapproval. But we need to talk. You're very quick to believe the worst about someone you love. That's a problem. Jason's eyes burned with resentment, and Tenelka understood why. After all, wasn't Luke assuming the worst about Jason and Lumia? That's not fair, Master Skywalker, Tenelka said. Jason's suspicions were based on the information available to him at the time. The difference is our suspicions haven't harmed anyone. Jason has put his parents in mortal danger. Luke cast a meaningful glance at Tenelka's retinue, then added, Perhaps we could talk about this aboard the Shadow? As you wish. Though Tenelka made it sound as though she were granting a favor, she was relieved to have any excuse to get the Skywalkers and Jaina off the hangar deck so she could sneak Alana away from the shuttle. Given the schism of mistrust that had opened between Jason and everyone else, revealing her daughter's paternity no longer seemed like a good idea. I'll be along in a moment. There are a few things I need to attend to here. Of course. Luke bowed and led the others back aboard the Shadow. Tenelka waited until they were gone, then turned to the crowd of crew persons that had gathered around the confrontation. And you thought Hapen politics were treacherous, she said in a light, if rather forced, tone. A self-conscious laugh rustled through the crowd, more in acknowledgment of the Queen Mother's attempted at humor than because Tenoka had finally learned to tell a joke. But now your fun is over. Back to work with you. She made a shooing motion, and the crowd began to disperse. Tenelka turned to the nobles who always accumulated around her when she permitted it. She motioned Major Aspara forward, then frowned at the absence of one of the most familiar faces in her retinue. Where is Lady Galni? she asked, frowning. I asked her to stay close. A nervous voice sounded from the back of the flock. Here, Majesty. As if by magic, an aisle opened through Tenelka's retinue. 
At the other end stood Lady Galney, her eyes fixed on the deck and her chin tucked to her chest. The force grew electric with anticipation, and Tenelkan knew that these raptors she called nobles smelled blood. Would you come forward, please? There's something I need you and Major Aspara to do for me. Of course, Majesty. Galni shuffled forward, her legs shaking so hard they nearly buckled twice. Of course, her fellow nobles only watched and smirked, convinced their peer was going to receive the punishment she so richly deserved for having had the misfortune to be sister to the sneakiest of the Heritage Council's many traitors. Galni stopped in front of Tenelka, then found the strength to look up. If I may, Majesty, I would like to be heard before you speak. Very well, Tenelka said, but we don't have much time. You know how pushy those Jedi can be. This drew a genuine chuckle from the nobles, but Galni remained nervous and somber. I... I know it won't change your decision, but I want to apologize. Tenelka met the woman's gaze and frowned. For what, Lady Galni? For my role in all this, she said. I never would have... Lady Galni, Tenelka interrupted. I may not be a member of the Jedi Order any longer, but I assure you I still retain the skills of a Jedi Knight. Don't you think I would have known if you had meant to betray me? Of... Of course, Galni answered, confused. Nevertheless, I did... My tongue was too free with my consort, and he was reporting everything I told him to your sister. Tenelka interrupted. I know, and I'm quite sure that is a mistake you will never make again. She glanced toward the shadow. Now, may I make my request? Galni's chin dropped again. Of course. Majesty. Thank you. She pointed at Jason's black GAG shuttle. Alana is aboard that shuttle, and you are a familiar face to her. I'd like you and Major Espara to retrieve her and take her to your cabin. Galni's eyes widened. My cabin, Majesty? Yes and allow no one inside until I arrive. Tenelka turned to Aspara. Is that clear, Major? Aspara looked as confused as Galni, but she was too accustomed to taking orders to question them now. Yes, Majesty. Good. Tenelka turned back to Galni. I'll join you as soon as I'm able. Galni continued to look bewildered. Majesty, if you're trying to spare me the pain of knowing Lady Galni, I am not my grandmother, Tenelka interrupted. I don't execute my subjects for the crimes of their sisters. As for your consort, we'll talk about your choice in men some other time. She turned to Aspara. Are my instructions clear, Major? Yes, Majesty. Then carry on. Tenel Ka started up the shadow's boarding ramp, but when her retinue broke into a drone of shocked voices, she stopped and turned around. If you're aboard the Dragon Queen, there's supposed to be a reason. My advice to you all is to figure out what that reason is and start attending to it. The retinue fell into stunned silence, then suddenly dissolved as noblewomen scurried for the hangar exits. 
Tenel Ka smiled to herself, and, thinking she just might stand a chance of bringing Hapes into the modern galaxy, ascended the boarding ramp. She entered the opulent passenger salon of the Jade Shadow to find the discussion already in full swing. Luke and Jaina were standing on one side of the central beverage table, with Jason and Ben on the other, and Mara caught between. She was addressing her nephew, but looking like she just wished everyone would take a seat and calm down. Supposed to think, Jason. Mara's tone was reasonable, but pointed. You sent us there to meet Ben. Instead, Lumia ambushes us. That doesn't mean I sent her, Jason responded. Tenel Khan knew how upset he was by the fact that she could not feel him in the Force. He always closed himself off when he grew angry. You said yourself that you were worried she was after Ben. Ben wasn't there, Luke said. I was supposed to be, Ben interrupted. Jason dropped a message beacon ordering the rover to go to Roku Depot, but we ignored it. You what? Mara asked, facing Ben. We ignored the order. Ben turned to Jaina. Ask Jaina. It was her idea. All eyes turned to Jaina, who reluctantly nodded. I pretty much insisted on it. We needed to warn Ten... er... the Queen Mother... about the Dutcha. Ben turned back to Luke. You see? It wasn't Jason's fault. You ignoring an order doesn't explain how Lumia knew we would be there, Mara pointed out, or why she's been working with G.A.G. And I wish I had the answer to that, Jason said. I'll be looking into it as soon as the Anakin returns to Coruscant. I want the answer more than you do. I can promise that. Can you? Luke asked, keeping his gaze fixed on Jason. Of course he can, Tenelka said, stepping to Jason's side. A few minutes ago, you rebuked Jason for being too quick to believe the worst of those he loves— and here you are, doing the same thing. Luke frowned, clearly irritated with her, but Mara sighed and looked at her husband. She has a point, Luke. We really don't have any more evidence against Jason than he did against Han and Leia. The battle's over. Maybe it's time we all holstered our blasters and tried to work things out like family. That sounds good to me, Jason said. I'll be the first to admit that I've made some mistakes, but I have been working for the good of the Alliance, and I know you have, too. Luke considered Jason's words for a moment before speaking again. What about your parents? They're family, too. I can't cancel the detention warrant, if that's what you're asking. Jason's words shocked Tenel Ka to the core. Jason, if not for your parents, I wouldn't be alive. Neither would Alana. Jason's face grew as sad as it was hard, and Tenel Khan knew that even she would not be able to change his mind about this. He was convinced that his duty compelled him to ignore his feelings for his family, and she found that terribly painful. And when she remembered that she and Alana were his family, too, just a little frightening. I know that, Jason said to her. They risked their lives to save you, but they still have crimes against the Alliance to answer for. He returned his attention to Luke. If Han and Leia Solo were having second thoughts about their political loyalties— we can negotiate a safe surrender and suitable confinement. Surrender? Jaina exploded. Confinement? They'll never— Don't you think I know that? Jason replied, just as hotly. But if I cancel the warrant on them, it will look like I'm giving my parents special treatment, and I can't do that. There's one law, Jaina, and it applies to everyone, even to Solos. 
They risked their lives to save Tenelka, Jaina objected. They're not terrorists. I know, Jason said. But they're not innocent either. Jaina exhaled in frustration, then looked to Luke in silent appeal. Luke stared at the floor for a moment, then looked up to meet Jason's eyes. Okay. But I haven't changed my mind about Ben. He's still coming back to Coruscant with us. What? Ben cried. No way! Jason is my master! That's not your decision, Ben, Luke said. And Jason isn't a master. He is to me, Ben retorted. No one's as strong in the Force. It's your father's decision, Jason said. He raised a hand to silence Ben, then turned back to Luke. But is it really necessary? Now that Lumia is dead— What makes you think she's dead? Mara asked. You do, Jason answered, frowning. Not five minutes ago, you said she was wearing a bomb, a bomb that exploded after we left the cantina, Luke reminded him. We don't know that Lumia was still wearing it. And if I had to guess, I'd say she wasn't, Mara added. It took nearly two minutes for that bomb to detonate. Even with her chest wounds, that would have been plenty of time to escape. Which is certainly what we should assume. Luke said. I won't believe Lumia is dead until I slide her body into the crematorium myself. I see. Jason's gaze dropped to the floor, growing distant and glassy. When he finally raised it again, he looked Luke straight in the eye, steady, calm, and collected. Then I guess I should trust your judgment. After all, I've never even met the woman. Luke held Jason's eyes. I hope that's true, Jason. Jason's expression darkened, but before he could speak, Ben stepped between the two men and scowled up at his father. Of course it's true, Ben exclaimed. Jason is trying to protect the galaxy. Why doesn't anyone understand that but me? I understand it, Ben, Tenelka said, trying to divert the storm she felt gathering. And I am sure your father does, too. Tenelka cast an expectant look in Luke's direction, but he only continued to study Jason, and Tenelka felt the tension continuing to build. So did Mara, apparently. She stepped closer to Ben and laid a hand on his shoulder. Ben, we're all trying to save the galaxy, she said, but we don't always agree on how it should be done. And that's why I can't stay with Jason? Ben demanded. That's ridiculous. The reason you can't stay with Jason is because I'm ordering you to return home with us, Luke said sternly, and the reason I'm doing that is because Lumia told me you were the one helping her in G.A.G. What? Tenelka exclaimed the word at the same time Jason and Ben did, then watched Jason's expression turn from shocked to angry to enigmatic. Ben merely seemed confused. And you believe her? he demanded. No, Luke answered. He glanced back toward Jason. But somebody has been helping her. And until I know who that is, you need to stay away from G.A.G., Jason finished. Your father is right to be cautious, Ben. But you're my master, Ben objected. And I'm asking you to stay with your parents until I've sorted this out. Jason looked up at Luke, then added, I'm sure we'll be working together again much sooner than you expect. Tenelka's heart fell at the challenging tone of Jason's voice, but Luke seemed to accept the statement without animosity. I hope we'll all be working together again soon. Luke reached across and clasped Jason's arm. 
I know better than to think you'll accept my help. But let me know how the investigation goes. I'll be very interested to learn more about Lumia's involvement. Of course, Jason replied, though he was not allowing his feelings to seep into the force, Tenelcock could tell by the slight tightening of his lips that he had taken Luke's comment as something of a threat. And now, if you'll excuse me, I really should return to the Anakin and get started on that. Jason said his farewells to the Skywalkers, then turned to Tenelka. Your Majesty, if all is well, it is, Tenelka said. She took his arm and heart-breaking, started toward the hatch with him. Jason, what can I say? We are in your debt. No, Jason said. The Alliance is in yours. Thanks to the Consortium's courage here, we may have broken the Corellians' ability to make war. They stopped just inside the hatch where they would be hidden from the hangar floor, but still be visible from the passenger salon of the Shadow. It would be, Tenel Khan knew, the most privacy they were likely to find for a long, long time. She took Jason's hand. All the same, we are grateful, she said. Please let us know if there is anything we can do for you. And feel free to visit us again when you have time. You will find a warm welcome among our subjects. Thank you, Majesty. Jason bowed. I will. Good. We will be looking forward to it. Tenelka kissed Jason on the cheek, then fought to keep back the tears as she watched him step through the hatch and once more vanish from her life. End of Star Wars Legacy of the Force, Tempest, Book Three, by Troy Denning